Introductory Note of The Journal of John Woolman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devin Pertz. The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. Introductory Note. John Woolman was born at Northampton, New Jersey in 1720 and died at York, England in 1772. He was the child of Quaker parents, and from his youth was a zealous member of the Society of Friends. His journal, published posthumously in 1774, sufficiently describes his way of life and the spirit in which he did his work, but his extreme humility prevents him from making clear the importance of the part he played in the movement against slaveholding among the Quakers. During the earlier years of their settlement in America, the friends took part in the traffic in slaves with apparently as little hesitation as their fellow colonists, but in 1671 George Fox, visiting the Barbados, was struck by the inconsistency of slaveholding with the religious principles of his society. His protests, along with those of others, led to the growth of an agitation which spread from section to section. In 1742, Woolman, then a young clerk in the employment of a storekeeper in New Jersey, was asked to make out a bill of sale for a Negro woman, and the scruples which then occurred to him were the beginning of a lifelong activity against the traffic. Shortly afterward, he began his laborious foot journeys, pleading everywhere with his co-religionists and inspiring others to take up the crusade. The result of the agitation was that the various yearly meetings, one by one, decided that emancipation was a religious duty, and within twenty years after Woolman's death, the practice of slavery had ceased in the Society of Friends. But his influence did not stop there, for no small part of the enthusiasm of the general emancipation movement is traceable to his labors. His own words in this journal, of an extraordinary simplicity and charm, are the best expression of a personality which in its ardor, purity of motive, breadth of sympathy, and clear spiritual insight gives woman a place among the uncanonized saints of America. End of introductory note. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 1 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz, Chapter 1, 1720 through 1742. His birth and parentage, some account of the operations of divine grace on his mind in his youth, his first appearance in the ministry, and his considerations while young on the keeping of slaves. I have often felt a motion of love to leave some hints in writing of my experience of the goodness of God, and now, in the thirty-sixth year of my age, I begin this work. I was born in Northampton, in Burlington County, West Jersey, in the year 1720. Before I was seven years old, I began to be acquainted with the operations of divine love. Through the care of my parents, I was taught to read nearly as soon as I was capable of it. And as I went from school one day, I remember that while my companions were playing by the way, I went forward out of sight, and, sitting down, I read the twenty-second chapter of Revelation. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb and others. In reading it, my mind was drawn to seek after that pure habitation which I then believed God had prepared for his servants. The place where I sat, and the sweetness that attended my mind, remained fresh in my memory. This, and the like gracious visitations, had such an effect upon me that when boys used ill language it troubled me, and, through the continued mercies of God, I was preserved from that evil. The pious instructions of my parents were often fresh in my mind when I happened to be among wicked children and were of use to me. Having a large family of children, they used frequently, on first days after meeting, to set us one after another to read the holy scriptures or some religious books, the rest sitting by without much conversation. I have since often thought it was a good practice. From what I had read and heard, I believe there had been, in past ages, people who walked in uprightness before God in a degree exceeding any that I knew or heard of now living. 
and the apprehension of there being less steadiness and firmness amongst people in the present age often troubled me while I was a child. I may here mention a remarkable circumstance that occurred in my childhood. On going to a neighbor's house, I saw on the way a robin sitting on her nest, and as I came near she went off, but having young ones, she flew about, and with many cries expressed her concern for them. I stood and threw stones at her, and one striking her, she fell down dead. At first I was pleased with the exploit, but after a few minutes was seized with horror at having, in a sportive way, killed an innocent creature while she was careful for her young. I beheld her lying dead, and thought those young ones, for which she was so careful, must now perish for want of their dam to nourish them. After some painful considerations on the subject, I climbed up the tree, took all the young birds, and killed them, supposing that better than to leave them to pine away and die miserably. In this case, I believed that scripture proverb was fulfilled, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I then went on my errand, and for some hours could think of little else but the cruelties I had committed, and was much troubled. Thus, he whose tender mercies are over all his works hath placed a principle in the human mind which incites to exercise goodness towards every living creature, and this being singly attended to, people became tender-hearted and sympathizing. But when frequently and totally rejected, the mind becomes shut up in a contrary disposition. About the twelfth year of my age, my father being abroad, my mother reproved me for some misconduct to which I made an undutiful reply. The next first day, as I was with my father returning from meeting, he told me that he understood I had behaved amiss to my mother, and advised me to be more careful in the future. I knew myself blamable, and in shame and confusion remained silent. Being thus awakened to a sense of my wickedness, I felt remorse in my mind, and on getting home I retired and prayed to the Lord to forgive me, and I do not remember that I ever afterwards spoke unhandsomely to either of my parents, however foolish, and some other things. Having attained the age of sixteen years, I began to love wanton company, and though I was preserved from profane language or scandalous conduct, yet I perceived a plant in me which produced much wild grapes. My merciful father did not, however, forsake me utterly, but at times, through his grace, I was brought seriously to consider my ways, and the sight of my backslidings affected me with sorrow, yet for want of rightly attending to the reproofs of instruction, vanity was added to vanity, and repentance to repentance. Upon the whole, my mind became more and more alienated from the truth, and I hastened toward destruction. While I meditate on the gulf toward which I traveled, and reflect on my youthful disobedience, for these things I weep, mine eye runneth down with water. Advancing in age, the number of my acquaintance increased, and thereby my way grew more difficult. Though I had found comfort in reading the holy scriptures and thinking on heavenly things, I was now estranged therefrom. I knew I was going from the flock of Christ, and had no resolution to return, hence serious reflections were uneasy to me, and youthful vanities and diversions were my greatest pleasure. In this road I found many like myself, and we associated in that which is averse to true friendship. In this swift race it pleased God to visit me with sickness, so that I doubted of recovery, then did darkness, horror, and amazement with full force seize me, even when my pain and distress of body were very great. I thought it would have been better for me never to have had being, than to see the day which I now saw. I was filled with confusion, and in great affliction, both of mind and body, I lay and bewailed myself. I had not confidence to lift up my cries to God, whom I had thus offended, but in a deep sense of my great folly I was humbled before him. At length that word which is as a fire and a hammer broke and dissolved my rebellious heart. My cries were put up in contrition, and in the multitude of his mercies, I found inward relief, and a close engagement that if he was pleased to restore my health, I might walk humbly before him. After my recovery, this exercise remained with me a considerable time. 
but by degrees giving way to youthful vanities and associating with wanton young people, I lost ground. The Lord had been very gracious and spoke peace to me in the time of my distress, and I now most ungratefully turned again to folly. At times I felt sharp reproof, but I did not get low enough to cry for help. I was not so hardy as to commit things scandalous, but to exceed in vanity and to promote mirth was my chief study. Still I retained a love and esteem for pious people, and their company brought an awe upon me. My dear parents several times admonished me in the fear of the Lord, and their admonition entered into my heart and had a good effect for a season, but not getting deep enough to pray rightly, the tempter, when he came, found entrance. Once, having spent a part of the day in wantonness, when I went to bed at night, there lay in a window near my bed a Bible, which I opened, and first cast my eye on the text, We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. This I knew to be my case, and meeting with so unexpected a reproof, I was somewhat affected with it, and went to bed under remorse of conscience, when I soon cast off again. Thus time passed on, my heart was replenished with mirth and wantonness, while pleasing scenes of vanity were presented to my imagination, till I attained the age of eighteen years, near which time I felt the judgments of God in my soul like a consuming fire, and looking over my past life the prospect was moving. I was often sad, and longed to be delivered from those vanities, then again my heart was strongly inclined to them, and there was in me a sore conflict. At times I turned to folly, and then again sorrow and confusion took hold of me. In a while I resolved totally to leave off some of my vanities, but there was a secret reserve in my heart of the more refined part of them, and I was not low enough to find true peace. Thus, for some months, I had great troubles. My will was unsubjected, which rendered my labors fruitless. At length, through the merciful continuance of heavenly visitations, I was made to bow down in spirit before the Lord. One evening I had spent some time in reading a pious author, and walking out alone I humbly prayed to the Lord for his help, that I might be delivered from all those vanities which so ensnared me. Thus being brought low, he helped me, and as I learned to bear the cross, I felt refreshment to come from his presence but not keeping in that strength which gave victory, I lost ground again, the sense of which greatly affected me. I sought deserts and lonely places, and there with tears did confess my sins to God, and humbly craved his help. And I may say with reverence, he was near to me in my troubles, and in those times of humiliation opened my ear to discipline. I was now led to look seriously at the means by which I was drawn from the pure truth, and learn that if I would live such a life as the faithful servants of God lived, I must not go into company as heretofore in my own will, but all the cravings of sense must be governed by a divine principle. In times of sorrow and abasement these instructions were sealed upon me, and I felt the power of Christ prevail over selfish desires, so that I was preserved in a good degree of steadiness, and being young, and believing at the time that a single life was best for me, I was strengthened to keep from such company as had often been a snare to me. I kept steadily to meetings, spent first day afternoons chiefly in reading the scriptures and other good books, and was early convinced in my mind that true religion consisted in an inward life, wherein the heart does love and reverence God the Creator, and learns to exercise true justice and goodness, not only toward all men, but also toward the brute creatures, that, as the mind was moved by an inward principle to love God as an invisible, incomprehensible being, so, by the same principle, it was moved to love him in all his manifestations in the visible world, that, as by his breath the flame of life was kindled in all animal sensible creatures, to say we love God as unseen, and at the same time exercise cruelty toward the least creature moving by his life, or by life derived from him, was a contradiction in itself. I found no narrowness respecting sex and opinions, but believed that sincere, upright-hearted people in every society who truly love God were accepted of him, 
as I lived under the cross and simply followed the opening of truth, my mind from day to day was more enlightened. My former acquaintance were left to judge of me as they would, for I found it safest for me to live in private and keep these things sealed up in my own breast. While I silently ponder on that change wrought in me, I find no language equal to convey to another a clear idea of it. I looked upon the works of God in this visible creation, and an awfulness covered me. My heart was tender and often contrite, and universal love to my fellow creatures increased in me. This will be understood by such as have trodden in the same path. Some glances of real beauty may be seen in their faces who dwell in true meekness. There is a harmony in the sound of that voice to which divine love gives utterance, and some appearance of right order in their tempter and conduct whose passions are regulated, yet these do not fully show forth that inward life to those who have not felt it. This white stone and new name is only known rightly by such as receive it. Now, though I had been thus strengthened to bear the cross, I still found myself in great danger, having many weaknesses attending me, and strong temptations to wrestle with, in the feeling whereof I frequently withdrew into private places, and often with tears besought the Lord to help me, and his gracious ear was open to my cry. All this time I lived with my parents, and wrought on the plantation, and having had schooling pretty well for a planter, I used to improve myself in winter evenings and other leisure times. Being now in the twenty-first year of my age, with my father's consent, I engaged with a man in much business as a shopkeeper and baker, to tend shop and keep books. At home I had lived retired, and now, having a prospect of being much in the way of company, I felt frequent and fervent cries in my heart to God, the Father of mercies, that he would preserve me from all taint and corruption, that, in this more public employment, I might serve him, my gracious Redeemer, in that humility and self-denial which I had in a small degree exercised in a more private life. The man who employed me furnished a shop in Mount Holly, about five miles from my father's house, and six from his own, and there I lived alone and tended his shop. Shortly after my settlement here, I was visited by several young people, my former acquaintance, who supposed that vanities would be as agreeable to me now as ever. At these times I cried to the Lord in secret for wisdom and strength, for I felt myself encompassed with difficulties, and had fresh occasion to bewail the follies of times past, and contracting a familiarity with libertine people and as I had now left my father's house outwardly, I found my heavenly father to be merciful to me beyond what I can express. By day I was much amongst people, and had many trials to go through, but in the evenings I was mostly alone, and I may with thankfulness acknowledge that in those times the spirit of supplication was often poured upon me, under which I was frequently exercised, and felt my strength renewed. After a while, my former acquaintance gave over expecting me as one of their company, and I began to be known to some whose conversation was helpful to me. And now, as I had experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ to redeem me from many pollutions, and to be a succor to me through a sea of conflicts, with which no person was fully acquainted, and as my heart was often enlarged in this heavenly principle, I felt a tender compassion for the youth who remained entangled in snares like those which had entangled me. This love and tenderness increased, and my mind was strongly engaged for the good of my fellow creatures. I went to meetings in an awful frame of mind, and endeavored to be inwardly acquainted with the language of the true shepherd. One day, being under a strong exercise of spirit, I stood up and said some words in a meeting, but not keeping close to the divine opening, I said more than was required of me. Being soon sensible of my error, I was afflicted in mind some weeks without any light or comfort, even to that degree that I could not take satisfaction in anything. I remembered God, and was troubled, and in the depth of my distress he had pity upon me, and sent the Comforter. I then felt forgiveness for my offense, my mind became calm and quiet, and I was truly thankful to my gracious Redeemer for his mercies. About six weeks after this, feeling the spring of divine love opened, and a concern to speak, 
I said a few words in a meeting in which I found peace. Being thus humbled and disciplined under the cross, my understanding became more strengthened to distinguish the pure spirit which inwardly moves upon the heart, and which taught me to wait in silence sometimes many weeks together, until I felt that rise which prepares the creature to stand like a trumpet through which the Lord speaks to his flock. From an inward purifying and steadfast abiding under it springs a lively operative desire for the good of others. All the faithful are not called to the public ministry, but whoever are, are called to minister of that which they have tasted and handled spiritually. The outward modes of worship are various, but whenever any are true ministers of Jesus Christ, it is from the operation of his Spirit upon their hearts, first purifying them, and thus giving them a just sense of the conditions of others. This truth was early fixed in my mind, and I was taught to watch the pure opening, and to take heed lest, while I was standing to speak, my own will should get uppermost, and cause me to utter words from worldly wisdom, and depart from the channel of the true gospel ministry. In the management of my outward affairs, I may say with thankfulness, I found truth to be my support, and I was respected in my master's family, who came to live in Mount Holly within two years after my going there. In a few months after I came here, my master bought several Scotchman servants from on board a vessel and brought them to Mount Holly to sell, one of whom was taken sick and died. In the latter part of his sickness, being delirious, he used to curse and swear most sorrowfully, and the next night after his burial I was left to sleep alone in the chamber where he died. I perceived in me a timorousness. I knew, however, I had not injured the man, but assisted in taking care of him according to my capacity. I was not free to ask any one on that occasion to sleep with me. Nature was feeble, but every trial was a fresh incitement to give myself up wholly to the service of God, for I found no helper like him in times of trouble. About the twenty-third year of my age, I had many fresh and heavenly openings, in respect to the care and providence of the Almighty over his creatures in general, and over man as the most noble amongst those which are visible, and being clearly convinced in my judgment that to place my whole trust in God was best for me, I felt renewed engagements that in all things I might act on an inward principle of virtue, and pursue worldly business no further than as truth opened my way. About the time called Christmas I observed many people, both in town and from the country, resorting to public houses and spending their time in drinking in vain sports, tending to corrupt one another, on which account I was much troubled. At one house in particular there was much disorder, and I believed it was a duty incumbent on me to speak to the master of that house. I considered I was young, and that several elderly friends in town had opportunity to see these things, but though I would gladly have been excused, yet I could not feel my mind clear. The exercise was heavy, and as I was reading what the Almighty said to Ezekiel, respecting his duty as a watchman, the matter was set home more clearly. With prayers and tears I besought the Lord for his assistance, and he, in loving kindness, gave me a resigned heart. At a suitable opportunity I went to the public house, and seeing the man amongst much company, I called him aside, and in the fear and dread of the Almighty expressed to him what rested on my mind. He took it kindly, and afterwards showed more regard to me than before. In a few years afterwards he died, middle-aged, and I often thought that had I neglected my duty in that case it would have given me great trouble, and I was humbly thankful to my gracious father who had supported me herein. My employer, having a negro woman, sold her, and desired me to write a bill of sale, the man being waiting who bought her. The thing was sudden, and though I felt uneasy at the thoughts of writing an instrument of slavery for one of my fellow creatures, yet I remembered that I was hired by the year, that it was my master who directed me to do it, and that it was an elderly man, a member of our society, who bought her. So through weakness I gave way, and wrote it, but at the executing of it I was so afflicted in my mind that I said before my master and the friend that I believed slave-keeping to be a practice inconsistent with the Christian religion. This, in some degree, abated my uneasiness. Yet, as often as I reflected seriously upon it, I thought I should have been clearer if I had desired to be excused from it as a thing against my conscience, for such it was. 
Some time after this, a young man of our society spoke to me to write a conveyance of a slave to him, he having lately taken a negro into his house. I told him I was not easy to write it, for though many of our meeting and in other places kept slaves, I still believe the practice was not right, and desired to be excused from the writing. I spoke to him in good will, and he told me that keeping slaves was not altogether agreeable to his mind, but that the slave being a gift made to his wife, he had accepted her. End of chapter 1. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 2 of the Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz. Chapter 2, 1743 through 1748. His first journey on a religious visit in East Jersey. Thoughts on merchandising and learning a trade. Second journey into Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. Third journey through part of West and East Jersey. Fourth journey through New York and Long Island to New England and his fifth journey to the eastern shore of Maryland and the lower counties on Delaware. My esteemed friend, Abraham Farrington, being about to make a visit to friends on the eastern side of this province, and having no companion, he proposed to me to go with him, and after a conference with some elderly friends, I agreed to go. We set out on the 5th of ninth month, 1743, had an evening meeting at a tavern in Brunswick, a town in which none of our society dwelt, the room was full and the people quiet, thence to Amboy, and had an evening meeting in the courthouse, to which came many people, amongst whom were several members of assembly, they being in town on the public affairs of the province, in both these meetings my ancient companion was engaged to preach largely in the love of the gospel. Thence we went to Woodbridge, Rawway, and Plainfield, and had six or seven meetings in places where friends' meetings are not usually held, chiefly attended by Presbyterians, and my beloved companion was frequently strengthened to publish the word of life amongst them. As for me, I was often silent through the meetings, and when I spake it was with much care that I might speak only what truth opened. My mind was often tender, and I learned some profitable lessons. We were out about two weeks. Near this time, being on some outward business in which several families were concerned, and which was attended with difficulties, some things relating thereto not being clearly stated, nor rightly understood by all, there arose some heat in the minds of the parties, and one valuable friend got off his watch. I had a great regard for him, and felt a strong inclination, after matters were settled, to speak to him concerning his conduct in that case, but being a youth, and he far advanced in age and experience, my way appeared difficult. After some days' deliberation, and inward seeking to the Lord for assistance, I was made subject, so that I expressed what lay upon me in a way which became my youth and his years, and though it was a hard task to me, it was well taken, and I believe was useful to us both. Having now been several years with my employer, and he doing less in merchandise than heretofore, I was thoughtful about some other way of business, perceiving merchandise to be attended with much cumber in the way of trading in these parts. My mind, through the power of truth, was in a good degree weaned from the desire of outward greatness, and I was learning to be content with real conveniences that were not costly, so that a way of life free from much entanglement appeared best for me, though the income might be small. I had several offers of business that appeared profitable, but I did not see my way clear to accept of them, believing they would be attended with more outward care and cumber than was required of me to engage in. I saw that an humble man, with the blessing of the Lord, might live on a little, and that where the heart was set on greatness, success in business did not satisfy the craving, but that commonly with an increase of wealth the desire of wealth increased. There was a care on my mind so to pass my time that nothing might hinder me from the most steady attention to the voice of the true shepherd. My employer, though now a retailer of goods, was by trade a tailor, and kept a servant man at that business, and I began to think about learning the trade, 
expecting that if I should settle, I might by this trade and a little retailing of goods get a living in a plain way without the load of great business. I mentioned it to my employer, and we soon agreed on terms, and when I had leisure from the affairs of merchandise, I worked with his man. I believe the hand of Providence pointed out this business for me, and I was taught to be content with it, though I felt at times a disposition that would have sought for something greater. But through the revelation of Jesus Christ, I had seen the happiness of humility, and there was an earnest desire in me to enter deeply into it. At times this desire arose to a degree of fervent supplication, wherein my soul was so environed with heavenly light and consolation that things were made easy to me which had been otherwise. After some time my employer's wife died. She was a virtuous woman, and generally beloved of her neighbors. Soon after this he left shopkeeping, and we parted. I then wrought at my trade as a tailor, carefully attended meetings for worship and discipline, and found an enlargement of gospel love in my mind, and therein a concern to visit friends in some of the back settlements of Pennsylvania and Virginia. Being thoughtful about a companion, I expressed it to my beloved friend Isaac Andrews, who told me that he had drawings to the same places, and also to go through Maryland, Virginia, and Carolina. After a considerable time, and several conferences with him, I felt easy to accompany him throughout, if way open for it. I opened the case in our monthly meeting, and, friends expressing their unity therewith, we obtained certificates to travel as companions, he from Haddonfield and I from Burlington. We left our province on the 12th of 3rd month, 1746, and had several meetings in the upper part of Chester County and near Lancaster, in some of which the love of Christ prevailed, uniting us together in his service. We then crossed the river Susquehanna, and had several meetings in a new settlement called the Redlands. It is the poorer sort of people that commonly begin to improve remote deserts. With a small stock they have houses to build, lands to clear and fence, corn to raise, clothes to provide, and children to educate, so that friends who visit such may well sympathize with them in their hardships in the wilderness. And though the best entertainment that they can give may seem coarse to some who are used to cities or old settled places, it becomes the disciples of Christ to be therewith content. Our hearts were sometimes enlarged in the love of our Heavenly Father amongst these people, and the sweet influence of His Spirit supported us through some difficulties, to Him be the praise. We passed on to Maniquacy, Fairfax, Hopewell, and Shenando, and had meetings, some of which were comfortable and edifying. From Shenando, we set off in the afternoon for the settlements of friends in Virginia. The first night we, with our guide, lodged in the woods, our horses feeding near us, but he being poorly provided with a horse, and we young, and having good horses, were free the next day to part with him. And two days after we reached our friend John Sheagles in Virginia, we took the meetings in our way through Virginia, were in some degree baptized into a feeling sense of the conditions of the people, and our exercise in general was more painful in these old settlements than it had been amongst the back inhabitants. Yet, through the goodness of our Heavenly Father, the well of living waters was at times open to our encouragement and the refreshment of the sincere hearted. We went on to Perquimans in North Carolina, had several large meetings, and found some openness in those parts, and a hopeful appearance amongst the young people. Afterwards, we turned again to Virginia, and attended most of the meetings which we had not been at before, laboring amongst friends in the love of Jesus Christ, as ability was given, thence went to the mountains, up James River, to a new settlement, and had several meetings amongst the people, some of whom had lately joined in membership with our society. In our journeying to and fro, we found some honest-hearted friends who appeared to be concerned for the cause of truth among a backsliding people. From Virginia, we crossed over the River Potomac at Hose Ferry and made a general visit to the meetings of friends on the western shore of Maryland and were at their quarterly meeting. 
We had some hard labor amongst them, endeavoring to discharge our duty honestly as way opened in the love of truth. Thence, taking sundry meetings in our way, we passed towards home, which, through the favor of divine providence, we reached the 16th of 6 month, 1746, and I may say that through the assistance of the Holy Spirit, which mortifies selfish desires, my companion and I traveled in harmony and parted in the nearness of true brotherly love. Two things were remarkable to me in this journey. First, in regard to my entertainment. When I ate, drank, and lodged free cost with people who lived in ease on the hard labor of their slaves, I felt uneasy, and as my mind was inward to the Lord, I found this uneasiness return upon me at times through the whole visit. Where the masters bore a good share of the burden and lived frugally, so that their servants were well provided for, and their labor moderate, I felt more easy. But where they lived in a costly way, and laid heavy burdens on their slaves, my exercise was often great, and I frequently had conversation with them in private concerning it. Secondly, this trade of importing slaves from their native country being much encouraged amongst them, and the white people and their children so generally living without much labor, was frequently the subject of my serious thoughts. I saw in these southern provinces so many vices and corruptions, increased by this trade and this way of life, that it appeared to me as a dark gloominess hanging over the land, and though now many willingly run into it, yet in future the consequence will be grievous to posterity. I express it as it hath appeared to me, not once nor twice, but as a matter fixed on my mind. Soon after my return home I felt an increasing concern for friends on our sea-coast, and on the 8th of 8th month, 1746, I left home with the unity of friends, and in company with my beloved friend and neighbor Peter Andrews, brother to my companion before mentioned, and visited them in their meetings generally about Salem, Cape May, Great and Little Egg Harbor. We had meetings also at Barnegat, Manahawken, and Mainsquan, and so to the yearly meeting at Shrewsbury. Through the goodness of the Lord, way was opened, and the strength of divine love was sometimes felt in our assemblies, to the comfort and help of those who were rightly concerned before him. We were out twenty-two days, and rode, by computation, three hundred and forty miles. At Shrewsbury Yearly Meeting, we met with our dear friends Michael Lightfoot and Abraham Farrington, who had good service there. The winter following died my eldest sister, Elizabeth Woolman, of the smallpox, aged thirty-one years. Of late I found drawings in my mind to visit friends in New England, and having an opportunity of joining in company with my beloved friend Peter Andrews, we obtained certificates from our monthly meeting, and set forward on the 16th of 3rd month, 1747. We reached the yearly meeting at Long Island, as which were our friends Samuel Nottingham from England, John Griffith, Jane Hoskins, and Elizabeth Hudson from Pennsylvania, and Jacob Andrews from Chesterfield, several of whom were favored in their public exercise, and, through the goodness of the Lord, we had some edifying meetings. After this my companion and I visited friends on Long Island, and through the mercies of God we were helped in the work. Besides going to the settled meetings of friends, we were at a general meeting at Setauket, chiefly made up of other societies. We had also a meeting at Oyster Bay in a dwelling house, at which were many people. At the former there was not much said by way of testimony, but it was, I believe, a good meeting. At the latter, through the springing up of living waters, it was a day to be thankfully remembered. Having visited the island, we went over to the main, taking meetings in our way, to Oblong, Nine Partners, and New Milford. In these back settlements we were met with several people who, through the immediate workings of the Spirit of Christ on their minds, were drawn from the vanities of the world to an inward acquaintance with him. They were educated in the way of the Presbyterians. A considerable number of the youth, members of that society, used often to spend their time together in merriment, but some of the principal young men of the company, being visited by the powerful workings of the Spirit of Christ, 
and thereby led humbly to take up his cross, could no longer join in those vanities. As these stood steadfast to that inward convincement, they were made a blessing to some of their former companions, so that through the power of truth several were brought into a close exercise concerning the eternal well-being of their souls. These young people continued for a time to frequent their public worship, and, besides that, had meetings of their own, which meetings were a while allowed by their preacher, who sometimes met with them, but in time their judgment in matters of religion disagreeing with some of the articles of the Presbyterians, their meetings were disapproved by that society, and such of them as stood firm to their duty, as it was inwardly manifested, had many difficulties to go through. In a while their meetings were dropped, some of them returned to the Presbyterians, and others joined to our religious society. I had conversation with some of the latter to help my edification, and believe several of them are acquainted with the nature of that worship which is performed in spirit and in truth. Amos Powell, a friend from Long Island, accompanied me through Connecticut, which is chiefly inhabited by Presbyterians, who were generally civil to us. After three days' riding, we came amongst friends in the colony of Rhode Island, and visited them in and about Newport, Dartmouth, and generally in those parts. We then went to Boston, and proceeded eastward as far as Dover. Not far from thence we met our friend Thomas Gothrop from England, who was then on a visit to these provinces. From Newport we sailed to Nantucket, were there nearly a week, and from thence came over to Dartmouth. Having finished our visit in these parts, we crossed the Sound from New London to Long Island, and taking some meetings on the island proceeded towards home, which we reached the 13th of 7th month, 1747, having rowed about 1,500 miles and sailed about 150. In this journey, I may say in general, we were sometimes in much weakness, and labored under discouragements, and at other times, through the renewed manifestations of divine love, we had seasons of refreshment wherein the power of truth prevailed. We were taught by renewed experience to labor for an inward stillness, at no time to seek for words, but to live in the spirit of truth, and utter that to the people which truth opened in us. My beloved companion and I belonged both to one meeting, came forth in the ministry near the same time, and were inwardly united in the work. He was about thirteen years older than I, bore the heaviest burden, and was an instrument of the greatest use. Finding a concern to visit friends in the lower counties of Delaware, and on the eastern shore of Maryland, and having an opportunity to join with my well-beloved ancient friend, John Sykes, we obtained certificates, and set off the seventh of eighth month, 1748, or at the meetings of friends in the lower counties, attended the yearly meeting at Little Creek, and made a visit to most of the meetings on the eastern shore, and so home by the way of Nottingham. We were abroad about six weeks, and rode, by computation, about five hundred and fifty miles. Our exercise at times was heavy, but through the goodness of the Lord we were often refreshed, and I may say by experience, he is a stronghold in the day of trouble." Though our society in these parts appeared to me to be in a declining condition, yet I believe the Lord hath a people amongst them who labor to serve him uprightly, but they have many difficulties to encounter. End of chapter 2 Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas Chapter 3 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz. Chapter 3, 1749 through 1756. His marriage, the death of his father, his journeys into the upper part of New Jersey, and afterwards into Pennsylvania, considerations on keeping slaves, and visits to the families of friends at several times and places, an epistle from the general meeting, his journey to Long Island, Considerations on trading and on the use of spirituous liquors and costly apparel, letter to a friend. About this time, believing it good for me to settle, and thinking seriously about a companion, 
My heart was turned to the Lord with desires that he would give me wisdom to proceed therein agreeably to his will, and he was pleased to give me a well-inclined damsel, Sarah Ellis, to whom I was married the 18th of 8th month, 1749. In the fall of the year 1750 died my father, Samuel Woolman, of a fever aged about 60 years. In his lifetime he manifested much care for us, his children, that in our youth we might learn to fear the Lord, and often endeavored to imprint in our minds the true principles of virtue, and particularly to cherish in us a spirit of tenderness, not only towards poor people, but also towards all creatures of which we had the command. After my return from Carolina in 1746, I made some observations on keeping slaves, which some time before his decease I showed to him. He perused the manuscript, proposed a few alterations, and appeared well satisfied that I found a concern on that account. In his last sickness, as I was watching with him one night, he being so far spent that there was no expectation of his recovery, though he had the perfect use of his understanding, he asked me concerning the manuscript, and whether I expected soon to proceed to take the advice of friends in publishing it. After some further conversation thereon, he said, I have all along been deeply affected with the oppression of the poor negroes, and now, at last, my concern for them is as great as ever. By his direction I had written his will in a time of health, and that night he desired me to read it to him, which I did, and he said it was agreeable to his mind. He then made mention of his end, which he believed was near, and signified that though he was sensible of many imperfections in the course of his life, yet his experience of the power of truth, and of the love and goodness of God from time to time, even till now, was such that he had no doubt that on leaving this life he should enter into one more happy. The next day his sister Elizabeth came to see him, and told him of the decease of their sister Anne, who died a few days before. He then said, I reckon sister Anne was free to leave this world. Elizabeth said she was. He then said, I also am free to leave it, and being in great weakness of body said, I hope I shall shortly go to rest. He continued in a weighty frame of mind, and was sensible till near the last. Second of ninth month, 1751. Feeling drawings in my mind to visit friends at the Great Meadows, in the upper part of West Jersey, with the unity of our monthly meeting, I went there, and had some searching laborious exercise amongst friends in those parts, and found inward peace therein. Ninth month, 1753. In company with my well-esteemed friend, John Sykes, and with the unity of friends, I traveled about two weeks, visiting friends in Bucks County. We labored in the love of the gospel, according to the measure received, and through the mercies of him who is strength to the poor who trust in him, we found satisfaction in our visit. In the next winter, way opening to visit friends' families within the compass of our monthly meeting, partly by the labors of two friends from Pennsylvania, I joined in some part of the work, having had a desire some time that it might go forward amongst us. About this time, a person at some distance lying sick, his brother came to me to write his will. I knew he had slaves, and asking his brother, was told he intended to leave them as slaves to his children. As writing is a profitable employ, and as offending sober people was disagreeable to my inclination, I was straitened in my mind, but as I looked to the Lord, he inclined my heart to his testimony. I told the man that I believed the practice of continuing slavery to this people was not right, and that I had a scruple in my mind against doing writings of that kind, that though many in our society kept them as slaves, still I was not easy to be concerned in it, and desired to be excused from going to write the will. I spake to him in the fear of the Lord, and he made no reply to what I said, but went away. He also had some concerns in the practice, and I thought he was displeased with me. In this case I had fresh confirmation that acting contrary to present outward interest, from a motive of divine love and in regard to truth and righteousness, and thereby incurring the resentments of people, opens the way to a treasure better than silver, and to a friendship exceeding the friendship of men. The manuscript before mentioned, having laid by me several years, 
the publication of it rested weightily upon me, and this year I offered it to the revisal of my friends, who, having examined and made some small alterations in it, directed a number of copies thereof to be published and dispersed amongst members of our society. In the year 1754, I found my mind drawn to join in a visit to friends' families belonging to Chesterfield Monthly Meeting, and having the approbation of our own, I went to their monthly meeting in order to confer with friends and see if way open for it. I had conference with some of their members, the proposal having been opened before in their meeting, and one friend agreed to join with me as a companion for a beginning. But when meeting was ended, I felt great distress of mind, and doubted what way to take, or whether to go home and wait for greater clearness. I kept my distress secret, and going with a friend to his house, my desires were to the great shepherd for his heavenly instruction. In the morning I felt easy to proceed on the visit, though very low in my mind. As mine eye was turned to the Lord, waiting in families in deep reverence before him, he was pleased graciously to afford help, so that we had many comfortable opportunities, and it appeared as a fresh visitation to some young people. I spent several weeks this winter in the service, part of which time was employed near home, and again in the following winter I was several weeks in the same service, some part of the time at Shrewsbury, in company with my beloved friend, John Sykes, and I have cause humbly to acknowledge that through the goodness of the Lord our hearts were at times enlarged in his love, and strength was given to go through the trials which, in the course of our visit, attended us. From a disagreement between the powers of England and France, it was now a time of trouble on this continent, and an epistle to friends went forth from our general spring meeting, which I thought good to give a place in this journal. An epistle from our general spring meeting of ministers and elders for Pennsylvania and New Jersey, held at Philadelphia from the 29th of the third month to the 1st of the fourth month, inclusive 1755. To friends on the continent of America, dear friends, in an humble sense of divine goodness and the gracious continuation of God's love to his people, we tenderly salute you and are at this time therein engaged in mind that all of us who profess the truth, as held forth and published by our worthy predecessors in this latter age of the world, may keep near to that life which is the light of men, and be strengthened to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, that our trust may not be in man, but in the Lord alone, who ruleth in the army of heaven and in the kingdoms of men, before whom the earth is, as the dust of the balance, and her inhabitants as grasshoppers. Isaiah 40:22. Being convinced that the gracious design of the Almighty in sending his Son into the world was to repair the breach made by disobedience, to finish sin and transgression, that his kingdom might come, and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have found it to be our duty to cease from those national contests which are productive of misery and bloodshed, and submit our cause to him, the Most High, whose tender love to his children exceeds the most warm affections of natural parents, and who hath promised to his seed throughout the earth, as to one individual, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5 And we, through the gracious dealings of the Lord our God, have had experience of that work which is carried on, not by earthly might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, 6 By which operation that spiritual kingdom is set up, which is to subdue and break in pieces all kingdoms that oppose it, and shall stand forever. In a deep sense thereof, and of the safety, stability, and peace that are in it, we are desirous that all who profess the truth may be inwardly acquainted with it, and thereby be qualified to conduct ourselves in all parts of our life as becomes our peaceful profession. And we trust, as there is a faithful continuance to depend wholly upon the Almighty Arm from one generation to another, the peaceable kingdom will gradually be extended from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9, 10 To the completion of those prophecies already begun, that nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, nor learn war any more. Isaiah 2, 4, 
Mika 4, 3. And, dearly beloved friends, seeing that we have these promises and believe that God is beginning to fulfill them, let us constantly endeavor to have our minds sufficiently disentangled from the surfeiting cares of this life and redeemed from the love of the world, that no earthly possessions nor enjoyments may bias our judgments or turn us from that resignation and entire trust in God to which his blessing is most surely annexed. Then may we say, Our Redeemer is mighty. He will plead our cause for us. Jeremiah fifty thirty four. And if, for the further promoting of his most gracious purposes in the earth, he should give us to taste of that bitter cup of which his faithful ones have often partaken, oh, that we might be rightly prepared to receive it. And now, dear friends, with respect to the commotions and stirrings of the powers of the earth at this time near us, we are desirous that none of us may be moved thereat, but repose ourselves in the munition of that rock which all these shakings shall not move, even in the knowledge and feeling of the eternal power of God, keeping us subjectly given up to his heavenly will, and feeling it daily to mortify that which remains in any of us which is of this world. For the worldly part in any is the changeable part, and that is up and down, full and empty, joyful and sorrowful, as things go well or ill in this world. For as the truth is but one, and many are made partakers of its spirit, so the world is but one, and many are made partakers of the spirit of it. And so many as do partake of it, so many will be straitened and perplexed with it. But they who are single to the truth, waiting daily to feel the life and virtue of it in their hearts, shall rejoice in the midst of adversity, and have to experience with the prophet that, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet will they rejoice in the Lord, and joy in the God of their salvation. Habakkuk 3.17.18 If contrary to this we profess the truth, and not living under the power and influence of it, or producing fruits disagreeable to the purity thereof, and trust to the strength of man to support ourselves, our confidence therein will be vain. For he who removed the hedge from his vineyard, and gave it to be trodden under foot by reason of the wild grapes it produced, Isaiah 5, 6, remains unchangeable, and if, for the chastisement of wickedness and the further promoting of his own glory, he doth arise even to shake terribly the earth, who then may oppose him and prosper? We remain in the love of the gospel, your friends and brethren. Signed by fourteen friends. Scrupling to do writings relative to keeping slaves has been a means of sundry small trials to me, in which I have so evidently felt my own will set aside that I think it good to mention a few of them. Tradesmen and retailers of goods, who depend on their business for a living, are naturally inclined to keep the good will of their customers, nor is it a pleasant thing for young men to be under any necessity to question the judgment or honesty of elderly men, and more especially of such as have a fair reputation. Deep-rooted customs, though wrong, are not easily altered, but it is the duty of all to be firm in that which they certainly know is right for them. A charitable, benevolent man, well acquainted with a negro, may, I believe, under some circumstances, keep him in his family as a servant, on no other motives than the negro's good. But man, as man knows not what shall be after him, nor hath he any assurance that his children will attain to that perfection and wisdom and goodness necessary rightly to exercise such power. Hence it is clear to me that I ought not to be the scribe where wills are drawn in which some children are made ails masters over others during life. About this time an ancient man of good esteem in the neighborhood came to my house to get his will written. He had young negroes, and I asked him privately how he proposed to dispose of them. He told me, I then said, I cannot write thy will without breaking my own peace, and respectfully gave him my reasons for it. He signified that he had a choice that I should have written it, but as I could not, consistently with my conscience, he did not desire it, and so he got it written by some other person. 
A few years after, there being great alterations in his family, he came again to get me to write his will. His negroes were yet young, and his son, to whom he intended to give them, was, since he first spoke to me, from a libertine become a sober young man, and he supposed that I would have been free on that account to write it. We had much friendly talk on the subject, and then deferred it. A few days after, he came again and directed their freedom, and I then wrote his will. Near the time that the last-mentioned friend first spoke to me, a neighbor received a bad bruise in his body and sent for me to bleed him, which, having done, he desired me to write his will. I took notes, and amongst other things he told me to which of his children he gave his young negro. I considered the pain and distress he was in, and knew not how it would end, so I wrote his will, save only that part concerning his slave, and carrying it to his bedside, read it to him. I then told him in a friendly way that I could not write any instruments by which my fellow creatures were made slaves, without bringing trouble on my own mind. I let him know that I charged nothing for what I had done, and desired to be excused from doing the other part in the way he proposed. We then had a serious conference on the subject. At length, he agreed to set her free. I finished his will. Having found drawings in my mind to visit friends on Long Island, after obtaining a certificate from our monthly meeting, I set off, 12th of 5th month, 1756. When I reached the island, I lodged the first night at the house of my dear friend, Richard Hallett. The next day, being the first of the week, I was at the meeting in Newtown, in which we experienced the renewed manifestations of the love of Jesus Christ to the comfort of the honest-hearted. I went that night to Flushing, and the next day I and my beloved friend, Matthew Franklin, crossed the ferry at Whitestone, were at three meetings on the main, and then returned to the island, where I spent the remainder of the week in visiting meetings. The Lord, I believe, hath the people in those parts who are honestly inclined to serve him, but many, I fear, are too much clogged with the things of this life, and do not come forward bearing the cross in such faithfulness as he calls for. My mind was deeply engaged in this visit, both in public and private, and at several places where I was, on observing that they had slaves, I found myself under a necessity, in a friendly way, to labor with them on that subject, expressing, as way opened, the inconsistency of that practice with the purity of the Christian religion, and the ill effects of it manifested among us. The latter end of the week their yearly meeting began, at which were our friends, John Scarborough, Jane Hoskins, and Susanna Brown, from Pennsylvania. The public meetings were large, and measurably favored with divine goodness. The exercise of my mind at this meeting was chiefly on account of those who were considered as the foremost rank in the society, and in a meeting of ministers and elders way open for me to express in some measure what lay upon me, and when friends were met for transacting the affairs of the church, having sat a while silent, I felt a weight on my mind and stood up, and through the gracious regard of our Heavenly Father, strength was given fully to clear myself of a burden which for some days had been increasing upon me. Through the humbling dispensations of divine providence, men are sometimes fitted for his service. The messages of the prophet Jeremiah were so disagreeable to the people and so adverse to the spirit they lived in, that he became the object of their reproach, and in the weakness of nature he thought of desisting from his prophetic office, but saith he, His word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and could not stay. I saw at this time that if I was honest in declaring that which truth opened in me, I could not please all men and I labored to be content in the way of my duty, however disagreeable to my own inclination. After this I went homeward, taking Woodbridge and Plainfield in my way, in both which meetings the pure influence of divine love was manifested, and in humbling sense whereof I went home. I had been out about twenty-four days, and rode about three hundred and sixteen miles. While I was out on this journey, my heart was much affected with a sense of the state of the churches in our southern provinces, and believing the Lord was calling me to some further labor amongst them, I was bowed in reverence before him, with fervent desires that I might find strength to resign myself to his heavenly will. Until this year, 1756, 
I continued to retail goods, besides following my trade as a tailor, about which time I grew uneasy on account of my business growing too cumbersome. I had begun with selling trimmings for garments, and from thence proceeded to sell cloths and linens, and at length, having got a considerable shop of goods, my trade increased every year, and the way to large business appeared open, but I felt a stop in my mind. Through the mercies of the Almighty, I had, in a good degree, learned to be content with a plain way of living. I had but a small family, and, on serious consideration, believed truth did not require me to engage much in cumbering affairs. It had been my general practice to buy and sell things really useful. Things that served chiefly to please the vain mind in people, I was not easy to trade in. Seldom did it, and whenever I did, I found it weak in me as a Christian. The increase of business became my burden, for though my natural inclination was toward merchandise, yet I believe truth required me to live more free from outward cumbers, and there was now a strife in my mind between the two. In this exercise my prayers were put up to the Lord, who graciously heard me, and gave me a heart resigned to his holy will. Then I lessened my outward business, and, as I had opportunity, told my customers of my intentions, that they might consider what shop to turn to, and in a while I wholly laid down merchandise, and followed my trade as a tailor by myself, having no apprentice. I also had a nursery of apple trees, in which I employed some of my time in hoeing, grafting, trimming, and inoculating. In merchandise it is the custom where I live to sell chiefly on credit, and poor people often get in debt, when payment is expected, not having wherewith to pay, their creditors often sue for it at law. Having frequently observed occurrences of this kind, I found it good for me to advise poor people to take such goods as were most useful and not costly. In the time of trading I had an opportunity of seeing that the too liberal use of spiritualist liquors and the custom of wearing too costly apparel led some people into great inconveniences, and that these two things appeared to be often connected with each other. By not attending to that use of things which is consistent with universal righteousness, there is an increase of labor which extends beyond what our Heavenly Father intends for us. And by great labor, and often of much sweating, there is even among such as are not drunkards a craving of liquors to revive the spirits, that partly by the luxurious drinking of some, and partly by the drinking of others, led to it through immoderate labor, very great quantities of rum are every year expended in our colonies, the greater part of which we should have no need of did we steadily attend to pure wisdom. When men take pleasure in feeling their minds elevated with strong drink, and so indulge their appetite as to disorder their understandings, neglect their duty as members of a family or civil society, and cast off all regard to religion, their case is much to be pitied. And where those whose lives are for the most part regular, and whose examples have a strong influence on the minds of others, adhere to some customs which powerfully draw to the use of more strong liquor than pure wisdom allows, it hinders the spreading of the spirit of meekness, and strengthens the hands of the more excessive drinkers. This is a case to be lamented. Every degree of luxury has some connection with evil, and if those who profess to be disciples of Christ, and are looked upon as leaders of the people, have that mind in them which was also in Christ, and so stand separate from every wrong way, it is a means of help to the weaker. As I have sometimes been much spent in the heat, and have taken spirits to revive me, I have found by experience that in such circumstances the mind is not so calm, nor so fitly disposed for divine meditation, as when all such extremes are avoided. I have felt an increasing care to attend to that Holy Spirit which sets right bounds to our desires, and leads those who faithfully follow it to apply all the gifts of divine providence to the purposes for which they were intended. Did those who have the care of great estates attend with singleness of heart to this heavenly instructor, which so opens and enlarges the mind as to cause men to love their neighbors as themselves, they would have wisdom given them to manage their concerns without employing some people in providing luxuries of life, or others in laboring too hard, but for want of steadily regarding this principle of divine love, a selfish spirit takes place in the minds of people, which is attended with darkness and manifold confusions in the world. 
Though trading in things useful is an honest employ, yet through the great number of superfluities which are bought and sold, and through the corruption of the times, they who apply to merchandise for a living have great need to be well experienced in that precept which the prophet Jeremiah laid down for his scribe. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. In the winter this year I was engaged with friends in visiting families, and through the goodness of the Lord we oftentimes experienced his heart-tendering presence among us. A copy of a letter written to a friend. In this, thy late affliction, I have found a deep fellow-feeling with thee, and have had a secret hope throughout that it might please the Father of mercies to raise thee up and sanctify thy troubles to thee, that thou being more fully acquainted with that which the world esteems foolish, mayest feel the clothing of divine fortitude, and be strengthened to resist that spirit which leads from the simplicity of the everlasting truth. We may see ourselves crippled and halting, and from a strong bias to things pleasant and easy, find an impossibility to advance forward, but things impossible with men are possible with God, and our wills being made subject to His, all temptations are surmountable. This work of subjecting the will is compared to the mineral in the furnace, which, through fervent heat, is reduced from its first principle. He refines them as silver is refined, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. By these comparisons we are instructed in the necessity of the melting operation of the hand of God upon us, to prepare our hearts truly to adore him, and manifest that adoration by inwardly turning away from that spirit, and all its workings which is not of him. To forward this work the all-wise God is sometimes pleased, through outward distress, to bring us near the gates of death, that life being painful and afflicting, and the prospect of eternity open before us, all earthly bonds may be loosened, and the mind prepared for that deep and sacred instruction which otherwise would not be received. If kind parents love their children, and delight in their happiness, then he who is perfect goodness in sending abroad mortal contagions doth assuredly direct their use. Are the righteous removed by it? Their change is happy. Are the wicked taken away in their wickedness? The Almighty is clear. Do we pass through with anguish and great bitterness, and yet recover? He intends that we should be purged from dross, and our ear open to discipline. And now, as thou art again restored, after thy sore affliction and doubts of recovery, forget not him who hath helped thee, but in humble gratitude hold fast his instructions, and thereby shun those bypaths which lead from the firm foundation. I am sensible of that variety of company to which one in thy business must be exposed. I have painfully felt the force of conversation proceeding from men deeply rooted in an earthly mind, and can sympathize with others in such conflicts, because much weakness still attends me. I find that to be a fool as to worldly wisdom, and to commit my cause to God, not fearing to offend men, who take offense at the simplicity of truth, is the only way to remain unmoved at the sentiments of others. The fear of man brings a snare. By halting in our duty, and giving back in the time of trial, our hands grow weaker, our spirits get mingled with the people, our ears grow dull as to hearing the language of the true shepherd, so that when we look at the way of the righteous, it seems as though it was not for us to follow them. A love clothes my mind while I write, which is superior to all expression and I find my heart open to encourage to a holy emulation, to advance forward in Christian firmness. Deep humility is a strong bulwark, and as we enter into it we find safety and true exaltation. The foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Being unclothed of our own wisdom, and knowing the abasement of the creature, we find that power to arise which gives health and vigor to us. End of chapter 3 Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 4 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, 1757-1758. Visit to the families of friends at Burlington. Journey to Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. 
considerations on the state of friends there and the exercise he was under in traveling among those so generally concerned in keeping slaves with some observations on this subject epistle to friends at new garden and crane creek thoughts on the neglect of a religious care and the education of the negroes thirteenth fifth month seventeen fifty seven being in good health and abroad with friends visiting families i lodged at a friend's house in burlington going to bed about the time usual with me i awoke in the night and my meditations as i lay were on the goodness and mercy of the lord in a sense whereof my heart was contrited after this i went to sleep again in a short time i awoke it was yet dark and no appearance of day or moonshine and as i opened mine eyes i saw a light in my chamber at the apparent distance of five feet about nine inches in diameter of a clear easy brightness and near its centre the most radiant as i lay still looking upon it without any surprise words were spoken to my inward ear which filled my whole inward man they were not the effect of thought nor any conclusion in relation to the appearance but as the language of the holy one spoken in my mind the words were certain evidence of divine truth they were again repeated exactly in the same manner and then the light disappeared feeling the exercise in relation to a visit to the southern provinces to increase upon me i acquainted our monthly meeting therewith and obtained their certificate expecting to go alone one of my brothers who lived in philadelphia having some business in north carolina proposed going with me part of the way but as he had a view of some outward affairs to accept of him as a companion was some difficulty with me whereupon i had conversation with him at sundry times at length feeling easy in my mind i had conversation with several elderly friends of philadelphia on the subject and he obtaining a certificate suitable to the occasion we set off in the fifth month seventeen fifty seven coming to nottingham weekday meeting we lodged at john churchman's where i met with our friend benjamin buffington from new england who was returning from a visit to the southern provinces thence we crossed the river susquehanna and lodged at william cox's in maryland soon after i entered this province a deep and painful exercise came upon me which i often had some feeling of since my mind was drawn toward these parts and with which i had acquainted my brother before we agreed to join as companions as the people in this and the southern provinces live much on the labor of slaves many of whom are used hardly my concern was that i might attend with singleness of heart to the voice of the true shepherd and be so supported as to remain unmoved at the faces of men as it is common for friends on such a visit to have entertainment free of cost a difficulty arose in my mind with respect to saving my money by kindness received from what appeared to me to be the gain of oppression receiving a gift considered as a gift brings the receiver under obligations to the benefactor and has a natural tendency to draw the obliged into a party with the giver to prevent difficulties of this kind and to preserve the minds of judges from any bias was that divine prohibition thou shalt not receive any gift for a gift bindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous exodus twenty three eight as the disciples were sent forth without any provision for their journey and our lord said the workman is worthy of his meat their labor in the gospel was considered as a reward for their entertainment and therefore not received as a gift yet in regard to my present journey i could not see my way clear in that respect the difference appeared thus the entertainment the disciples met with was from them whose hearts god had opened to receive them from a love to them and the truth they published but we considered as members of the same religious society look upon it as a piece of civility to receive each other in such visits and such receptions at times is partly in regard to reputation and not from an inward unity of heart and spirit conduct is more convincing than language and where people by their actions manifest that the slave trade is not so disagreeable to their principles but that it may be encouraged there is not a sound uniting with some friends who visit them the prospect of so weighty a work and of being so distinguished from many whom i esteem before myself brought me very low and such were the conflicts of my soul that i had a near sympathy with the prophet in the time of his weakness when he said if thou deal thus with me 
Kill me, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight. Numbers 11, 15. But I soon saw that this proceeded from the want of a full resignation to the divine will. Many were the afflictions which attended me, and in great abasement, with many tears, my cries were to the Almighty for his gracious and fatherly assistance, and after a time of deep trial I was favored to understand the state mentioned by the psalmist more clearly than ever I had done before, to wit, my soul is even as a weaned child. Psalm 131, 2. Being thus helped to sink down into resignation, I felt a deliverance from that tempest in which I had been sorely exercised, and in calmness of mind went forward, trusting that the Lord Jesus Christ, as I faithfully attended to him, would be a counselor to me in all difficulties, and that by his strength I should be enabled even to leave money with the members of society where I had entertainment, when I found that omitting it would obstruct that work to which I believed he had called me. As I copy this after my return, I may here add that oftentimes I did so under a sense of duty. The way in which I did it was thus. When I expected soon to leave a friend's house where I had entertainment, if I believed that I should not keep clear from the gain of oppression without leaving money, I spoke to one of the heads of the family privately, and desired them to accept of those pieces of silver, and give them to such of their negroes as they believed would make the best use of them and at other times I gave them to the negroes myself, as the way looked clearest to me. Before I came out, I had provided a large number of small pieces for this purpose, and thus offering them to some who appeared to be wealthy people was a trial both to me and them, but the fear of the Lord so covered me at times that my way was made easier than I expected, and few, if any, manifested any resentment at the offer, and most of them, after some conversation, accepted of them. Ninth of fifth month, a friend at whose house we breakfasted, setting us a little on our way, I had conversation with him in the fear of the Lord concerning his slaves, in which my heart was tender. I used much plainness of speech with him, and he appeared to take it kindly. We pursued our journey without appointing meetings, being pressed in my mind to be at the yearly meeting in Virginia, in my traveling on the road, I often felt a cry rise from the center of my mind. Thus, O Lord, I am a stranger on the earth. Hide not thy face from me. On the eleventh, we crossed the rivers Potomac and Rappahannock and lodged at Port Royal. On the way, we had the company of a colonel of the militia who appeared to be a thoughtful man. I took occasion to remark on the difference in general betwixt a people used to labor moderately for their living, training up their children in frugality and business, and those who live on the labor of slaves, the former, in my view, being the most happy life. He concurred in the remark, and mentioned the trouble arising from the untoward, slothful disposition of the negroes, adding that one of our laborers would do as much in a day as two of their slaves. I replied that free men, whose minds were properly on their business, found a satisfaction in improving, cultivating, and providing for their families, but Negroes, laboring to support others who claimed them as their property, and expecting nothing but slavery during life, had not the like inducement to be industrious. After some further conversation, I said that men having power too often misapplied it, that though we made slaves of the Negroes, and the Turks made slaves of the Christians, I believe that liberty was the natural right of all men equally. This he did not deny, but said the lives of the Negroes were so wretched in their own country that many of them live better here than there. I replied, there is great odds in regard to us on what principle we act, and so the conversation on that subject ended. I may here add that another person, some time afterwards, mentioned the wretchedness of the Negroes, occasioned by their intestine wars, as an argument in favor of our fetching them away for slaves. To which I replied, if compassion for the Africans, on account of their domestic troubles, was the real motive of our purchasing them, that spirit of tenderness being attended to, would incite us to use them kindly that, as strangers brought out of affliction, their lives might be happy among us. And as they are human creatures, whose souls are as precious as ours, 
and who may receive the same help and comfort from the Holy Scriptures as we do, we could not omit suitable endeavors to instruct them therein, but that while we manifest by our conduct that our views in purchasing them are to advance ourselves, and while our buying captives taken in war animates those parties to push on the war and increase desolation amongst them, to say they live unhappily in Africa is far from being an argument in our favor. I further said, the present circumstances of these provinces to me appear difficult. The slaves look like a burdensome stone to such as burden themselves with them, and that if the white people retain a resolution to prefer their outward prospects of gain to all other considerations, and do not act conscientiously toward them as fellow creatures, I believe that burden will grow heavier and heavier until times change in a way disagreeable to us. The person appeared very serious, and owned that in considering their condition and the manner of their treatment in these provinces, he had sometimes thought it might be just in the Almighty so to order it. Having traveled through Maryland, we came amongst friends at Cedar Creek in Virginia on the 12th, and the next day rode in company with several of them, a day's journey to Camp Creek. As I was riding along in the morning, my mind was deeply affected in the sense I had of the need of divine aid to support me in the various difficulties which attended me, and in uncommon distress of mind I cried in secret to the Most High, O Lord, be merciful, I beseech thee, to thy poor afflicted creature. After some time I felt inward relief, and, soon after, a friend and company began to talk in support of the slave trade, and said the Negroes were understood to be the offspring of Cain, their blackness being the mark which God set upon him after he murdered Abel, his brother, that it was the design of Providence they should be slaves, as a condition proper to the race of so wicked a man as Cain was. Then another spake in support of what had been said, to all which I replied in substance as follows, that Noah and his family were all who survived the flood, according to Scripture, and as Noah was of Seth's race, the family of Cain was wholly destroyed. One of them said that after the flood Ham went to the land of Nod and took a wife, that Nod was a land far distant, inhabited by Cain's race, and that the flood did not reach it, and as Ham was sentenced to be a servant of servants to his brethren, these two families, being thus joined, were undoubtedly fit only for slaves. I replied the flood was a judgment upon the world for their abominations, and it was granted that Cain's stock was the most wicked, and therefore unreasonable to suppose that they were spared. As to Ham's going to the land of Nod for a wife, no time being fixed, Nod might be inhabited by some of Noah's family before Ham married a second time. Moreover, the text saith that all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Genesis 7:21. I further reminded them how the prophets repeatedly declare that the Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, but every one be answerable for his own sins. I was troubled to perceive the darkness of their imaginations, and in some pressure of spirit said, The love of ease and gain are the motives in general of keeping slaves, and men are wont to take hold of weak arguments to support a cause which is unreasonable. I have no interest on either side, save only the interest which I desire to have in the truth. I believe liberty is their right, and as I see they are not only deprived of it, but treated in other respects with inhumanity in many places, I believe he who is a refuge for the oppressed will, in his own time, plead their cause, and happy will it be for such as walk in uprightness before him. And thus our conversation ended. Fourteenth of Fifth Month I was this day at Camp Creek monthly meeting, and then rode to the mountains up James River, and had a meeting at a friend's house, in both which I felt sorrow of heart, and my tears were poured out before the Lord, who was pleased to afford a degree of strength by which way was opened to clear my mind amongst friends in those places. From thence I went to Fort Creek, and so to Cedar Creek again, at which place I now had a meeting. Here I found a tender seed, and as I was preserved in the ministry to keep low with the truth, the same truth in their hearts answered it, that it was a time of mutual refreshment from the presence of the Lord. I lodged at James Stanley's, father of William Stanley, 
one of the young men who suffered imprisonment at Winchester last summer on account of their testimony against fighting, and I had some satisfactory conversation with him concerning it. Hence I went to the swamp meeting and to Wyanoke meeting, and then crossed James River and lodged near Burley. From the time of my entering Maryland, I had been much under sorrow, which of late so increased upon me that my mind was almost overwhelmed, and I may say with the psalmist, in my distress I called upon the Lord, and cried to my God, who in infinite goodness looked upon my affliction, and in my private retirement sent the Comforter for my relief, for which I humbly bless his holy name. The sense I had of the state of the churches brought a weight of distress upon me. The gold to me appeared dim, and the fine gold changed, and though this is the case too generally, yet the sense of it in these parts hath in a particular manner borne heavy upon me. It appeared to me that through the prevailing of the spirit of this world, the minds of many were brought to an inward desolation, and instead of the spirit of meekness, gentleness, and heavenly wisdom, which are the necessary companions of the true sheep of Christ, a spirit of fierceness and the love of dominion too generally prevailed. From small beginnings in air great buildings by degrees are raised, and from one age to another are more and more strengthened by the general concurrence of the people, and as men obtain reputation by their profession of the truth, their virtues are mentioned as arguments in favor of general error, and those of less note, to justify themselves, say, such and such good men did the like. By what other steps could the people of Judah arise to that height and wickedness as to give just ground for the prophet Isaiah to declare, in the name of the Lord, that none calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth, Isaiah 59, 4, or for the Almighty to call upon the great city of Jerusalem just before the Babylonish captivity. If ye can find a man, if there be any who executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it, Jeremiah 5, 1. The prospect of a way being open to the same degeneracy in some parts of this newly settled land of America, in respect to our conduct towards the Negroes, hath deeply bowed my mind in this journey, and though briefly to relate how these people are treated is no agreeable work yet, after often reading over the notes I made as I traveled, I find my mind engaged to preserve them. Many of the white people in those provinces take little or no care of Negro marriages, and when Negroes marry after their own way, some make so little account of those marriages that with views of outward interest they often part men from their wives by selling them far asunder, which is common when the states are sold by executors at Vindu. Many whose labor is heavy being followed at their business in the field by a man with a whip, hired for that purpose, have in common little else allowed but one peck of Indian corn and some salt, for one week, with a few potatoes, the potatoes they commonly raise by their labor on the first day of the week. The correction ensuing on their disobedience to overseers, or slothfulness in business, is often very severe and sometimes desperate. Men and women have many times scarcely clothes sufficient to hide their nakedness, and boys and girls ten and twelve years old are often quite naked amongst their master's children. Some of our society, and some of the society called New Lights, use some endeavors to instruct those they have in reading, but in common this is not only neglected, but disapproved. These are the people by whose labor the other inhabitants are in a great measure supported, and many of them in the luxuries of life. These are the people who have made no agreement to serve us, and who have not forfeited their liberty that we know of. These are the souls for whom Christ died, and for our conduct towards them we must answer before him who is no respecter of persons. They who know the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent, and are thus acquainted with the merciful, benevolent gospel spirit, will therein perceive that the indignation of God is kindled against oppression and cruelty, and in beholding the great distress of so numerous a people will find cause for mourning. From my lodgings I went to Burley Meeting, where I felt my mind drawn in a quiet, resigned state. After a long silence I felt an engagement to stand up, and through the powerful operation of divine love we were favored with an edifying meeting. 
The next meeting we had was at Blackwater, and from thence went to the yearly meeting at the Western Branch. When business began, some queries were introduced by some of their members for consideration, and, if approved, they were to be answered hereafter by their respective monthly meetings. They were the Pennsylvania queries, which had been examined by a committee of Virginia yearly meeting appointed the last year, who made some alterations in them, one of which alterations was made in favor of a custom which troubled me. The query was, are there any concern in the importation of Negroes, or in buying them after imported? Which was thus altered, are there any concern in the importation of Negroes, or buying them to trade in? As one query admitted with unanimity was, are any concerned in buying or vending goods unlawfully imported or prize goods, I found my mind engaged to say that as we professed the truth, and were there assembled to support the testimony of it, it was necessary for us to dwell deep and act in that wisdom which is pure, or otherwise we could not prosper. I then mentioned their alteration, and referring to the last mentioned query, added that as purchasing any merchandise taken by the sword was always allowed to be inconsistent with our principles, so negroes being captives of war, or taken by stealth, it was inconsistent with our testimony to buy them, and their being our fellow creatures and sold as slaves added greatly to the iniquity. Friends appeared attentive to what was said, some expressed a care and concern about their negroes, None made any objection, by way of reply to what I said, but the query was admitted as they had altered it. As some of their members have heretofore traded in Negroes, as in other merchandise, this query being admitted will be one step further than they have hitherto gone, and I did not see it in my duty to press for an alteration, but felt easy to leave it all to him who alone is able to turn the hearts of the mighty and make way for the spreading of truth on the earth by means agreeable to his infinite wisdom. In regard to those they already had, I felt my mind engaged to labor with them, and said that as we believe the scriptures were given forth by holy men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and many of us know by experience that they are often helpful and comfortable, and believe ourselves bound in duty to teach our children to read them, I believe that if we were divested of all selfish views, the same good spirit that gave them forth would engage us to teach the Negroes to read, that they might have the benefit of them. Some present manifested a concern to take more care in the education of their Negroes. Twenty-ninth, fifth month. At the house where I lodged was a meeting of ministers and elders. I found an engagement to speak freely and plainly to them concerning their slaves, mentioning how they, as the first rank in the society, whose conduct in that case was much noticed by others, were under the stronger obligations to look carefully to themselves, expressing how needful it was for them in that situation to be thoroughly divested of all selfish views, that, living in the pure truth, and acting conscientiously towards those people in their education and otherwise, they might be instrumental in helping forward a work so exceedingly necessary, and so much neglected amongst them. At the twelfth hour the meeting of worship began, which was a solid meeting. The next day, about the tenth hour, friends met to finish their business, and then the meeting for worship ensued, which to me was a laborious time, but through the goodness of the Lord, truth, I believed, gained some ground, and it was a strengthening opportunity to the honest-hearted. About this time I wrote an epistle to friends in the back settlements of North Carolina as follows. To friends at their monthly meeting at New Garden and Cane Creek in North Carolina. Dear friends, it having pleased the Lord to draw me forth on a visit to some parts of Virginia and Carolina, you have often been in my mind, and though my way is not clear to come in person to visit you, yet I feel it in my heart to communicate a few things as they arise in the love of truth. First, my dear friends, dwell in humility, and take heed that no views of outward gain get too deep hold of you, that so your eyes being single to the Lord, you may be preserved in the way of safety. Where people let loose their minds after the love of outward things, 
and are more engaged in pursuing the profits and seeking the friendships of this world than to be inwardly acquainted with the way of true peace, they walk in a vain shadow while the true comfort of life is wanting. Their examples are often hurtful to others, and their treasures thus collected do many times prove dangerous snares to their children. But where people are sincerely devoted to follow Christ, and dwell under the influence of His Holy Spirit, their stability and firmness, through a divine blessing, is at times like dew on the tender plants round about them, and the weightiness of their spirits secretly works on the minds of others. In this condition, through the spreading influence of divine love, they feel a care over the flock, and way is open for maintaining good order in the society. And though we may meet with opposition from another spirit, yet, as there is a dwelling in meekness, feeling our spirit subject, and moving only in the gentle, peaceable wisdom, the inward reward of quietness will be greater than all our difficulties. Where the pure life is kept to, and meetings of discipline are held in the authority of it, we find by experience that they are comfortable, and tend to the health of the body. While I write, the youth come fresh in my way. Dear young people, choose God for your portion, love his truth, and be not ashamed of it. Choose for your company such as serve him in uprightness, and shun as most dangerous the conversation of those whose lives are of an ill savor, for by frequenting such company some hopeful young people have come to great loss, and been drawn from less evils to greater, to their utter ruin. In the bloom of youth no ornament is so lovely as that of virtue, nor any enjoyments equal to those which we partake of in fully resigning ourselves to the divine will. These enjoyments add sweetness to all other comforts, and give true satisfaction in company and conversation, where people are mutually acquainted with it, and as your minds are thus seasoned with the truth, you will find strength to abide steadfast to the testimony of it, and be prepared for services in the church. And now, dear friends and brethren, as you are improving a wilderness, and may be numbered amongst the first planters in one part of a province, I beseech you, in the love of Jesus Christ, wisely to consider the force of your examples, and think how much your successors may be thereby affected. It is a help in a country, yea, and a great favor and blessing, when customs first settled are agreeable to sound wisdom, but when they are otherwise the effect of them is grievous, and children feel themselves encompassed with difficulties prepared for them by their predecessors. As moderate care and exercise, under the discretion of true wisdom, are useful both to mind and body, so by these means in general the real wants of life are easily supplied, our gracious Father having so proportioned one to the other that keeping in the medium we may pass on quietly, where slaves are purchased to do our labor numerous difficulties attend it, to rational creatures bondage is uneasy, and frequently occasions sourness and discontent in them, which affects the family and such as claim the mastery over them. Thus people and their children are many times encompassed with vexations, which arise from their applying to wrong methods to get a living. I have been informed that there is a large number of friends in your parts who have no slaves, and in tender and most affectionate love I beseech you to keep clear from purchasing any. Look, my dear friends, to divine providence, and follow in simplicity that exercise of body, that plainness and frugality which true wisdom leads to, so may you be preserved from those dangers which attend such as are aiming at outward ease and greatness. Treasures, though small, attained on the true principle of virtue, are sweet, and while we walk in the light of the Lord there is true comfort and satisfaction in the possession, neither the murmurs of an oppressed people, nor a throbbing, uneasy conscience, nor anxious thoughts about the events of things, hinder the enjoyment of them. When we look towards the end of life, and think on the division of our substance among our successors, if we know that it was collected in the fear of the Lord, in honesty, in equity, and in uprightness of heart before Him, we may consider it as His gift to us, and with a single eye to his blessing, bestow it on those we leave behind us. Such is the happiness of the plain ways of true virtue. 
The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Isaiah 32:17. Dwell here, my dear friends, and then in remote and solitary deserts you may find true peace and satisfaction. If the Lord be our God, in truth and reality, there is safety for us. For he is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and knoweth them that trust in him. Isle of Wight County, in Virginia, 20th of the 5th month, 1757. From the yearly meeting in Virginia, I went to Carolina, and on the 1st of 6th month was at Wells Monthly Meeting, where the spring of the gospel ministry was opened, and the love of Jesus Christ experienced among us, to his name be the praise. Here my brother joined with some friends from New Garden who were going homeward, and I went next to Simon's Creek monthly meeting, where I was silent during the meeting for worship. When business came on, my mind was exercised concerning the poor slaves, but I did not feel my way clear to speak. In this condition I was bowed in spirit before the Lord, and with tears and inward supplication besought him so to open my understanding that I might know his will concerning me, and, at length, my mind was settled in silence. Near the end of their business, a member of their meeting expressed a concern that had some time lain upon him, on account of friends so much neglecting their duty in the education of their slaves, and proposed having meetings sometimes appointed for them on a weekday, to be attended only by some friends to be named in their monthly meetings. Many present appeared to unite with the proposal. One said he had often wondered that they, being our fellow creatures, and capable of religious understanding, had been so exceedingly neglected. Another expressed the like concern, and appeared zealous that in future it might be more closely considered. At length a minute was made, and the further consideration of it referred to their next monthly meeting. The friend who made this proposal hath Negroes, he told me that he was at New Garden, about 250 miles from home, and came back alone. That in this solitary journey this exercise, in regard to the education of their Negroes, was from time to time renewed in his mind. A friend of some note in Virginia, who hath slaves, told me that he being far from home on a lonesome journey had many serious thoughts about them and his mind was so impressed therewith that he believed he saw a time coming when divine providence would alter the circumstance of these people respecting their condition as slaves. From hence I went to a meeting at New Begun Creek, and sat a considerable time in much weakness. Then I felt truth open the way to speak a little in much plainness and simplicity, till at length, through the increase of divine love amongst us, we had a seasoning opportunity. This was also the case at the head of Little River, where we had a crowded meeting on a first day. I went thence to the Old Neck, where I was led into a careful searching out of the secret workings of the mystery of iniquity, which, under a cover of religion, exalts itself against that pure spirit which leads in the way of meekness and self-denial. Piney Woods was the last meeting I was at in Carolina. It was large, and my heart being deeply engaged, I was drawn forth into a fervent labor amongst them. When I was at New Begun Creek, a friend was there who labored for his living, having no Negroes, and who had been a minister many years. He came to me the next day, and as we rode together, he signified that he wanted to talk with me concerning a difficulty he had been under, which he related nearly as follows that as monies had of late years been raised by a tax to carry on the wars, he had a scruple in his mind in regard to paying it, and chose rather to suffer restraint of his goods, but as he was the only person who refused it in those parts, and knew not that any one else was in the like circumstances, he signified that it had been a heavy trial to him, especially as some of his brethren had been uneasy with his conduct in that case. He added that from a sympathy he felt with me yesterday in meeting, he found freedom thus to open the matter in the way of querying concerning friends in our parts. I told him the state of friends amongst us as well as I was able, and also that I had for some time been under the like scruple. I believed him to be one who was concerned to walk uprightly before the Lord, 
and esteemed it my duty to preserve this note concerning him, Samuel Newby. From hence I went back into Virginia, and had a meeting near James Copeland's. It was a time of inward suffering, but through the goodness of the Lord I was made content. At another meeting, through the renewings of pure love, we had a very comfortable season. Traveling up and down of late, I have had renewed evidences that to be faithful to the Lord, and content with his will concerning me, is a most necessary and useful lesson for me to be learning. Looking less at the effects of my labor than at the pure motion and reality of the concern, as it arises from heavenly love. And the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength, and as the mind, by humble resignation, is united to him, and we utter words from an inward knowledge that they arise from the heavenly spring, though our way may be difficult, and it may require close attention to keep in it, and though the matter in which we may be led may tend to our own abasement, yet, if we continue in patience and meekness, heavenly peace will be the reward of our labors. I attended Curl's meeting, which, though small, was reviving to the honest-hearted. Afterwards I went to Black Creek and Caroline meetings, from whence, accompanied by William Stanley, before mentioned, I rode to Goose Creek, being much through the woods, and about one hundred miles. We lodged the first night at a public house, the second in the woods, and the next day we reached a friend's house at Goose Creek. In the woods we were under some disadvantage, having no fireworks nor bells for our horses, but we stopped a little before night and let them feed on the wild grass, which was plentiful, in the meantime cutting with our knives a store against night. We then secured our horses, and gathering some bushes under an oak we lay down, but the mosquitoes being numerous and the ground damp, I slept but little. Thus lying in the wilderness and looking at the stars, I was led to contemplate on the condition of our first parents when they were sent forth from the garden, how the Almighty, though they had been disobedient, continued to be a father to them, and showed them what tended to their felicity as intelligent creatures, and was acceptable to him. To provide things relative to our outward living, and the way of true wisdom, is good, and the gift of improving in things useful is a good gift, and comes from the Father of lights. Many have had this gift, and from age to age there have been improvements of this kind made in the world, but some, not keeping to the pure gift, have in the creaturely cunning and self-exaltation sought out many inventions. As the first motive to these inventions of men, as distinct from that uprightness in which man was created, was evil, so the effects have been and are evil. It is, therefore, as necessary for us at this day constantly to attend on the heavenly gift, to be qualified to use rightly the good things in this life, amidst great improvements, as it was for our first parents when they were without any improvements, without any friend or father but God only. I was at a meeting at Goose Creek, and next at a monthly meeting at Fairfax, where, through the gracious dealing of the Almighty with us, his power prevailed over many hearts. From thence I went to Monocacy and Pipe Creek in Maryland. At both places I had caused humbly to adore him who had supported me through many exercises, and by whose help I was enabled to reach the true witness in the hearts of others. There were some hopeful young people in those parts. I had meetings afterwards at John Everett's in Monolin and at Huntington, and I was made humbly thankful to the Lord, who opened my heart amongst the people in these new settlements, so that it was a time of encouragement to the honest-minded. At Monolin a friend gave me some account of a religious society among the Dutch called Meninists, and amongst other things related a passage in substance as follows. One of the Meninists, having acquaintance with a man of another society at a considerable distance, and being with his wagon on business near the house of his said acquaintance, and night coming on, he had thoughts of putting up with him, but passing by his fields, and observing the distressed appearance of his slaves, he kindled a fire in the woods hard by, and lay there that night. His said acquaintance, hearing where he lodged, and afterward meeting the Meninist, told him of it, adding he should have been heartily welcome at his house, 
and from their acquaintance in former time wondered at his conduct in that case. The Meninist replied, Ever since I lodged by thy field I have wanted an opportunity to speak with thee. I had intended to come to thy house for entertainment, but seeing thy slaves at their work, and observing the manner of their dress, I had no liking to come to partake with thee. He then admonished him to use them with more humanity, and added, As I lay by the fire that night, I thought that, as I was a man of substance, thou wouldst have received me freely, but if I had been as poor as one of thy slaves, and had no power to help myself, I should have received from thy hand no kinder usage than they. In this journey I was out about two months, and travelled about eleven hundred and fifty miles. I returned home under an humbling sense of the gracious dealings of the Lord with me, and preserving me through many trials and afflictions. End of chapter 4 Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas Chapter 5 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz. Chapter 5, 1757-1758. Considerations on the payment of a tax laid for carrying on the war against the Indians. Meetings of the Committee of the Yearly Meeting at Philadelphia. Some notes on Thomas A. Kempis and John Huss. The present circumstances of friends in Pennsylvania and New Jersey very different from those of our predecessors. The drafting of the militia in New Jersey to serve in the army, with some observations on the state of the members of our society at that time. Visit to friends in Pennsylvania, accompanied by Benjamin Jones. Proceedings at the monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings in Philadelphia, respecting those who keep slaves. A few years passed money being made current in our province for carrying on wars, and to be called in again by taxes laid on the inhabitants, my mind was often affected with the thoughts of paying such taxes, and I believe it right for me to preserve a memorandum concerning it. I was told that friends in England frequently paid taxes when the money was applied to such purposes. I had conversation with several noted friends on the subject, who all favored the payment of such taxes, some of them I preferred before myself, and this made me easier for a time, yet there was in the depth of my mind a scruple which I never could get over, and at certain times I was greatly distressed on that account. I believe that there were some upright-hearted men who paid such taxes, yet could not see that their example was a sufficient reason for me to do so, while I believe that the spirit of truth required of me as an individual, to suffer patiently the distress of goods rather than pay actively. To refuse the act of payment of a tax which our society generally paid was exceedingly disagreeable, but to do a thing contrary to my conscience appeared yet more dreadful. When this exercise came upon me, I knew of none under the like difficulty, and in my distress I besought the Lord to enable me to give up all, that so I might follow him wheresoever he was pleased to lead me. Under this exercise I went to our yearly meeting at Philadelphia in the year 1755, at which a committee was appointed of some from each quarterly meeting to correspond with the meetings for sufferers in London, and another to visit our monthly and quarterly meetings. After their appointment, before the last adjournment of the meeting, it was agreed that these two committees should meet together in Friends' schoolhouse in the city to consider some things in which the cause of truth was concerned. They accordingly had a weighty conference in the fear of the Lord, at which time I perceived there were many friends under a scruple like that before mentioned. As scrupling to pay a tax on account of the application hath seldom been heard of heretofore, even amongst men of integrity, who have steadily borne their testimony against outward wars in their time, I may therefore note some things which have occurred to my mind, as I have been inwardly exercised on that account. From the steady opposition which faithful friends in early times made to wrong things then approved, they were hated and persecuted by men living in the spirit of this world, and suffering with firmness, they were made a blessing to the church, and the work prospered. 
It equally concerns men in every age to take heed to their own spirits, and comparing their situation with ours, to me it appears that there was less danger of their being infected with the spirit of this world and paying such taxes than is the case with us now. They had little or no share in civil government, and many of them declared that they were, through the power of God, separated from the spirit in which wars were, and being afflicted by the rulers on account of their testimony, there was less likelihood of their uniting in spirit with them in things inconsistent with the purity of truth. We, from the first settlement of this land, have known little or no troubles of that sort. The profession of our predecessors was, for a time, accounted reproachful, but at length their uprightness being understood by the rulers, and their innocent sufferings moving them, our way of worship was tolerated, and many of our members in these colonies became active in civil government. Being thus tried with favor and prosperity, this world appeared inviting. Our minds have been turned to the improvement of our country, to merchandise and the sciences, amongst which are many things useful, if followed in pure wisdom. But in our present condition, I believe it will not be denied that a carnal mind is gaining upon us. Some of our members, who are officers in civil government, are in one case or other called upon in their respective stations to assist in things relative to the wars, but being in doubt whether to act or to crave to be excused from their office, if they see their brethren united in the payment of a tax to carry on the said wars, may think their case not much different, and so might quench the tender movings of the Holy Spirit in their minds. Thus, by small degrees, we might approach so near to fighting that the distinction would be little else than the name of a peaceable people. It requires great self-denial and resignation of ourselves to God to attain that state wherein we can freely cease from fighting when wrongfully invaded, if, by our fighting, there were a probability of overcoming the invaders. Whoever rightly attains to it does in some degree feel that spirit in which our Redeemer gave his life for us, and through divine goodness many of our predecessors, and many now living, have learned this blessed lesson. But many others, having their religion chiefly by education, and not being enough acquainted with that cross which crucifies to the world, do manifest a temper distinguishable from that of an entire trust in God. In calmly considering these things, it hath not appeared strange to me that an exercise hath now fallen upon some, which, with respect to the outward means, is different from what was known to many of those who went before us. Some time after the yearly meeting, the said committees met at Philadelphia, and, by adjournments, continued sitting several days. The calamities of war were now increasing. The frontier inhabitants of Pennsylvania were frequently surprised, some were slain, and many taken captive by the Indians. And while these committees sat, the corpse of one so slain was brought in a wagon, and taken through the streets of the city in his bloody garments, to alarm the people and rouse them to war. Friends thus met were not all of one mind in relation to the tax, which, to those who scrupled it, made the way more difficult. To refuse an act of payment at such a time might be construed into an act of disloyalty, and appeared likely to displease the rulers, not only here but in England, still there was a scruple so fixed on the minds of many friends that nothing moved it. It was a conference the most weighty that ever I was at, and the hearts of many were bowed in reverence before the Most High. Some friends of the said committees, who appeared easy to pay the tax, after several adjournments, withdrew, others of them continued till the last. At length an epistle of tender love and caution to friends in Pennsylvania was drawn up, and being read several times and corrected, was signed by such as were free to sign it, and afterward sent to the monthly and quarterly meetings. Ninth of eighth month, 1757. Orders came at night to the military officers in our county, Burlington, directing them to draft the militia and prepare a number of men to go off as soldiers to the relief of the English at Fort William Henry in New York government a few days after which there was a general review of the militia at Mount Holly, 
and a number of men were chosen and sent off under some officers. Shortly after, there came orders to draft three times as many, who were to hold themselves in readiness to march when fresh orders came. On the 17th, there was a meeting of the military officers at Mount Holly, who agreed on draft. Orders were sent to the men so chosen to meet their respective captains at set times and places, those in our township to meet at Mount Holly, amongst whom were a considerable number of our society. My mind being affected herewith, I had fresh opportunity to see and consider the advantage of living in the real substance of religion, where practice doth harmonize with principle. Amongst the officers are men of understanding, who have some regard to sincerity where they see it, and when such in the execution of their office have men to deal with whom they believe to be upright-hearted, it is a painful task to put them to trouble on account of scruples of conscience, and they will be likely to avoid it as much as easily may be. But where men profess to be so meek and heavenly-minded, and to have their trust so firmly settled in God that they cannot join in wars, and yet by their spirit and conduct in common life manifest a contrary disposition, their difficulties are great at such a time. When officers who are anxiously endeavoring to get troops to answer the demands of their superiors see men who are insincere pretend scruple of conscience in hopes of being excused from a dangerous employment, it is likely they will be roughly handled. In this time of commotion, some of our young men left these parts and tarried abroad till it was over. Some came and proposed to go as soldiers. Others appeared to have a real tender scruple in their minds against joining in wars, and were much humbled under the apprehension of a trial so near. I had a conversation with several of them to my satisfaction. When the captain came to town, some of the last mentioned went and told him in substance as follows, that they could not bear arms for conscience' sake, nor could they hire any to go in their places, being resigned as to the event. At length the captain acquainted them all that they might return home for the present, but he required them to provide themselves as soldiers, and be in readiness to march when called upon. This was such a time as I had not seen before, and yet I may say, with thankfulness to the Lord, that I believe the trial was intended for our good, and I was favored with resignation to him. The French army, having taken the fort they were besieging, destroyed it and went away. The company of men who were first drafted, after some days' march, had orders to return home, and those on the second draft were no more called upon on that occasion. Fourth of Fourth Month, 1758 Orders came to some officers in Mount Holly to prepare quarters for a short time for about one hundred soldiers. An officer and two other men, all inhabitants of our town, came to my house. The officer told me that he came to desire me to provide lodging and entertainment for two soldiers, and that six shillings a week per man would be allowed as pay for it. The case being new and unexpected, I made no answer suddenly, but sat a time silent, my mind being inward. I was fully convinced that the proceedings and wars are inconsistent with the purity of the Christian religion, and to be hired to entertain men, who were then under to pay as soldiers, was a difficulty with me. I expected they had legal authority for what they did, and after a short time I said to the officer, If the men are sent here for entertainment, I believe I shall not refuse to admit them into my house, but the nature of the case is such that I expect I cannot keep them on hire. One of the men intimated that he thought I might do it consistently with my religious principles, to which I made no reply, believing silence at that time best for me. Though they spake of two, there came only one, who tarried at my house about two weeks, and behaved himself civilly. When the officer came to pay me, I told him I could not take pay, having admitted him into my house in a passive obedience to authority. I was on horseback when he spake to me, and as I turned from him, he said he was obliged to me, to which I said nothing, but, thinking on the expression, I grew uneasy, and afterwards, being near where he lived, I went and told him on what grounds I refused taking pay for keeping the soldier. 
I have been informed that Thomas A. Kempis lived and died in the profession of the Roman Catholic religion, and, in reading his writings, I have believed him to be a man of a true Christian spirit, as fully so as many who died martyrs, because they could not join with some superstitions in that church. All true Christians are of the same spirit, but their gifts are diverse. Jesus Christ, appointing to each one his peculiar office, agreeably to his infinite wisdom. John Huss contended against the errors which had crept into the church in opposition to the Council of Constance, which the historian reports to have consisted of some thousand persons. He modestly vindicated the cause which he believed was right, and though his language and conduct towards his judges appeared to have been respectful, yet he never could be moved from the principle settled in his mind. To use his own words, This I most humbly require and desire of you all, even for his sake, who is the God of us all, that I be not compelled to the thing which my conscience doth repugn or strive against. And again, in his answer to the emperor, I refuse nothing, most noble emperor, whatsoever the council shall decree or determine upon me, only this one thing I accept, that I do not offend God and my conscience. At length, rather than act contrary to that which he believed the Lord required of him, he chose to suffer death by fire. Thomas A. Kempis, without disputing against the articles then generally agreed to, appears to have labored, by a pious example, as well as by preaching and writing, to promote virtue and the inward spiritual religion, and I believe they were both sincere-hearted followers of Christ. True charity is an excellent virtue, and sincerely to labor for their good, whose belief in all points doth not agree with ours, is a happy state. Near the beginning of the year 1758, I went one evening, in company with a friend, to visit a sick person, and before our return we were told of a woman living near, who had for several days been disconsolate, occasioned by a dream, wherein death, and the judgments of the Almighty after death, were represented to her mind in a moving manner. Her sadness on that account being worn off, the friend with whom I was in company went to see her, and had some religious conversation with her and her husband. With this visit they were somewhat affected, and the man, with many tears, expressed his satisfaction. In a short time, after the poor man, being on the river in a storm of wind, was with one more drowned. Eighth month, 1758. Having had drawings in my mind to be at the quarterly meeting in Chester County, and at some meetings in the county of Philadelphia, I went first to said quarterly meeting, which was large. Several weighty matters came under consideration and debate, and the Lord was pleased to qualify some of his servants with strength and firmness to bear the burden of the day. Though I said but little, my mind was deeply exercised, and, under a sense of God's love, and the anointing and fitting of some young men for his work, I was comforted, and my heart was tendered before him. From hence I went to the youth's meeting at Darby, where my beloved friend and brother Benjamin Jones met me by appointment before I left home to join in the visit. We were at Radnor, Marion, Richland, North Wales, Plymouth, and Abington meetings, and had caused to bow in reverence before the Lord, our gracious God, by whose help way was open for us from day to day. I was out about two weeks, and rode about two hundred miles. The monthly meeting of Philadelphia, having been under a concern on account of some friends who this summer, 1758, had bought Negro slaves, proposed to their quarterly meeting to have the minute reconsidered in the yearly meeting, which was made last on that subject, and the said quarterly meeting appointed a committee to consider it, and to report to their next. This committee, having met once and adjourned, and I, going to Philadelphia to meet a committee of the yearly meeting, was in town the evening on which the quarterly meeting's committee met the second time, and finding an inclination to sit with them, I, with some others, was admitted, and friends had a weighty conference on the subject. Soon after their next quarterly meeting, I heard that the case was coming to our yearly meeting. 
This brought a weighty exercise upon me, and under a sense of my own infirmities, and the great danger I felt of turning aside from perfect purity, my mind was often drawn to retire alone, and put up my prayers to the Lord that he would be graciously pleased to strengthen me, that setting aside all views of self-interest and the friendship of this world, I might stand fully resigned to his holy will. In this yearly meeting several weighty matters were considered, and toward the last that in relation to dealing with persons who purchased slaves. During the several sittings of the said meeting, my mind was frequently covered with inward prayer, and I could say with David that tears were my meat day and night. The case of slave-keeping lay heavy upon me, nor did I find any engagement to speak directly to any other matter before the meeting. Now when this case was opened, several faithful friends spake weightily thereto, with which I was comforted, and feeling a concern to cast in my might, I said in substance as follows. In the difficulties attending us in this life, nothing is more precious than the mind of truth inwardly manifested, and it is my earnest desire that in this weighty manner we may be so truly humbled as to be favored with a clear understanding of the mind of truth and follow it. This would be of more advantage to the society than any medium not in the clearness of divine wisdom. The case is difficult to some who have slaves, but if such set aside all self-interest, and come to be weaned from the desire of getting estates, or even from holding them together, when truth requires the contrary, I believe way will so open that they will know how to steer through those difficulties. Many friends appeared to be deeply bowed under the weight of the work, and manifested much firmness in their love to the cause of truth and universal righteousness on the earth. And though none did openly justify the practice of slave-keeping in general, yet some appeared concerned lest the meeting should go into such measures as might give uneasiness to many brethren, alleging that, if friends patiently continued under the exercise, the Lord in his time might open a way for the deliverance of these people. Finding an engagement to speak, I said, My mind is often led to consider the purity of the divine being, and the justice of his judgments, and herein my soul is covered with awfulness. I cannot omit to hint of some cases where people have not been treated with the purity of justice, and the event hath been lamentable. Many slaves on this continent are oppressed, and their cries have reached the ears of the Most High. Such are the purity and certainty of his judgments, that he cannot be partial in our favor. In infinite love and goodness he hath opened our understanding from one time to another concerning our duty towards this people, and it is not a time for delay. Should we now be sensible of what he requires of us, and through a respect to the private interest of some persons, or through a regard to some friendships which do not stand on an immutable foundation, neglect to do our duty in firmness and constancy, still waiting for some extraordinary means to bring about their deliverance, God may by terrible things in righteousness answer us in this matter. Many faithful brethren labored with great firmness, and the love of truth in a good degree prevailed. Several who had Negroes expressed their desire that a rule might be made to deal with such friends as offenders who bought slaves in the future. To this it was answered that the root of this evil would never be effectually struck at until a thorough search was made in the circumstances of such friends as kept Negroes, with respect to the righteousness of their motives in keeping them. That impartial justice might be administered throughout. Several friends expressed their desire that a visit might be made to such friends as kept slaves, and many others said that they believed liberty was the Negro's right, to which, at length, no opposition was publicly made. A minute was made more full on that subject than any heretofore, and the names of several friends entered who were free to join in a visit to such as kept slaves. End of chapter 5. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 6 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz. Chapter 6, 1758, 
1759. Visit to the quarterly meetings in Chester County. Joins Daniel Stanton and John Scarborough in a visit to such as kept slaves there. Some observations on the conduct which those should maintain who speak in meetings for discipline. More visits to such as kept slaves and to friends near Salem. Account of the yearly meeting in the year 1759 and of the increase in concern in divers provinces to labor against buying and keeping slaves. The yearly meeting epistle, thoughts on the smallpox spreading, and on inoculation. 11th of 11th month, 1758. This day I set out for Concord. The quarterly meeting heretofore held there was now, by reason of a great increase of members, divided into two by the agreement of friends at our last yearly meeting. Here I met with our beloved friends Samuel Spavold and Mary Kirby from England, and with Joseph White from Bucks County. The latter had taken leave of his family in order to go on a religious visit to friends in England, and, through divine goodness, we were favored with a strengthening opportunity together. After this meeting, I joined with my friends, Daniel Stanton and John Scarborough, in visiting friends who had slaves. At night, we had a family meeting at William Trimble's, many young people being there, and it was a precious, reviving opportunity. Next morning, we had a comfortable sitting with a sick neighbor, and thence to the burial of the corpse of a friend at Uchland meeting, at which were many people, and it was a time of divine favor, after which we visited some who had slaves. In the evening, we had a family meeting at a friend's house, where the channel of the gospel love was opened, and my mind was comforted after a hard day's labor. The next day we were at Goshen monthly meeting, and on the 18th attended the quarterly meeting at London Grove, it being first held at that place. Here we met again with all the before-mentioned friends, and had some edifying meetings. Near the conclusion of the meeting for business, friends were incited to constancy in supporting the testimony of truth, and reminded of the necessity which the disciples of Christ are under to attend principally to his business as he is pleased to open it to us, and to be particularly careful to have our minds redeemed from the love of wealth, and our outward affairs in as little room as may be, that no temporal concerns may entangle our affections or hinder us from diligently following the dictates of truth and laboring to promote the pure spirit of meekness and heavenly mindedness amongst the children of men in these days of calamity and distress, wherein God is visiting our land with his just judgments. Each of these quarterly meetings was large and sat near eight hours. I had occasion to consider that it is a weighty thing to speak much in large meetings for business, for except our minds are rightly prepared, and we clearly understand the case we speak to, instead of forwarding, we hinder business, and make more labor for those on whom the burden of the work is laid. If selfish views or a partial spirit have any room in our minds, we are unfit for the Lord's work. If we have a clear prospect of the business, and proper weight on our minds to speak, we should avoid useless apologies and repetitions. Where people are gathered from far, and adjourning a meeting of business is attended with great difficulty, it behooves all to be cautious how they detain a meeting, especially when they have sat six or seven hours, and have a great distance to ride home. After this meeting, I rode home. In the beginning of the twelfth month I joined, in company with my friends John Sykes and Daniel Staunton, in visiting such as had slaves. Some whose hearts were rightly exercised about them appeared to be glad of our visit, but in some places our way was more difficult. I often saw the necessity of keeping down to that route from whence our concern proceeded, and have cause, in reverent thankfulness, humbly to bow down before the Lord, who was near to me and preserve my mind and calmness under some sharp conflicts, and begat a spirit of sympathy and tenderness in me towards some who were grievously entangled by the spirit of this world. First month, 1759. Having found my mind drawn to visit some of the more active members in our society at Philadelphia who had slaves, I met my friend John Churchman there by agreement, and we continued about a week in the city. We visited some that were sick, 
and some widows and their families, and the other part of our time was mostly employed in visiting such as had slaves. It was a time of deep exercise, but looking often to the Lord for his assistance, he in unspeakable kindness favored us with the influence of that spirit which crucifies to the greatness and splendor of this world, and enabling us to go through some heavy labors in which we found peace. 24th of 3rd month, 1759. After attending our general spring meeting at Philadelphia, I again joined with John Churchman on a visit to some who had slaves in Philadelphia, and with thankfulness to our Heavenly Father, I may say that divine love and a true sympathizing tenderness of heart prevailed at times in this service. Having at times perceived a shyness in some friends of considerable note towards me, I found an engagement in gospel love to pay a visit to one of them, and as I dwelt under the exercise, I felt a resignedness in my mind to go and tell him privately that I had a desire to have an opportunity with him alone. To this proposal he readily agreed, and then, in the fear of the Lord, things relating to that shyness were searched to the bottom, and we had a large conference, which I believe was of use to both of us, and I am thankful that way was open for it. Fourteenth of six month. Having felt drawings in my mind to visit friends about Salem, and having the approbation of our monthly meeting, I attended their quarterly meeting, and was out seven days, and attended seven meetings. In some of them I was chiefly silent, and others, through the baptizing power of truth, my heart was enlarged in heavenly love, and I found a near fellowship with the brethren and sisters in the manifold trials attending their Christian progress through this world. Seventh month, I have found an increasing concern on my mind to visit some active members in our society who have slaves, and having no opportunity of the company of such as were named in the minutes of the yearly meeting, I went alone to their houses, and, in the fear of the Lord, acquainted them with the exercise I was under. And, thus, sometimes by a few words, I found myself discharged from a heavy burden. After this, our friend John Churchman, coming into our province with a view to be at some meetings, and to join again in the visit to those who had slaves, I bore him company in the said visit to some active members, and found inward satisfaction. At our yearly meeting this year, we had some weighty seasons, in which the power of truth was largely extended to the strengthening of the honest-minded. As the epistles which were to be sent to the yearly meetings on this continent were read, I observed that in most of them, both this year and the last, it was recommended to friends to labor against buying and keeping slaves, and in some of them the subject was closely treated upon. As this practice hath long been a heavy exercise to me, and I have often waited through mortifying labors on that account, and at times in some meetings have been almost alone therein, I was humbly bowed in thankfulness in observing the increase in concern in our religious society, and seeing how the Lord was raising up and qualifying servants for his work, not only in this respect, but for promoting the cause of truth in general. This meeting continued near a week. For several days, in the fore part of it, my mind was drawn into a deep inward stillness, and being at times covered with a spirit of supplication, my heart was secretly poured out before the Lord. Near the conclusion of the meeting from business, a way opened in the pure flowings of divine love for me to express what lay upon me, which, as it then arose in my mind, was first to show how deep answers to deep in the hearts of the sincere and upright, though, in their different growths, they may not all have attained to the same clearness in some points relating to our testimony. And I was then led to mention the integrity and constancy of many martyrs who gave their lives for the testimony of Jesus, and yet, in some points, they held doctrines distinguishable from some which we hold, that, in all ages, where people were faithful to the light and understanding which the Most High afforded them, they found acceptance with him. And though there may be different ways of thinking amongst us in some particulars, Yet, if we mutually keep to that spirit and power which crucifies to the world, which teaches us to be content with things really needful, and to avoid all superfluities, and give up our hearts to fear and serve the Lord, true unity may still be preserved amongst us, 
that if those who were at times under sufferings on account of some scruples of conscience kept low and humble, and in their conduct and life manifested a spirit of true charity, it would be more likely to reach the witness in others, and be of more service in the church, than if their sufferings were attended with a contrary spirit and conduct. In this exercise I was drawn into a sympathizing tenderness with the sheep of Christ, however distinguished one from another in this world, and the like disposition appeared to spread over others in the meeting. Great is the goodness of the Lord towards his poor creatures. An epistle went forth from this yearly meeting, which I think good to give a place in this journal. It is as follows. From the yearly meeting held at Philadelphia, for Pennsylvania and New Jersey, from the 22nd day of the ninth month to the 28th of the same, inclusive 1759, to the quarterly and monthly meetings of friends belonging to the said yearly meeting. Dearly beloved friends and brethren, in an awful sense of the wisdom and goodness of the Lord our God, whose tender mercies have been continued to us in this land, we affectionately salute you, with sincere and fervent desires that we may reverently regard the dispensations of his providence and improve under them. The empires and kingdoms of the earth are subject to his almighty power. He is the God of the spirits of all flesh, and deals with his people agreeable to that wisdom, the depth whereof is to us unsearchable. We in these provinces may say, He hath, as a gracious and tender parent, dealt bountifully with us, even from the days of our fathers. It was he who strengthened them to labor through the difficulties attending the improvement of a wilderness, and made way for them in the hearts of the natives, so that by them they were comforted in times of want and distress. It was by the gracious influences of his Holy Spirit that they were disposed to work righteousness and walk uprightly towards each other and towards the natives in life and conversation to manifest the excellency of the principles and doctrines of the Christian religion whereby they retain their esteem and friendship. Whilst they were laboring for the necessaries of life, many of them were fervently engaged to promote piety and virtue in the earth and to educate their children in the fear of the Lord. If we carefully consider the peaceable measures pursued in the first settlement of land, and that freedom from the desolations of wars which for a long time we enjoyed, we shall find ourselves under strong obligations to the Almighty, who, when the earth is so generally polluted with wickedness, gives us a being and a part so signally favored with tranquility and plenty, and in which the glad tidings of the gospel of Christ are so freely published, that we may justly say with the psalmist, What shall we render unto the Lord for all his benefits? Our own real good, and the good of our posterity, in some measure, depends on the part we act, and it nearly concerns us to try our foundations impartially. Such are the different rewards of the just and unjust in a future state, that to attend diligently to the dictates of the Spirit of Christ, to devote ourselves to his service, and to engage fervently in his cause during our short stay in this world is a choice well becoming a free, intelligent creature. We shall thus clearly see and consider that the dealings of God with mankind in a national capacity, as recorded in Holy Writ, do sufficiently evidence the truth of that saying, It is righteousness which exalteth a nation. And though he doth not at all times suddenly execute his judgments on a sinful people in this life, yet we see in many instances that when men follow lying vanities they forsake their own mercies. And as a proud, selfish spirit prevails and spreads among a people, so partial judgment, oppression, discord, envy, and confusions increase, and provinces and kingdoms are made to drink the cup of adversity as a reward of their own doings. Thus the inspired prophet, reasoning with the degenerated Jews, saith, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know, therefore, that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 2.19 the God of our fathers, who hath bestowed on us many benefits, furnished a table for us in the wilderness, and made the deserts and solitary places to rejoice. 
he doth now mercifully call upon us to serve him more faithfully, we may truly say with the prophet, It is his voice which crieth to the city, and men of wisdom see his name. They regard the rod, and him who hath appointed it. People who look chiefly at things outward too little consider the original cause of the present troubles. But they who fear the Lord, and think often upon his name, see and feel that a wrong spirit is spreading amongst the inhabitants of our country, that the hearts of many are waxed fat, and their ears dull of hearing, that the Most High, in his visitations to us, instead of calling, lifteth up his voice, and crieth, he crieth to our country, and his voice waxeth louder and louder. In former wars between the English and other nations, since the settlement of our provinces, the calamities attending them have fallen chiefly on other places, but now of late they have reached to our borders. Many of our fellow subjects have suffered on and near our frontiers. Some have been slain in battle, some killed in their houses, and some in their fields, some wounded and left in great misery, and others separated from their wives and little children, who have been carried captives among the Indians. We have seen men and women who have been witnesses of these scenes of sorrow, and, being reduced to want, have come to our houses asking relief. It is not long since that many young men in one of these provinces were drafted, in order to be taken as soldiers. Some were at that time in great distress, and had occasion to consider that their lives had been too little conformable to the purity and spirituality of that religion which we profess, and found themselves too little acquainted with that inward humility in which true fortitude to endure hardness for the truth's sake is experienced. Many parents were concerned for their children, and in that time of trial were led to consider that their care to get outward treasure for them had been greater than their care for their settlement in that religion which crucifieth to the world, and enableth to bear testimony to the peaceable government of the Messiah. These troubles are removed, and for a time we are released from them. Let us not forget that the Most High hath his way in the deep, in clouds, and in thick darkness, that it is his voice which crieth to the city and to the country, and oh, that these loud and awakening cries may have a proper effect upon us, that heavier chastisement may not become necessary, for those things, as to the outward, may for a short time afford a pleasing prospect, yet, while a selfish spirit, that is not subject to the cross of Christ, continueth to spread and prevail, there can be no long continuance in outward peace and tranquility. If we desire an inheritance incorruptible, and to be at rest in that state of peace and happiness which ever continues, if we desire in this life to dwell under the favor and protection of that Almighty Being, whose habitation is in holiness, whose ways are all equal, and whose anger is now kindled because of our backslidings, let us then awfully regard these beginnings of his sore judgments, and with abasement and humiliation turn to him whom we have offended. Contending with one equal in strength is an uneasy exercise, but if the Lord has become our enemy, if we persist in contending with him who is omnipotent, our overthrow will be unavoidable. Do we feel an affectionate regard to posterity? And are we employed to promote their happiness? Do our minds, and things outward, look beyond our own dissolution? And are we contriving for the prosperity of our children after us? Let us then, like wise builders, lay the foundation deep, and by our constant uniform regard to an inward piety, and virtue, let them see that we really value it. Let us labor in the fear of the Lord, that their innocent minds, while young and tender, may be preserved from corruptions, that as they advance in age they may rightly understand their true interest, may consider the uncertainty of temporal things, and, above all, have their hope and confidence firmly settled in the blessings of that Almighty Being, who inhabits eternity and preserves and supports the world. In all our cares about worldly treasures, let us steadily bear in mind that riches possessed by children who do not truly serve God are likely to prove snares that may more grievously entangle them in that spirit of selfishness and exaltation which stands in opposition to real peace and happiness. 
and renders those who submit to the influence of it enemies to the cross of Christ. To keep a watchful eye towards real objects of charity, to visit the poor in their lonesome dwelling places, to comfort those who, through the dispensations of divine providence, are in straight and painful circumstances in this life, and steadily to endeavor to honor God with our substance, from a real sense of the love of Christ influencing our minds, is more likely to bring a blessing to our children, and will afford more satisfaction to a Christian favored with plenty than an earnest desire to collect much wealth to leave behind us. For here we have no continuing city. May we therefore diligently seek one that is to come, whose builder and maker is God. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things and do them, and the God of peace shall be with you. Signed by appointment, and on behalf of said meeting. 28th, 11th month. This day I attended the quarterly meeting in Bucks County. In the meeting of ministers and elders my heart was enlarged in the love of Jesus Christ, and the favor of the Most High was extended to us in that and the ensuing meeting. I had conversation at my lodging with my beloved friend, Samuel Eastburn, who expressed a concern to join in a visit to some friends in that county who had Negroes, and as I felt a drawing in my mind to the said work, I came home and put things in order. On 11th of 12th month, I went over the river, and on the next day was at Buckingham meeting, where, through the descendings of heavenly dew, my mind was comforted and drawn into a near unity with the flock of Jesus Christ. Entering upon this business appeared weighty, and before I left home my mind was often sad, under which exercise I felt at times the Holy Spirit, which helps our infirmities, and through which my prayers were at times put up to God in private, that he would be pleased to purge me from all selfishness, that I might be strengthened to discharge my duty faithfully, how hard soever to the natural part. We proceeded on the visit in a weighty frame of spirit, and went to the houses of the most active members who had Negroes throughout the county. Through the goodness of the Lord my mind was preserved in resignation in times of trial, and though the work was hard to nature, yet through the strength of that love which is stronger than death, tenderness of heart was often felt amongst us in our visits, and we parted from several families with greater satisfaction than we expected. We visited Joseph White's family, he being in England. We had also a family sitting at the house of an elder who bore us company, and were at Makefield on a first day, at all which times my heart was truly thankful to the Lord, who was graciously pleased to renew his loving kindness to us, his poor servants, uniting us together in his work. In the winter of this year, the smallpox being in our town, and many being inoculated, of whom a few died, some things were opened in my mind, which I wrote as follows. The more fully our lives are conformable to the will of God, the better it is for us. I have looked on the smallpox as a messenger from the Almighty, to be an assistant in the cause of virtue, and to incite us to consider whether we employ our time only in such things as are consistent with perfect wisdom and goodness, building houses suitable to dwell in, for ourselves and our creatures, preparing clothing suitable for the climate and season, and food convenient, are all duties incumbent on us. And under these general heads are many branches of business in which we may venture health and life, as necessity may require. This disease being in a house, and my business calling me to go near it, incites me to consider whether this is a real indispensable duty, whether it is not in conformity to some custom which would be better laid aside, or whether it does not proceed from too eager a pursuit after some outward treasure. If the business before me springs not from a clear understanding, and a regard to that use of things which perfect wisdom approves, to be brought to a sense of it, and stopped in my pursuit is a kindness, for when I proceed to business without some evidence of duty, I have found by experience that it tends to weakness. 
If I am so situated that there appears no probability of missing the infection, it tends to make me think whether my manner of life and things outward has nothing in it which may unfit my body to receive this messenger in a way the most favorable to me. Do I use food and drink in no other sort and in no other degree than was designed by him who gave these creatures for our sustenance? Do I never abuse my body by inordinate labor, striving to accomplish some end which I have unwisely proposed? Do I use action enough in some useful employ, or do I sit too much idle while some persons who labor to support me have too great a share of it? If, in any of these things, I am deficient, to be incited to consider it as a favor to me. Employment is necessary in social life, and this infection, which often proves mortal, incites me to think whether these social acts of mine are real duties. If I go on a visit to the widows and fatherless, do I go purely on a principle of charity, free from any selfish views? If I go to a religious meeting, it puts me on thinking whether I go in sincerity and in a clear sense of duty, or whether it is not partly in conformity to custom, or partly from a sensible delight which my animal spirits feel in the company of other people, and whether to support my reputation as a religious man has no share in it. Do affairs relating to civil society call me near this infection? If I go, it is at the hazard of my health and life, and it becomes me to think seriously whether love to truth and righteousness is the motive of my attending, whether the manner of proceeding is altogether equitable, or whether aught of narrowness, party interest, respect to outward dignities, names, or distinctions among men do not stain the beauty of those assemblies, and render it doubtful, in point of duty, whether a disciple of Christ ought to attend as a member united to the body or not. Whenever there are blemishes which for a series of time remain such, that which is a means of stirring us up to look attentively on these blemishes, and to labor according to our capacities, to have health and soundness restored in our country, we may justly account a kindness from our gracious Father, who appointed that means. The care of a wise and good man for his only son is inferior to the regard of the great parent of the universe for his creatures. He hath the command of all the powers and operations in nature, and doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Chastisement is intended for instruction, and instruction being received by gentle chastisement, greater calamities are prevented. By an earthquake, hundreds of houses are sometimes shaken down in a few minutes, multitudes of people perish suddenly, and many more, being crushed and bruised in the ruins of the buildings, pine away and die in great misery. By the breaking in of enraged merciless armies, flourishing countries have been laid waste, great numbers of people have perished in a short time, and many more have been pressed with poverty and grief. By the pestilence, people have died so fast in a city that, through fear, grief, and confusion, those in health have found great difficulty in burying the dead, even without coffins. By famine, great numbers of people in some places have been brought to the utmost distress, and have pined away from want of the necessaries of life. Thus, when the kind invitations and gentle chastisements of a gracious God have not been attended to, his sore judgments have at times been poured out upon people. While some rules approved in civil society and conformable to human policy, so-called, are distinguishable from the purity of truth and righteousness, while many professing the truth are declining from that ardent love and heavenly mindedness which was amongst the primitive followers of Jesus Christ, it is time for us to attend diligently to the intent of every chastisement, and to consider the most deep and inward design of them. The Most High doth not often speak with an outward voice to our outward ears, but if we humbly meditate on his perfections, consider that he is perfect wisdom and goodness, and that to afflict his creatures to no purpose would be utterly averse to his nature, we shall hear and understand his language both in his gentle and more heavy chastisements, and shall take heed that we do not, in the wisdom of this world, endeavor to escape his hand by means too powerful for us. 
Had he endowed men with understanding to prevent this disease, the smallpox, by means which had never proved hurtful nor mortal, such a discovery might be considered as the period of chastisement by this distemper where that knowledge extended. But as life and health are his gifts, and are not to be disposed of in our own wills, to take upon us by inoculation, when in health a disorder of which some die, requires great clearness of knowledge that it is our duty to do so. End of chapter 6. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 7 of the Journal of John Woolman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. Chapter 7. 1760. Visit. In company with Samuel Eastburn to Long Island, Rhode Island, Boston, etc. Remarks on the slave trade at Newport, also on lotteries, some observations on the island of Nantucket. Fourth month, 1760. Having for some time past felt a sympathy in my mind with friends eastward, I opened my concern in our monthly meeting, and, obtaining a certificate, set forward on the 17th of this month in company with my beloved friend Samuel Eastburn. We had meetings at Woodbridge, Rahway, and Plainfield, and were at their monthly meeting of ministers and elders in Rahway. We labored under some discouragement, but through the invisible power of truth our visit was made reviving to the lowly-minded, with whom I felt a near unity of spirit being much reduced in my mind. We passed on and visited most of the meetings on Long Island. It was my concern from day to day to say neither more nor less than what the spirit of truth opened in me being jealous over myself, lest I should say anything to make my testimony look agreeable to that mind in people which is not in pure obedience to the cross of Christ. The spring of the ministry was often low, and through the subjecting power of truth we were kept low with it. From place to place they whose hearts were truly concerned for the cause of Christ appeared to be comforted in our labors, and though it was in general a time of abasement of the creature, yet through his goodness, who was a helper of the poor, we had some truly edifying seasons, both in meetings and in families where we tarried. Sometimes we found strength to labor earnestly with the unfaithful, especially with those whose station in families or in the society was such that their example had a powerful tendency to open the way for others to go aside from the purity and soundness of the blessed truth. At Jericho, on Long Island, I wrote home as follows. 24th of the 4th month, 1760. Dearly beloved wife, we are favored with health, have been at sundry meetings in East Jersey and on this island. My mind hath been much in an inward, watchful frame since I left thee, greatly desiring that our proceedings may be singly in the will of our Heavenly Father. As the present appearance of things is not joyous, I have been much shut up from outward cheerfulness, remembering that promise, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. As this, from day to day, has been revived in my memory, 
I have considered that his internal presence in our minds is the delight of all others the most pure, and that the honest-hearted not only delight in this, but in the effect of it upon them. He regards the helpless and distressed, and reveals his love to his children under affliction, who delight in beholding his benevolence, and in feeling divine charity moving in them. Of this I may speak a little, for though since I left you I have often an engaging love and affection towards thee and my daughter, and friends about home, and going out at this time, when sickness is so great amongst you, is a trial upon me. Yet I often remember there are many widows and fatherless, many who have poor tutors, many who have evil examples before them, and many whose minds are in captivity, for whose sake my heart is at times moved with compassion, so that I feel my mind resigned to leave you for a season, to exercise that gift which the Lord hath bestowed on me, which, though small compared with some, yet in this I rejoice, that I feel love unfeigned towards my fellow creatures. I recommend you to the Almighty, who I trust cares for you, and under a sense of his heavenly love remain, thy loving husband, J. W., we crossed from east end of Long Island to New London, about thirty miles in a large open boat. While we were out, the wind rising high, the waves several times beat over us, so that to me it appeared dangerous. But my mind was at that time turned to him who made and governs the deep, and my life was resigned to him as he was mercifully pleased to preserve us i had fresh occasion to consider every day as a day lent to me and felt a renewed engagement to devote my time and all i had to him who gave it we had five meetings in narragansett and went thence to newport on rhode island our gracious father preserved us in an humble dependence on him through deep exercises that were mortifying to the creaturely will in several families in the country where we lodged i felt an engagement on my mind to have a conference with them in private concerning their slaves and through divine aid i was favored to give up thereto though in this concern i differ from many whose service in travelling is i believe greater than mine yet i do not think hardly of them for omitting it i do not repine at having so unpleasant a task assigned me but look with awfulness to him who appoints to his servants their respective employments and is good to all who serve him sincerely we got to newport in the evening and on the next day visited two sick persons with whom we had comfortable sittings and in the afternoon attended the burial of a friend the next day we were at meetings at newport in the forenoon and afternoon the spring of the ministry was opened and strength was given to declare the word of life to the people the day following we went on our journey but the great number of slaves in these parts and the continuance of that trade from thence to guinea made a deep impression on me and my cries were often put up to my heavenly father in secret that he would enable me to discharge my duty faithfully in such a way as he might be pleased to point out to me we took Swansea, Freetown, and Taunton in our way to Boston, where also we had a meeting. Our exercise was deep, and the love of truth prevailed, for which I blessed the Lord. We went eastward about eighty miles beyond Boston, taking meetings, 
and were in a good degree preserved in an humble dependence on that arm which drew us out. And though we had some hard labor with the disobedient, by laying things home and close to such as were stout against the truth, yet through the goodness of God we had at times to partake of heavenly comfort with those who were meek, and were often favored to part with friends in the nearness of true gospel fellowship. We returned to Boston and had another comfortable opportunity with friends there, and thence rode back a day's journey eastward of Boston. Our guide being a heavy man, and the weather hot, my companion and I expressed our freedom to go on without him, to which he consented, and we respectfully took our leave of him. This we did as believing the journey would have been hard to him and his horse. In visiting the meetings in those parts, we were measurably baptized into a feeling of the state of the society, and in bowedness of spirit went to the yearly meeting at Newport, where we met with John Storer from England, Elizabeth Shipley, Anne Gaunt, Hannah Foster, and Mercy Redman, from our parts, all ministers of the gospel, of whose company I was glad. Understanding that a large number of slaves had been imported from Africa into that town, and were then on sale by a member of our society, my appetite failed, and I grew outwardly weak, and had a feeling of the condition of Habakkuk, as thus expressed, Quote, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered, I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. End quote. I had many cogitations and was sorely distressed. I was desirous that friends might petition the legislature to use their endeavors to discourage the future importation of slaves for i saw that this trade was a great evil and tended to multiply troubles and to bring distresses on the people for whose welfare my heart was deeply concerned but i perceived several difficulties in regard to petitioning and such was the exercise of my mind that i thought of endeavoring to get an opportunity to speak a few words in the house of assembly then sitting in town. This exercise came upon me in the afternoon on the second day of the yearly meeting, and on going to bed I got no sleep till my mind was wholly resigned thereto. In the morning I inquired of a friend how long the assembly was likely to continue sitting, who told me it was expected to be prorogued that day or the next as i was desirous to attend the business of the meeting and perceive the assembly was likely to separate before the business was over after considerable exercise humbly seeking to the lord for instruction my mind settled to attend on the business of the meeting on the last day of which i had prepared a short essay of a petition to be presented to the legislature if way opened and being informed that there were some appointed by that yearly meeting to speak with those in authority on cases relating to the society i opened my mind to several of them and showed them the essay i had made and afterwards i opened the case in the meeting for business in substance as follows Quote, I have been under a concern for some time on account of the great number of slaves which are imported into this colony. I am aware that it is a tender point to speak to, but apprehend I am not clear in the sight of heaven without doing so. I have prepared an essay of a petition to be presented to the legislature, if way open and what i have to propose to this meeting is that some friends may be named to withdraw and look over it 
and report whether they believe it is suitable to be read in the meeting. If they should think well of reading it, it will remain for the meeting to consider whether to take any further notice of it as a meeting or not. End quote. After a short conference, some friends went out and, looking over it, expressed their willingness to have it read, which being done, many expressed their unity with the proposal and some signified that to have the subjects of the petition enlarged upon and signed out of the meeting by such as were free would be more suitable than to do it there though i expected at first that if it was done it would be in that way yet such was the exercise of my mind that to move it in the hearing of friends when assembled appeared to me as a duty for my heart yearned towards the inhabitants of these parts, believing that by this trade there had been an increase of inquietude amongst them, and way had been made for the spreading of a spirit opposite to that meekness and humility which is a sure resting place for the soul, and that the continuance of this trade would not only render their healing more difficult, but would increase their malady. Having proceeded thus far, I felt easy to leave the essay amongst friends, for them to proceed in it as they believed best. And now an exercise revived in my mind in relation to lotteries, which were common in those parts. I had mentioned the subject in a former sitting of this meeting, when arguments were used in favor of friends being held excused who were only concerned in such lotteries as were agreeable to law. And now, on moving it again, it was opposed as before, but the hearts of some friends appeared to be united to discourage the practice amongst their members, and the matter was zealously handled by some on both sides. In this debate, it appeared very clear to me that the spirit of lotteries was a spirit of selfishness, which tended to confuse and darken the understanding, and that pleading for it in our meetings, which were set apart for the Lord's work, was not right. In the heat of zeal, I made reply to what an ancient friend said, and when I sat down, I saw that my words were not enough seasoned with charity. After this, I spoke no more on the subject. At length, a minute was made, a copy of which was to be sent to their several quarterly meetings, inciting friends to labor to discourage the practice amongst all professing with us. Some time after this minute was made, I remained uneasy with the manner of my speaking to the ancient friend, and could not see my way clear to conceal my uneasiness, though I was concerned that I might say nothing to weaken the cause in which I had labored. After some close exercise and hearty repentance for not having attended closely to the safe guide, I stood up, and, reciting the passage, acquainted friends that though I durst not go from what I had said as to the matter, yet I was uneasy with the manner of my speaking, believing milder language would have been better. As this was uttered in some degree of creaturely abasement after a warm debate, it appeared to have a good savor amongst us. The yearly meeting being now over, there yet remained on my mind a secret, though heavy, exercise in regard to some leading active members about Newport, who were in the practice of keeping slaves. This I mentioned to two ancient friends who came out of the country, and proposed to them, if way opened, to have some conversation with those members. One of them and I, having consulted one of the most noted elders who had slaves, he, in a respectful manner, encouraged me to proceed to clear myself of what lay upon me, 
Near the beginning of the yearly meeting, I had had a private conference with this said elder and his wife concerning their slaves, so that the way seemed clear to me to advise with him about the manner of proceeding. I told him I was free to have a conference with them all together in a private house, or if he thought they would take it unkind to be asked to come together and to be spoken with in the hearing of one another, I was free to spend some time amongst them and to visit them all in their own houses. He expressed his liking to the first proposal, not doubting their willingness to come together, and, as I proposed a visit to only ministers, elders, and overseers, he named some others whom he desired might also be present. A careful messenger being wanted to acquaint them in a proper manner, he offered to go to all their houses to open the matter to them, and did so. About the eighth hour the next morning, we met in the meeting-house chamber, the last-mentioned country friend, my companion, and John Storer being with us. After a short time of retirement, I acquainted them with the steps I had taken in procuring that meeting, and opened the concern I was under, and we then proceeded to a free conference upon the subject. My exercise was heavy, and I was deeply bowed in the spirit before the Lord, who was pleased to favor with the seasoning virtue of truth, which wrought a tenderness amongst us and the subject was mutually handled in a calm and peaceable spirit. At length, feeling my mind released from the burden which I had been under, I took my leave of them in a good degree of satisfaction, and by the tenderness they manifested in regard to the practice, and the concern several of them expressed in relation to the manner of disposing of their negroes after their decease, I believed that a good exercise was spreading amongst them, and I am humbly thankful to God, who supported my mind and preserved me in a good degree of resignation through these trials. Thou who sometimes travelest in the work of the ministry, and art made very welcome by their friends, seest many tokens of their satisfaction, and having thee for their guest. It is good for thee to dwell deep, that thou mayest feel and understand the spirits of people. If we believe truth points towards a conference on some subjects in a private way, it is needful for us to take heed that their kindness, their freedom, and affability do not hinder us from the Lord's work. I have experienced that, in the midst of kindness and smooth conduct, to speak close and home to them who entertain us, on points that relate to outward interest, is hard labor. Sometimes, when I have felt truth lead towards it, I have found myself disqualified by a superficial friendship, and as the sense thereof hath abased me, and my cries have been to the Lord, so I have been humbled and made content to appear weak, or as a fool for his sake, and thus a door hath been opened to enter upon it. To attempt to do the Lord's work in our own way, and to speak of that which is the burden of the word, in a way easy to the natural part, doth not reach the bottom of the disorder to see the failings of our friends and think hard of them without opening that which we ought to open and still carry a face of friendship tends to undermine the foundation of true unity the office of a minister of christ is weighty and they who now go forth as watchmen have need to be steadily on their guard against the snares of prosperity and an outside friendship. After the yearly meeting, we were at meetings at Newton, Cushnet, Long Plain, Rochester, and Dartmouth. From thence we sailed for Nantucket, 
in company with Anne Gaunt, Mercy Redman, and several other friends. The wind being slack, we only reached Tarpaulin Cove the first day, where, going on shore, we found room in a public house, and beds for a few of us. The rest slept on the floor. We went on board again about break of day, and though the wind was small, we were favored to come within about four miles of Nantucket and then about ten of us got into our boat and rowed to the harbor before dark a large boat went off and brought in the rest of the passengers about midnight the next day but one was their yearly meeting which held four days the last of which was their monthly meeting for business we had a laborious time amongst them our minds were closely exercised, and I believe it was a time of great searching of heart. The longer I was on the island, the more I became sensible that there was a considerable number of valuable friends there, though an evil spirit tending to strife had been at work amongst them. I was cautious of making any visits, except as my mind was particularly drawn to them and in that way we had some sittings in friends' houses, where the heavenly wing was at times spread over us to our mutual comfort. My beloved companion had very acceptable service on this island. When meeting was over, we all agreed to sail the next day if the weather was suitable and we were well, and being called up the latter part of the night, about fifty of us went on board a vessel. But, the wind changing, the seamen thought best to stay in the harbor till it altered. So we returned on shore. Feeling clear as to any further visits, I spent my time in my chamber, chiefly alone. And after some hours, my heart being filled with the spirit of supplication, my prayers and tears were poured out before my heavenly Father for his help and instruction in the manifold difficulties which attended me in life. While I was waiting upon the Lord, there came a messenger from the woman friends who lodged at another house, desiring to confer with us about appointing a meeting, which to me appeared weighty, as we had been at so many before. But after a short conference and advising with some elderly friends, a meeting was appointed in which the friend who first moved it, and who had been much shut up before, was largely opened in the love of the gospel. The next morning, about break of day, going again on board the vessel, we reached Falmouth on the main before night, where our horses, being brought, we proceeded towards Sandwich Quarterly Meeting. Being two days in going to Nantucket, and having been there once before, I observed many shoals in their bay, which make sailing more dangerous, especially in stormy nights. Also, that a great shoal, which encloses their harbor, prevents the entrance of sloops except when the tide is up. Waiting without for the rising of the tide is sometimes hazardous in storms, and by waiting within they sometimes miss a fair wind. I took notice that there was on that small island a great number of inhabitants, and the soil not very fertile, the timber being so gone that for vessels, fences, and firewood they depend chiefly on buying from the main, for the cost whereof with most of their other expenses, they depend principally upon the whale fishery. I considered that as towns grew larger and lands near navigable waters were more cleared, it would require more labor to get timber and wood. I understood that the whales, being much hunted and sometimes wounded and not killed, grow more shy and difficult to come at. I considered that the formation of the earth, the seas, the islands, bays, and rivers, the motions of the winds, 
and the great waters which cause bars and shoals in particular places were all the works of him who is perfect wisdom and goodness and as people attend to his heavenly instruction and put their trust in him he provides for them in all parts where he gives them a being and as in this visit to these people i felt a strong desire for their firm establishment on the sure foundation besides what was said more publicly i was concerned to speak with the woman friends in their monthly meeting of business many being present and in the fresh spring of pure love to open before them the advantage both inwardly and outwardly of attending singly to the pure guidance of the holy spirit and therein to educate their children in true humility and the disuse of all superfluities i reminded them of the difficulties their husbands and sons were frequently exposed to at sea and that the more plain and simple their way of living was the less need there would be of running great hazards to support them i also encouraged the young women to continue their neat decent way of attending themselves on the affair of the house showing as the way opened that where people were truly humble used themselves to business and were content with a plain way of life they had ever had more true peace and calmness of mind than they who aspiring to greatness and outward show have grasped hard for an income to support themselves therein and as i observed they had so few or no slaves i had to encourage them to be content without them making mention of the numerous troubles and vexations which frequently attended the minds of the people who depend on slaves to do their labor we attended the quarterly meeting at sandwich in company with anne gaunt and mercy redmond which was preceded by a monthly meeting and in the whole held three days we were in various ways exercised amongst them in gospel love according to the several gifts bestowed on us and were at times overshadowed with the virtue of truth to the comfort of the sincere and stirring up of the negligent here we parted with anne and mercy and went to rhode island taking one meeting in our way which was a satisfactory time reaching newport the evening before their quarterly meeting we attended it and after that had a meeting with our young people separated from those of other societies we went through much labor in this town and now in taking leave of it though i felt close inward exercise to the last i found inward peace and was in some degree comforted in a belief that a good number remain in that place who retain a sense of truth and that there are some young people attentive to the voice of the heavenly shepherd the last meeting in which friends from the several parts of the quarter came together was a select meeting and through the renewed manifestation of the father's love the hearts of the sincere were united together the poverty of spirit and inward weakness with which i was much tried the forepart of this journey has of late appeared to me a dispensation of kindness appointing meetings never appeared more weighty to me and i was led into a deep search whether in all things my mind was resigned to the will of god often querying with myself what should be the cause of such inward poverty and greatly desiring that no secret reserve in my heart might hinder my access to the divine fountain in these humbling times i was made watchful and excited to attend to the secret movings of the heavenly principle in my mind which prepared the way to some duties that in more easy and prosperous times as to the outward i believe i should have been in danger of omitting 
From Newport we went to Greenwich, Chanticut, and Warwick, and were helped to labor amongst friends in the love of our gracious Redeemer. Afterwards, accompanied by our friend John Casey from Newport, we rode through Connecticut to Oblong, visited the meetings to those parts, and thence proceeded to the quarterly meeting at Rye Woods. Through the gracious extendings of divine help, we had some seasoning opportunities in those places. We also visited friends at New York and Flushing, and thence to Rahway. Here, our roads parting, I took leave of my beloved companion and true yokemate, Samuel Eastburn, and reached home the tenth of eighth month, where I found my family well. For the favors and protection of the Lord, both inward and outward, extended to me in this journey, my heart is humbled in grateful acknowledgments, and I find renewed desires to dwell and walk in resignedness before him. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of the Journal of John Woolman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. Chapter 8 1761 1762. Visits Pennsylvania, Shrewsbury, and Squan. Publishes the second part of his considerations on keeping Negroes. The grounds of his appearing in some respects singular in his dress. Visits to the families of friends of Ancocas and Mount Holly meetings. Visits to the Indians at Weehalusing on the river Sesquahanna. Having felt my mind drawn towards a visit to a few meetings in Pennsylvania, I was very desirous to be rightly instructed as to the time of setting off. On the 10th of the 5th month, 1761, being the first day of the week, I went to Haddonfield meeting, concluding to seek for heavenly instruction and come home or go on as I might then believe best for me, and there through the springing up of pure love I felt encouragement, and so crossed the river. In this visit I was at two quarterly and three monthly meetings, and in the love of truth I felt my way open to labor with some noted friends who kept Negroes. As I was favored to keep to the root, and endeavor to discharge what I believed was required of me, I found inward peace therein, from time to time, and thankfulness of heart to the Lord, who was graciously pleased to be a guide to me. Eighth Month, 1761 Having felt drawings in my mind to visit friends in and about Shrewsbury, I went there, and was at their monthly meeting, and their first day meeting. I had also a meeting at Squan, and another at Squanquam, and, as way opened, had conversation with some noted friends concerning their slaves. I returned home in a thankful sense of the goodness of the Lord. From the concern I felt growing in me for some years, I wrote part the second of a work entitled Considerations on Keeping Negroes, which was printed this year, 1762. When the overseers of the press had done with it, they offered to get a number printed, to be paid for out of the yearly meeting's stock to be given away. But I, being most easy to publish it at my own expense, and offering my reasons, they appeared satisfied." This stock is the contribution of the members of our religious society in general, among whom are some who keep Negroes, 
and, being inclined to continue them in slavery, are not likely to be satisfied with such books being spread among a people, especially at their own expense, many of whose slaves are taught to read, and such, receiving them as a gift, often conceal them. But as they who make a purchase generally buy that which they have a mind for, I believed it best to sell them, expecting by that means they would more generally be read with attention. Advertisements were signed by order of the overseers of the press and directed to be read in the monthly meetings of business within our own yearly meeting, informing where the books were and that the price was no more than the cost of printing and binding them. Many were taken off in our parts. Some I sent to Virginia, some to New York, some to my acquaintance at Newport, and some I kept, intending to give part of them away, where there appeared a prospect of service. In my youth I was used to hard labor, and though I was middling healthy, yet my nature was not fitted to endure so much as many others. Being often weary, I was prepared to sympathize with those whose circumstances in life, as free men, required constant labor to answer the demands of their creditors, as well as with others under oppression. In the uneasiness of body which I have many times felt by too much labor, not as a forced, but of a voluntary oppression, I have often been excited to think on the original cause of that oppression which is imposed on many in the world. The latter part of the time wherein I labored on our plantation, my heart, through the fresh visitations of heavenly love, being often tender, and my leisure time being frequently spent in reading the life and doctrines of our blessed Redeemer, the account of the sufferings of martyrs and the history of the first rise of our society a belief was gradually settled in my mind that if such as had great estates generally lived in that humility and plainness which belong to a christian life and laid much easier rents and interests on their lands and monies, and thus led the way to a right use of things, so great a number of people might be employed in things useful, that labor both for men and other creatures would need to be no more than an agreeable employ, and divers branches of business which serve chiefly to please the natural inclinations of our minds, and which at present seem necessary to circulate that wealth which some gather, might, in this way of pure wisdom, be discontinued. As I have thus considered these things, a query at times hath arisen. Do I, in all my proceedings, keep to that use of things which is agreeable to universal righteousness? And then there hath some degree of sadness at times come over me, because I accustomed myself to some things which have occasioned more labor than I believe divine wisdom intended for us. From my early acquaintance with truth, I have often felt an inward distress, occasioned by the striving of a spirit in me against the operation of the heavenly principle, and in this state I have been affected with a sense of my own wretchedness, and in a mourning condition have felt earnest longings for that divine help which brings the soul into true liberty. Sometimes, on retiring into private places, the spirit of supplication hath been given me, and under a heavenly covering I have asked my gracious Father to give me a heart in all things resigned to the direction of his wisdom. In uttering language like this, the thought of my wearing hats and garments dyed with a dye hurtful to them has made lasting impression on me. 
in visiting people of note in the society who had slaves, and laboring with them in brotherly love on that account, I have seen, and the sight has affected me, that a conformity to some customs distinguishable from pure wisdom has entangled many, and that the desire of gain to support these customs has greatly opposed the work of truth. Sometimes when the prospect of the work before me has been such that in bowedness of spirit I have been drawn into retired places and have besought the Lord with tears that he would take me wholly under his direction and show me the way in which I ought to walk, it hath revived with strength of conviction that if I would be his faithful servant, I must in all things attend to his wisdom and be teachable, and so cease from all customs contrary thereto, however used among religious people. As he is the perfection of power, of wisdom, and of goodness, so I believe he hath provided that so much labor shall be necessary for men's support in this world as would, being rightly divided, be a suitable employment of their time, and that we cannot go into superfluities or grasp after wealth in a way contrary to his wisdom without having connection with some degree of oppression and with that spirit which leads to self-exaltation and strife, and which frequently brings calamities on countries by parties contending about their claims. Being thus fully convinced, and feeling an increasing desire to live in the spirit of peace, I have often been sorrowfully affected with thinking on the unquiet spirit in which wars are generally carried on and with the miseries of many of my fellow creatures engaged therein, some suddenly destroyed, some wounded, and after much pain remaining cripples, some deprived of all their outward substance and reduced to want, and some carried into captivity. Thinking often on these things, the use of hats and garments dyed with a dye hurtful to them, and wearing more clothes in summer than are useful, grew more uneasy to me, believing them to be customs which have not their foundation in pure wisdom. The apprehension of being singular from my beloved friends was a strait upon me, and thus I continued in the use of some things contrary to my judgment. On the 31st of the 5th month, 1761, I was taken ill of a fever, and after it had continued near a week, I was in great distress of body. One day there was a cry raised in me that I might understand the cause of my affliction and improve under it, and my conformity to some customs which I believed were not right was brought to my remembrance. In the continuance of this exercise, I felt all the powers in me yield themselves up into the hands of him who gave me being, and was made thankful that he had taken hold of me by his chastisements. Feeling the necessity of further purifying, there was now no desire in me for health until the design of my correction was answered. Thus I lay in abasement and brokenness of spirit, and as I felt a sinking down into a calm resignation, so I felt, as in an instant, an inward healing in my nature, and from that time forward I grew better. Though my mind was thus settled in relation to hurtful dyes, I felt easy to wear my garments heretofore made and continued to do so about nine months. Then I thought of getting a hat, the natural color of the fur, but the apprehension of being looked upon as one affecting singularity felt uneasy to me. Here I had occasion to consider that things, though small in themselves, being clearly enjoined by divine authority, become great things to us 
and I trusted that the Lord would support me in the trials that might attend singularity, so long as singularity was only for his sake. On this account I was under close exercise of mind in the time of our general spring meeting, 1762, greatly desiring to be rightly directed, when, being deeply bowed in spirit before the Lord, I was made willing to submit to what I apprehended was required of me, and when I returned home, got a hat of the natural color of the fur. In attending meetings, this singularity was a trial to me, and more especially at this time, as white hats were used by some who were fond of following the changeable modes of dress, and as some friends who knew not from what motives I wore it grew shy of me, I felt my way for a time shut up in the exercise of the ministry. In this condition, my mind being turned toward my heavenly Father with fervent cries that I might be preserved to walk before him in the meekness of wisdom, my heart was often tender in meetings, and I felt an inward consolation which to me was very precious under these difficulties. I had several dyed garments fit for use, which I believed it best to wear till I had occasion for new ones. Some friends were apprehensive that my wearing such a hat savored of an affected singularity. Those who spoke with me in a friendly way, I generally informed, in a few words, that I believed my wearing it was not in my own will. I had at times been sensible that a superficial friendship had been dangerous to me, and many friends being now uneasy with me, I had an inclination to acquaint some with the manner of my being led into these things. Yet upon a deeper thought, I was for a time most easy to omit it, believing the present dispensation was profitable, and trusting that if I kept my place, the Lord in his own time would open the hearts of friends towards me. I have since had cause to admire his goodness and loving kindness in leading about and instructing me, and in opening and enlarging my heart in some of our meetings. In the eleventh month this year, feeling an engagement of mind to visit some families in Mansfield, I joined my beloved friend, Benjamin Jones, and we spent a few days together in that service. In the second month, 1763, I joined in the company with Elizabeth Smith and Mary Noble in a visit to the families of friends at Ancocas. In both these visits, through the baptizing power of truth, the sincere laborers were often comforted and the hearts of friends opened to receive us. In the fourth month following, I accompanied some friends in a visit to the families of friends in Mount Holly. During this visit, my mind was often drawn into an inward awfulness, wherein strong desires were raised for the everlasting welfare of my fellow creatures. And through the kindness of our Heavenly Father, our hearts were at times enlarged, and friends were invited, and the flowings of divine love, to attend to that which would settle them on the sure foundation. Having for many years felt love in my heart towards the natives of this land who dwell far back in the wilderness, whose ancestors were formerly the owners and possessors of the land where we dwell, and who for a small consideration assigned their inheritance to us, and being at Philadelphia in the eighth month, 1761, on a visit to some friends who had slaves, I fell in company with some of those natives who lived on the east branch of the river Susquehanna at an Indian town called Weehalusing, 200 miles from Philadelphia, in conversation with them by an interpreter, as also by observations on their countenances and conduct, 
I believed some of them were measurably acquainted with that divine power which subjects the rough and forward will of the creature. At times I felt inward drawings towards a visit to that place, which I mentioned to none except my dear wife, until it came to some ripeness. In the winter of 1762, I laid my prospects before my friends at our monthly and quarterly, and afterwards at our general spring meeting, and having the unity of friends, and being thoughtful about an Indian pilot, there came a man and three women from a little beyond that town to Philadelphia on business. Being informed thereof by letter, I met them in town in the fifth month, 1763, and after some conversation, finding they were sober people, I, with the concurrence of friends in that place, agreed to join them as companions in their return, and we appointed to meet at Samuel Folks at Richland in Bucks County on the seventh of sixth month. Now, as this visit felt weighty and was performed at a time when traveling appeared perilous, so the dispensations of divine providence in preparing my mind for it have been memorable, and I believe it good for me to give some account thereof. After I had given up to go, the thoughts of the journey were often attended with unusual sadness at which times my heart was frequently turned to the lord with inward breathings for his heavenly support that i might not fail to follow him wheresoever he might lead me being at our youth's meeting at chesterfield about a week before the time i expected to set off i was there led to speak on that prayer of our redeemer to the father i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And, in attending to the pure openings of truth, I had to mention what he elsewhere said to his father. I know that thou hearest me at all times. So as some of his followers kept their places, and as his prayer was granted, it followed necessarily that they were kept from evil, and as some of those met with great hardships and afflictions in this world, and at last suffered death by cruel men, so it appears that whatsoever befalls men while they live in pure obedience to God certainly works for their good, and may not be considered an evil as it relates to them. As I spake on this subject, my heart was much tendered, and great awfulness came over me. On the first day of the week, being at our own afternoon meeting, and my heart being enlarged in love, I was led to speak on the care and protection of the Lord over his people, and to make mention of that passage where a band of Syrians, who were endeavoring to take captive the prophet, were disappointed, and how the psalmist said, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Thus, in true love and tenderness, I parted from friends, expecting the next morning to proceed on my journey. Being weary, I went early to bed. After I had been asleep a short time, I was awoke by a man calling at my door, and inviting me to meet some friends at a public house in our town, who came from Philadelphia so late that friends were generally gone to bed. These friends informed me that an express had arrived the last morning from Pittsburgh, and brought news that the Indians had taken a fort from the English westward, and had slain and scalped some English people near the said Pittsburgh and in divers places. Some elderly friends in Philadelphia, knowing the time of my intending to set off, had conferred together, and thought good to inform me of these things before I left home, that I might consider them and proceed as I believed best. Going to bed again, I told not my wife till morning. My heart was turned to the Lord for his heavenly instruction 
and it was an humbling time to me. When I told my dear wife, she appeared to be deeply concerned about it, but in a few hours' time my mind became settled in a belief that it was my duty to proceed on my journey, and she bore it with a good degree of resignation. In this conflict of spirit, there were great searchings of heart and strong cries to the Lord that no motion might in the least degree be attended to but that of the pure spirit of truth. The subjects before mentioned, on which I had so lately spoken in public, were now fresh before me, and I was brought inwardly to commit myself to the Lord, to be disposed of as he saw best. I took leave of my family and neighbors in much bowedness of spirit, and went to our monthly meeting at Burlington. After taking leave of friends there, I crossed the river, accompanied by my friends Israel and John Pemberton, and parting the next morning with Israel, John bore me company to Samuel Folks, where I met the before-mentioned Indians, and we were glad to see each other. Here my friend Benjamin Parvin met me, and proposed joining me as a companion. We had before exchanged some letters on the subject, and now I had a sharp trial on his account, for, as the journey appeared perilous, I thought if he went chiefly to bear me company, and we should be taken captive, my having been the means of drawing him into these difficulties would add to my own afflictions. So I told him my mind freely, and let him know that I was resigned to go alone. But after all, if he really believed it to be his duty to go on, I believed his company would be very comfortable to me. It was indeed a time of deep exercise, and Benjamin appeared to be so fastened to the visit that he could not be easy to leave me. So we went on, accompanied by our friends John Pemberton and William Lightfoot of Pikeland. We lodged at Bethlehem, and there parting with John, William and we went forward on the ninth of the sixth month and got lodging on the floor of a house about five miles from Fort Allen. Here we parted with William, and at this place we met with an Indian trader lately come from Wyoming. In conversation with him, I perceived that many white people often sell rum to the Indians, which I believe is a great evil. In the first place, they are thereby deprived of the use of reason, and their spirits being violently agitated, quarrels often arise which end in mischief and the bitterness and resentment occasioned hereby are frequently of long continuance. Again, their skins and furs, gotten through much fatigue and hard travels in hunting, with which they intended to buy clothing, they often sell at a low rate for more rum, when they become intoxicated, and afterward, when they suffer for want of the necessaries of life, are angry with those who, for the sake of gain, took advantage of their weakness. Their chiefs have often complained of this in their treaties with the English. Where cunning people pass counterfeits and impose on others that which is good for nothing, it is considered as wickedness. But for the sake of gain to sell that which we know does people harm, and which often works their ruin, manifests a hardened and corrupt heart, and is an evil which demands the care of all true lovers of virtue to suppress. While my mind this evening was thus employed, I also remembered that the people on the frontiers, among whom this evil is too common, are often poor and that they venture to the outside of a colony in order to live more independently of the wealthy, who often set high rents on their land. I was renewedly confirmed in a belief that if all our inhabitants lived according to sound wisdom, laboring to promote universal love and righteousness, and ceased from every inordinate desire after wealth, and from all customs which are tinctured with luxury, 
the way would be easy for our inhabitants, though they might be much more numerous than at present, to live comfortably on honest employments, without the temptation they are so often under of being drawn into schemes to make settlements on lands which have not been purchased of the Indians, or of applying to that wicked practice of selling rum to them. Tenth of Sixth Month we set out early this morning and crossed the western branch of Delaware, called the Great Lehigh, near Fort Allen. The water being high, we went over in a canoe. Here we met an Indian, had friendly conversation with him, and gave him some biscuit, and he, having killed a deer, gave some of it to the Indians with us. After traveling some miles, we met several Indian men and women with a cow and horse, and some household goods, who were lately come from their dwelling at Wyoming, and were going to settle at another place. We made them some small presents, and, as some of them understood English, I told them my motive for coming into their country, with which they appeared satisfied." one of our guides talking a while with an ancient woman concerning us the poor old woman came to my companion and me and took her leave of us with an appearance of sincere affection we pitched our tent near the banks of the same river having labored hard in crossing some of those mountains called the blue ridge the roughness of the stones and the cavities between them with the steepness of the hills made it appear dangerous but we were preserved in safety through the kindness of him whose works in these mountainous deserts appeared awful and towards whom my heart was turned during this day's travel near our tent on the sides of large trees peeled for that purpose were various representations of men going to and returning from the wars and of some being killed in battle this was a path heretofore used by warriors and as i walked about viewing those indian histories which were painted mostly in red or black and thinking on the innumerable afflictions which the proud fierce spirit produceth in the world also on the toils and fatigues of warriors in travelling over mountains and deserts on their miseries and distresses when far from home and wounded by their enemies of their bruises and great weariness in chasing one another over the rocks and mountains of the restless unquiet state of mind of those who live in this spirit and of the hatred which mutually grows up in the minds of their children the desire to cherish the spirit of love and peace among these people arose very fresh in me this was the first night that we lodged in the woods and being wet with travelling in the rain as were also our blankets the ground our tent and the bushes under which we purposed to lay all looked discouraging but i believed that it was the lord who had thus far brought me forward and that he would dispose of me as he saw good and so i felt easy we kindled a fire with our tent open to it then laid some bushes next to the ground and put our blankets upon them for our bed and lying down got some sleep in the morning feeling a little unwell i went into the river the water was cold but soon after i felt fresh and well about eight o'clock we set forward and crossed a high mountain supposed to be upward of four miles over the north side being the steepest about noon we were overtaken by one of the moravian brethren going to wehalusing and an indian man with him who could talk english and we being together while our horses ate grass had some friendly conversation but they travelling faster than we soon left us this moravian i understood has this spring spent some time at wehalusing and was invited by some of the indians to come again 
Twelfth of sixth month being the first of the week and a rainy day, we continued in our tent, and I was led to think on the nature of the exercise which hath attended me. Love was the first motion, and thence a concern arose to spend some time with the Indians, that I might feel and understand their life and the spirit they live in, if haply I might receive some instruction from them, or they might be in any degree helped forward by my following the leadings of truth among them and as it pleased the lord to make way for my going at a time when the troubles of war were increasing and when by reason of much wet weather travelling was more difficult than usual at that season i looked upon it as a more favourable opportunity to season my mind and to bring me into a nearer sympathy with them as mine eye was to the great father of mercies humbly desiring to learn his will concerning me i was made quiet and content our guide's horse strayed though hoppled in the night and after searching some time for him his footsteps were discovered in the path going back whereupon my kind companion went off in the rain and after about seven hours returned with him here we lodged again tying up our horses before we went to bed and loosing them to feed about break of day thirteenth of sixth month the sun appearing we set forward and as i rode over the barren hills my meditations were on the alterations in the circumstances of the natives of this land since coming in of the english the lands near the sea are conveniently situated for fishing the lands near the rivers where the tides flow and some above are in many places fertile and not mountainous while the changing of the tides makes passing up and down easy with any kind of traffic the natives have in some places for trifling considerations sold their inheritance so favorably situated and in other places have been driven back by superior force their way of clothing themselves is also altered from what it was and they being far removed from us have to pass over mountains swamps and barren deserts so that traveling is very troublesome in bringing their skins and furs to trade with us by the extension of english settlements and partly by the increase of english hunters the wild beasts on which the natives chiefly depend for subsistence are not so plentiful as they were and people too often for the sake of gain induce them to waste their skins and furs in purchasing a liquor which tends to the ruin of them and their families my own will and desires were now very much broken and my heart was with much earnestness turned to the lord to whom alone i looked for help in the dangers before me i had a prospect of the english along the coast for upwards of nine hundred miles where i travelled and their favourable situation and the difficulties attending the natives as well as the negroes in many places were open before me a weighty and heavenly care came over my mind and love filled my heart towards all mankind in which i felt a strong engagement that we might be obedient to the lord while in tender mercy he is yet calling to us and that we might so attend to pure universal righteousness as to give no just cause of offence to the gentiles and who do not profess christianity whether they be the blacks from africa or the native inhabitants of this continent here i was led into a close and laborious inquiry whether i as an individual kept clear from all things which tended to stir up or were connected with wars either in this land or in africa my heart was deeply concerned that in future I might in all things keep steadily to the pure truth and live and walk in the plainness and simplicity of a sincere follower of Christ. In this lonely journey I did greatly bewail the spreading of a wrong spirit, 
believing that the prosperous, convenient situation of the English would require a constant attention in us to divine love and wisdom, in order to their being guided and supported in a way answerable to the will of that good, gracious, and almighty being, who hath an equal regard to all mankind. And here luxury and covetousness, with the numerous oppressions and other evils attending them, appeared very afflicting to me, and I felt in that which is immutable that the seeds of great calamity and desolation are sown and growing fast on this continent. Nor have I words sufficient to set forth the longing I then felt, that we who are placed along the coast, and have tasted the love and goodness of God, might arise in the strength thereof, and like faithful messengers labor to check the growth of these seeds, that they may not ripen to the ruin of our posterity. On reaching the Indian settlement at Wyoming, we were told that an Indian runner had been at that place a day or two before us, and brought news of the Indians having taken an English fort westward, and destroyed the people, and that they were endeavoring to take another. Also that another Indian runner came there about the middle of the previous night from a town about ten miles from Weehalusing, and brought the news that some Indian warriors from distant parts came to that town with two English scalps, and told the people that it was war with the English." Our guides took us to the house of a very ancient man. Soon after we had put in our baggage, there came a man from another Indian house, some distance off. Perceiving there was a man near the door, I went out. The man had a tomahawk wrapped under his match coat out of sight. As I approached him, he took it in his hand. I went forward, and speaking to him in a friendly way, perceived he understood some English. My companion joining me, we had some talk with him concerning the nature of our visit in these parts. He then went into the house with us, and talking with our guides, soon appeared friendly, sat down and smoked his pipe. Though taking his hatchet in his hand at the instant I drew near to him, had a disagreeable appearance. I believe he had no other intent than to be in readiness in case any violence were offered to him. On hearing the news brought by these Indian runners, and being told by the Indians where we lodged, that the Indians about Wyoming expected in a few days to move to some larger towns, I thought, to all outward appearance, it would be dangerous traveling at this time. After a hard day's journey, I was brought into a painful exercise at night in which I had to trace back and view the steps I had taken from my first moving in the visit, and though I had to bewail some weakness which at times had attended me, yet I could not find that I had ever given way to willful disobedience. Believing I had, under a sense of duty, come this far, I was now earnest in spirit, beseeching the Lord to show me what I ought to do. In this great distress I grew jealous of myself, lest the desire of reputation as a man firmly settled to persevere through dangers, or the fear of disgrace from my returning without performing the visit might have some place in me. Full of these thoughts, I lay great part of the night, while my beloved companion slept by me, till the Lord, my gracious Father, who saw the conflicts of my soul, was pleased to give quietness. Then I was again strengthened to commit my life, and all things relating thereto, into his heavenly hands, and got a little sleep towards day. Fourteenth of Sixth Month We sought out and visited all the Indians hereabouts that we could meet with, in number about twenty. They were chiefly in one place, about a mile from where we lodged. I expressed to them the care I had on my mind for their good, and told them that true love had made me willing thus to leave my family to come and see the Indians and speak with them in their houses. 
Some of them appeared kind and friendly. After taking leave of them, we went up the river Susquehanna about three miles to the house of an Indian called Jacob January. He had killed his hog, and the women were making store of bread and preparing to move up the river. Here our pilots had left their canoe when they came down in the spring, and lying dry it had become leaky. This detained us some hours, so that we had a good deal of friendly conversation with the family, and eating dinner with them we made them some small presents. Then, putting our baggage into the canoe, some of them pushed slowly up the stream, and the rest of us rode our horses. We swam them over a creek called Lahawahamuk, and pitched our tent above it in the evening. And a sense of God's goodness in helping me in my distress, sustaining me under trials, and inclining my heart to trust in him, I lay down in an humble, bowed frame of mind, and had a comfortable night's lodging. Fifteenth of Sixth Month We proceeded forward till the afternoon, when, a storm appearing, we met our canoe at an appointed place and stayed all night, the rain continuing so heavy that it beat through our tent and wet both us and our baggage. The next day we found abundance of trees blown down by the storm yesterday, and had occasion reverently to consider the kind dealings of the Lord who provided a safe place for us in a valley while this storm continued. We were much hindered by the trees which had fallen across our path, and in some swamps our way was so stopped that we got through with extreme difficulty. I had this day often to consider myself as a sojourner in this world. A belief in the all-sufficiency of God to support his people in their pilgrimage felt comfortable to me, and I was industriously employed to get to a state of perfect resignation. We seldom saw our canoe, but at appointed places, by reason of the path going off from the river. This afternoon, Job Chilloway, an Indian from Weehalusing, who talks good English and is acquainted with several people in and about Philadelphia, met our people on the river. Understanding where we expected to lodge, he pushed back about six miles and came to us after night, and in a while our own canoe arrived, it being hard work pushing up the stream. Job told us that an Indian came in haste to their town yesterday, and told them that three warriors from a distance lodged in a town above Weehalusing a few nights past, and that these three men were going against the English at Uniata. Job was going down the river to the province store at Shemokin though I was so far favored with health as to continue traveling, yet through the various difficulties in our journey and the very different way of living from which I had been used to, I grew sick. The news of these warriors being on their march so near us and not knowing whether we might not fall in with them was a fresh trial of my faith and though through the strength of divine love i had several times been enabled to commit myself to the divine disposal i still found the want of a renewal of my strength that i might be able to persevere therein and my cries for help were put up to the lord who in great mercy gave me a resigned heart in which i found quietness parting from job chilloway on the seventeenth we went on and reached Weehalusing about the middle of the afternoon. The first Indian that we saw was a woman of a modest countenance, with a Bible, who spake first to our guide, and then, with an harmonious voice, expressed her gladness at seeing us, having before heard of our coming. By the direction of our guide, we sat down on a log while he went to the town to tell the people we were come. My companion and I, sitting thus together, in a deep inward stillness, 
the poor woman came and sat near us, and, great awfulness coming over us, we rejoiced in a sense of God's love manifest to our poor souls. After a while, we heard a conch shell blow several times, and then came John Curtis and another Indian man, who kindly invited us into a house near the town, where we found about sixty people sitting in silence. After sitting with them a short time, I stood up, and in some tenderness of spirit acquainted them, in a few short sentences, with the nature of my visit and that a concern for their good had made me willing to come thus far to see them, which some of them, understanding, interpreted to the others, and there appeared gladness among them. I then showed them my certificate, which was explained to them, and the Moravian who overtook us on the way, being now here, bade me welcome. But the Indians, knowing that this Moravian and I were of different religious societies, and as some of their people had encouraged him to come and stay a while with them, they were, I believe, concerned that there might be no jarring or discord in their meetings. And having, I suppose, conferred together, they acquainted me that the people, at my request, would at any time come together and hold meetings. They also told me that they expected the Moravian would speak in their settled meetings, which are commonly held in the morning and near evening. So finding liberty in my heart to speak to the Moravian, I told him of the care I felt on my mind for the good of these people, and my belief that no ill effects would follow if I sometimes spake in their meetings when love engaged me thereto without calling them together at times, when they did not meet, of course. He expressed his good will towards my speaking at any time all that I found in my heart to say. On the evening of the 18th I was at their meeting, where pure gospel love was felt, to the tendering of some of our hearts. The interpreters endeavored to acquaint the people with what I said in short sentences, but found some difficulty, as none of them were quite perfect in the English and Delaware tongues. So they helped one another, and we labored along, divine love attending. Afterwards, feeling my mind covered with the spirit of prayer, I told the interpreters that I found it in my heart to pray to God, and believed if I prayed aright he would hear me, and I expressed my willingness for them to omit interpreting, so our meeting ended with a degree of divine love. Before the people went out, I observed Papunehung, the man who had been zealous in laboring for a reformation in that town, being then very tender. Speaking to one of the interpreters, I was afterwards told that he said in substance as follows, I love to feel where words come from. Nineteenth of sixth month and first of the week. This morning the Indian who came with the Moravian, being also a member of that society, prayed in the meeting, and then the Moravian spake a short time to the people. In the afternoon, my heart being filled with a heavenly care for their good, I spake to them a while by interpreters. But none of them being perfect in the work, and I feeling the current of love run strong, told the interpreters that I believed some of the people would understand me, and so I proceeded without them. And I believe the Holy Ghost wrought on some hearts to edification where all the words were not understood. I looked upon it as a time of divine favor, and my heart was tendered and truly thankful before the Lord. After I sat down, one of the interpreters seemed spirited to give the Indians the substance of what I said. Before our first meeting this morning, I was led to meditate on the manifold difficulties of these Indians who, by the permission of the six nations, dwell in these parts 
a near sympathy with them was raised in me, and, my heart being enlarged in the love of Christ, I thought that the affectionate care of a good man for his only brother in affliction does not exceed what I then felt for that people. I came to this place through much trouble, and though through the mercies of God I believed that if I died in the journey it would be well with me, Yet the thoughts of falling into the hands of Indian warriors were, in times of weakness, afflicting to me. And being of a tender constitution of body, the thoughts of captivity among them were also grievous. Supposing that as they were strong and hardy, they might demand service of me beyond what I could well bear. But the Lord alone was my keeper and I believed that if I went into captivity, it would be for some good end. Thus, from time to time, my mind was centered in resignation, in which I always found quietness. And this day, though I had the same dangerous wilderness between me and home, I was inwardly joyful that the Lord had strengthened me to come on this visit, and had manifested a fatherly care over me in my poor lowly condition when, in mine own eyes, I appeared inferior to many among the Indians. When the last mentioned meeting was ended, it being night, Papa Nuhang went to bed, and hearing him speak with a harmonious voice, I suppose for a minute or two, I asked the interpreter, who told me that he was expressing his thankfulness to God for the favors he had received that day, and prayed that he would continue to favor him with the same, which he had experienced in that meeting. Though Papa Nuhang had before agreed to receive the Moravian and join with them, he still appeared kind and loving to us. I was at two meetings on the 20th, and silent in them, the following morning in meeting my heart was enlarged in pure love among them and in short plain sentences i expressed several things that rested upon me which one of the interpreters gave the people pretty readily the meeting ended in supplication and i had cause humbly to acknowledge the loving kindness of the lord towards us and then i believed that a door remained open for the faithful disciples of jesus christ to labor among these people and now feeling my mind at liberty to return i took leave of them in general at the conclusion of what i said in the meaning and we then prepared to go homeward but some of their most active men told us that when we were ready to move the people would choose to come and shake hands with us those who usually came to meeting did so and from a secret draught in my mind i went among some who did not usually go to meeting and took my leave of them also the moravian and his indian interpreter appeared respectful to us at parting this town we hallucing stands on the bank of the susquehanna and consists i believe of about forty houses mostly compact together some about thirty feet long and eighteen wide some bigger some less they are built mostly of split plank one end being set in the ground and the other pinned to a plate on which rafters are laid and then covered with bark I understand a great flood last winter overflowed the greater part of the ground where the town stands, and some were now about moving their houses to higher ground. We expected only two Indians to be of our company, but when we were ready to go we found many of them were going to Bethlehem with skins and furs, and chose to go in company with us. So they loaded two canoes in which they desired us to go, telling us that the waters were so raised with the rains that the horses should be taken by such as were better acquainted with the fording places we therefore with several indians went in the canoes and others went on horses there being seven besides ours we met with the horsemen once on the way by appointment and at night we lodged a little below a branch called tankana 
and some of the young men, going out a little before dusk with their guns, brought in a deer. Through diligence we reached Wyoming before night, the 22nd, and understood that the Indians were mostly gone from this place. We went up a small creek into the woods with our canoes and pitching our tent, carried out our baggage, and before dark our horses came to us. Next morning, the horses being loaded and our baggage prepared, we set forward, being in all fourteen, and with diligent traveling were favored to get near halfway to Fort Allen. The land on this road from Wyoming to our frontier being mostly poor, and good grass being scarce, the Indians chose a piece of low ground to lodge on, as the best for grazing. I had sweat much in traveling, and being weary, slept soundly. In the night I perceived that I had taken cold, of which I was favored soon to get better. 24th of 6th month this day we passed Fort Allen and lodged near it in the woods. We forded the westerly branch of the Delaware three times, which was a shorter way than going over the top of the Blue Mountains called the Second Ridge. In the second time of fording, where the river cuts through the mountain, the waters being rapid and pretty deep, my companion's mare, being a tall, tractable animal, was sundry times driven back through the river, being laden with the burdens of some small horses which were thought unable to come through with their loads. The troubles westward and the difficulty for Indians to pass through our frontier was, I apprehend, one reason why so many came expecting that our being in company would prevent the outside inhabitants being surprised. We reached Bethlehem on the 25th, taking care to keep foremost and to acquaint people on and near the road who these Indians were. This we found very needful, for their frontier inhabitants were often alarmed at the report of the English being killed by Indians westward. Among our company were some whom I did not remember to have seen at meeting, and some of these at first were very reserved. But we being several days together, and behaving in a friendly manner towards them, and making them suitable return for the services they did us, they became more free and sociable. 26th of 6th Month Having carefully endeavored to settle all affairs with the Indians relative to our journey, we took leave of them, and I thought they generally parted from us affectionately. We went forward to Richland and had a very comfortable meeting among our friends, it being the first day of the week. Here I parted with my kind friend and companion, Benjamin Parvin, and, accompanied by my friend, Samuel Folk, we rode to John Cadwallader's, from whence I reached home the next day, and found my family tolerably well. They and my friends appeared glad to see me return from a journey which they apprehended would be dangerous, but my mind while I was out had been so employed in striving for perfect resignation, and had so often been confirmed in a belief that, whatever the Lord might be pleased to allot for me, it would work for good, that I was careful lest I should admit any degree of selfishness in being glad over much, and labored to improve by those trials in such a manner as my gracious father and protector designed. Between the English settlements and we hallucing, we had only a narrow path, which in many places is much grown up with bushes, and interrupted by abundance of trees lying across it. These, together with the mountain swamps and rough stones, made it a difficult road to travel, and the more so because rattlesnakes abound here, of which we killed four. People who have never been in such places have but an imperfect idea of them, and I was not only taught patience, but also made thankful to God who thus led about and instructed me, that I might have a quick and lively feeling of the afflictions of my fellow creatures whose situation in life is difficult. 
End of Chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Journal of John Woolman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. Chapter Nine, 1763 to 1769. Religious conversation with a company met to see the tricks of a juggler. Account of John Smith's advice and of the proceedings of a committee at the yearly meeting in 1764. Contemplations on the nature of true wisdom. Visit to the families of friends at Mount Holly, Mansfield, and Burlington, and to the meetings on the sea coast from Cape May towards Squan. Some account of Joseph Nichols and his followers. On the different state of the first settlers in Pennsylvania who depended on their own labor compared with those of the southern provinces who kept Negroes. Visit to the northern parts of New Jersey and the western parts of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Also to the families of friends at Mount Holly and several parts of Maryland. Further considerations on keeping slaves and his concern for having been a party to the sale of one. Thoughts on friends exercising offices in civil government. The latter part of the summer, 1763, there came a man to Mount Holly who had previously published a printed advertisement that at a certain public house he would show many wonderful operations which were therein enumerated. At the appointed time he did, by sleight of hand, perform sundry things which appeared strange to the spectators. Understanding that the show was to be repeated the next night, and that the people were to meet about sunset, I felt an exercise on that account. So I went to the public house in the evening and told the man of the house that I had an inclination to spend a part of the evening there, with which he signified that he was content. Then, sitting down by the door, I spoke to the people in the fear of the Lord, as they came together concerning this show, and labored to convince them that their thus assembling to see these sleight-of-hand tricks and bestowing their money to support men who, in that capacity, were of no use to the world, was contrary to the nature of the Christian religion. One of the company endeavored to show by arguments the reasonableness of their proceedings herein. But after considering some texts of Scripture and calmly debating the matter, he gave up the point. After spending about an hour among them and feeling my mind easy, I departed. 25th of Ninth Month, 1764 At our yearly meeting at Philadelphia this day, John Smith of Marlborough, aged upwards of eighty years, a faithful minister, though not eloquent, stood up in our meeting of ministers and elders, and appearing to be under a great exercise of spirit, informed friends in substance as follows, quote, that he had been a member of our society upwards of sixty years, and he well remembered that in those early times friends were a plain, lowly-minded people, and that there was much tenderness and contrition in their meetings. That, at twenty years from that time, the society increasing in wealth, and in some degree conforming to the fashions of the world, true humility was less apparent and their meetings in general were not so lively and edifying. That, at the end of forty years, 
many of them were grown very rich and many of the society made a specious appearance in the world that wearing fine costly garments and using silver and other watches became customary with them their sons and their daughters these marks of outward wealth and greatness appeared on some in our meetings of ministers and elders and as such things became more prevalent so the powerful overshadowings of the holy ghost were less manifest in the society that there had been a continued increase of such ways of life even until the present time and that the weakness which hath now overspread the society and the barrenness manifest among us is matter of much sorrow End quote. he then mentioned the uncertainty of his attending these meetings in future expecting his dissolution was near and having tenderly expressed his concern for us signified that he had seen in the true light that the lord would bring back his people from these things into which they were thus degenerated but that his faithful servants must go through great and heavy exercises twentieth of ninth month the committee appointed by the yearly meeting to visit the quarterly and monthly meetings gave an account in writing of their proceedings in that service they signified that in the course of the visit they had been apprehensive that some persons holding offices in government inconsistent with our principles and others who kept slaves remaining active members in our meetings for discipline had been one means of weakness prevailing in some places after this report was read an exercise revived in my mind which had attended me for several years and inward cries to the lord were raised in me that the fear of man might not prevent me from doing what he required of me and standing up i spoke in substance as follows i have felt a tenderness in my mind towards persons in two circumstances mentioned in that report namely towards such active members as keep slaves and such as hold offices in civil government and i have desired that friends in all their conduct may be kindly affectioned one towards another many friends who keep slaves are under some exercise on that account and at times think about trying them with freedom but find many things in their way the way of living and the annual expenses of some of them are such that it seems impracticable for them to set their slaves free without changing their own way of life it has been my lot to be often abroad and i have observed in some places at quarterly and yearly meetings and at some houses where travelling friends and their horses are often entertained that the yearly expense of individuals therein is very considerable and friends in some places crowding much on persons in these circumstances for entertainment hath rested as a burden on my mind for some years past i now express it in the fear of the lord greatly desiring that friends here present may duly consider it in the fall of this year having hired a man to work i perceived in conversation with him that he had been a soldier in the late war on this continent and he informed me in the evening in a narrative of his captivity among the indians that he saw two of his fellow captives tortured to death in a very cruel manner this relation affected me with sadness under which i went to bed and the next morning soon after i awoke a fresh and living sense of divine love overspread my mind 
in which I had a renewed prospect of the nature of that wisdom from above, which leads to a right use of all gifts, both spiritual and temporal, and gives content therein. Under a feeling thereof, I wrote as follows. Hath he who gave me a being, attended with many wants unknown to brute creatures, given me a capacity superior to theirs, and shown me that a moderate application to business is suitable to my present condition, and that this, attended with his blessing, may supply all my outward wants while they remain within the bounds he hath fixed, and while no imaginary wants proceeding from an evil spirit have any place in me. Attend then, O my soul, to this pure wisdom as thy sure conductor through the manifold dangers of this world. Doth pride lead to vanity? Doth vanity form imaginary wants? Do these wants prompt men to exert their power in requiring more from others than they would be willing to perform themselves were the same required of them? Do these proceedings beget hard thoughts? Do hard thoughts, when ripe, become malice? Does malice, when ripe, become revengeful, and in the end inflict terrible pains on our fellow creatures and spread desolations in the world? Do mankind, walking in uprightness, delight in each other's happiness? And do those who are capable of this attainment, by giving way to an evil spirit, employ their skill and strength to afflict and destroy one another? Remember then, O my soul, the quietude of those in whom Christ governs, and in all thy proceedings feel after it. Doth he condescend to bless thee with his presence? to move and influence thee to action, to dwell and to walk in thee. Remember then thy station as being sacred to God. Accept of the strength freely offered to thee, and take heed that no weakness in conforming to unwise, expensive, and hard-hearted customs, gendering to discord and strife, be given way to doth he claim my body as his temple and graciously require that i may be sacred to him o oh, that i may prize this favor and that my whole life may be conformable to this character remember o oh my soul that the prince of peace is thy lord that he communicates his unmixed wisdom to his family that they, living in perfect simplicity, may give no just cause of offense to any creature, but that they may walk as he walked. Having felt an openness in my heart towards visiting families in our own meeting, and especially in the town of Mount Holly, the place of my abode, I mentioned it at our monthly meeting in the forepart of the winter of 1764, which, being agreed to, and several friends of our meeting being united in the exercise, we proceeded therein, and through divine favor we were helped in the work, so that it appeared to me as a fresh reviving of godly care among friends. The latter part of the same winter, I joined my friend William Jones in a visit to friends' families in Mansfield, in which labor I had cause to admire the goodness of the Lord toward us. My mind being drawn towards friends along the sea coast from Cape May to near Squan, and also to visit some people in those parts, among whom there is no settled worship, 
i joined with my beloved friend benjamin jones in a visit to them having friends unity therein we set off the twenty fourth of tenth month seventeen sixty five and had a prosperous and very satisfactory journey feeling at times through the goodness of the heavenly shepherd the gospel to flow freely towards a poor people scattered in these places soon after our return i joined my friends john sleeper and elizabeth smith in a visit to friends families at burlington there being at this time about fifty families of our society in that city and we had cause humbly to adore our heavenly father who baptized us into a feeling of the state of the people and strengthened us to labor in true gospel love among them having had a concern at times for several years to pay a religious visit to friends on the eastern shore of maryland and to travel on foot among them that by so travelling i might have a more lively feeling of the condition of the oppressed slaves set an example of lowliness before the eyes of their masters and be more out of the way of temptation to unprofitable converse am the time drawing near in which i believed it my duty to lay my concern before our monthly meeting i perceived in conversation with my beloved friend john sleeper that he also was under a similar concern to travel on foot in the form of a servant among them as he expressed it this he told me before he knew aught of my exercise being thus drawn the same way we laid our exercise and the nature of it before friends and obtaining certificates we set off the sixth of fifth month seventeen sixty six and were at meetings with friends at wilmington duck creek little creek and motherkill my heart was often tendered under the divine influence and enlarged in love towards the people among whom we travelled from motherkill we crossed the country about thirty-five miles to tuckahoe in maryland and had a meeting there and also at marshy creek at the last three meetings there were a considerable number of the followers of one joseph nichols a preacher who i understand is not in outward fellowship with any religious society but professeth nearly the same principles as those of our society and often travels up and down appointing meetings which many people attend i heard of some who had been irreligious people that were now his followers and were become sober well-behaved men and women some irregularities i hear have been among the people at several of his meetings but from what i have perceived i believe the man and some of his followers are honestly disposed but that skilful fathers are wanting among them we then went to chop tank and third haven and thence to queen anne's the weather for some days past having been hot and dry and we having travelled pretty steadily and having hard labour in meetings i grew weakly at which i was for a time discouraged but looking over our journey and considering how the lord had supported our minds and bodies so that we had gone forward much faster than i expected before we came out i saw that i had been in danger of too strongly desiring to get quickly through the journey and that the bodily weakness now attending me was a kindness 
and then in contrition of spirit i became very thankful to my gracious father for this manifestation of his love and in humble submission to his will my trust in him was renewed in this part of our journey i had many thoughts on the different circumstances of friends who inhabit pennsylvania and jersey from those who dwell in maryland virginia and carolina pennsylvania and new jersey were settled by friends who were convinced of our principles in england in times of suffering these coming over bought lands of the natives and applied to husbandry in a peaceable way and many of their children were taught to labor for their living few of these i believe settled in any of the southern provinces but by the faithful labors of traveling friends in early times there was considerable convincement among the inhabitants of these parts i also remembered having read of the warlike disposition of many of the first settlers in those provinces and of their numerous engagements with the natives in which much blood was shed even in the infancy of the colonies some of the people inhabiting those places being grounded in customs contrary to the pure truth were affected with the powerful preaching of the word of life and joined in fellowship with our society and in so doing they had a great work to go through in the history of the reformation from popery it is observable that the progress was gradual from age to age the uprightness of the first reformers in attending to the light and understanding given to them opened the way for sincere-hearted people to proceed further afterwards and thus each one truly fearing god and laboring in the works of righteousness appointed for him in his day findeth acceptance with him through the darkness of the times and the corruption of manners and customs some upright men may have had little more for their day's work than to attend to the righteous principle in their minds as it related to their own conduct in life without pointing out to others the whole extent of that into which the same principle would lead succeeding ages thus for instance among an imperious warlike people supported by oppressed slaves some of these masters i suppose are awakened to feel and to see their error and through sincere repentance cease from oppression and become like fathers to their servants showing by their example a pattern of humility in living and moderation in governing for the instruction and admonition of their oppressing neighbors these without carrying the reformation further have i believe found acceptance with the lord such was the beginning and those who succeeded them and who faithfully attended to the nature and spirit of the reformation have seen the necessity of proceeding forward and have not only to instruct others by their own example in governing well but have also to use means to prevent their successors from having so much power to oppress others here i was renewedly confirmed in my mind that the lord whose tender mercies are over all his works and whose ear is open to the cries and groans of the oppressed is graciously moving in the hearts of people to draw them off from the desire of wealth and to bring them into such an humble lowly way of living that they may see their way clearly to repair to the standard of true righteousness 
and may not only break the yoke of oppression but may know him to be their strength and support in times of outward affliction we crossed chester river had a meeting there and also at cecil and sassafras my bodily weakness joined with a heavy exercise of mind was to me an humbling dispensation and i had a very lively feeling of the state of the oppressed yet i often thought that what i suffered was little compared with the sufferings of the blessed jesus and many of his faithful followers and i may say with thankfulness that i was made content from sassafras we went pretty directly home where we found our families well for several weeks after our return i had often to look over our journey and though to me it appeared as a small service and that some faithful messengers will yet have more bitter cups to drink in those southern provinces for christ's sake than we have had yet i found peace in that i had been helped to walk in sincerity according to the understanding and strength given to me thirteenth of eleventh month with the unity of friends at our monthly meeting and in company with my beloved friend benjamin jones i set out on a visit to friends in the upper part of this province having had drawings of love in my heart that way for a considerable time we travelled as far as hardwick and i had inward peace in my labours of love among them through the humbling dispensations of divine providence my mind hath been further brought into a feeling of the difficulties of friends and their servants southwestward and being often engaged in spirit on their account i believed it my duty to walk into some parts of the western shore of maryland on a religious visit having obtained a certificate from friends of our monthly meeting i took leave of my family under the heart-tendering operation of truth and on the twentieth of fourth month seventeen sixty seven rode to the ferry opposite to philadelphia and thence walked to william horns at derby the same evening next day i pursued my journey alone and reached concord weekday meeting discouragements and a weight of distress had at times attended me in this lonesome walk but through these afflictions i was mercifully preserved sitting down with friends my mind was turned towards the lord to wait for his holy leadings and in infinite love he was pleased to soften my heart into humble contrition and renewedly to strengthen me to go forward so that to me it was a time of heavenly refreshment in a silent meeting the next day i came to new garden weekday meeting in which i sat in bowedness of spirit and being baptized into a feeling of the state of some present the lord gave us a heart-tendering season to his name be the praise passing on i was at nottingham monthly meeting and at a meeting at little britain on first day in the afternoon several friends came to the house where i lodged and we had a little afternoon meeting and through the humbling power of truth i had to admire the loving kindness of the lord manifested to us twenty sixth of fourth month i crossed the susquehanna and coming among people in outward ease and greatness supported chiefly on the labor of slaves my heart was much affected and in awful retiredness my mind was gathered inward to the lord humbly desiring that in true resignation i might receive instruction from him respecting my duty among this people though travelling on foot was wearisome to my body yet it was agreeable to the state of my mind 
being weakly, I was covered with sorrow and heaviness on account of the prevailing spirit of this world by which customs grievous and oppressive are introduced on the one hand and pride and wantonness on the other in this lonely walk and state of abasement and humiliation the condition of the church in these parts was opened before me and i may truly say with the prophet i was bowed down at the hearing of it i was dismayed at the seeing of it under this exercise i attended the quarterly meeting at gunpowder and in bowedness of spirit i had to express with much plainness my feelings respecting friends living in fullness on the labors of the poor oppressed negroes and that promise of the most high was now revived i will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory here the sufferings of christ and his tasting death for every man and the travels sufferings and martyrdom of the apostles and primitive christians in laboring for the conversion of the gentiles were livingly revived in me and according to the measure of strength afforded i labored in some tenderness of spirit being deeply affected among them the difference between the present treatment which these gentiles the negroes receive at our hands and the labors of the primitive christians for the conversion of the gentiles were pressed home and the power of truth came over us under a feeling of which my mind was united to a tender-hearted people in these parts the meeting concluded in a sense of god's goodness towards his humble dependent children the next day was a general meeting for worship much crowded in which i was deeply engaged in inward cries to the lord for help that i might stand wholly resigned and move only as he might be pleased to lead me i was mercifully helped to labor honestly and fervently among them in which i found inward peace and the sincere were comforted from this place i turned towards pipe creek and the redlands and had several meetings among friends in those parts my heart was often tenderly affected under a sense of the lord's goodness in sanctifying my troubles and exercises turning them to my comfort and i believe to the benefit of many others for i may say with thankfulness that in this visit it appeared like a tendering visitation in most places i passed on to the western quarterly meeting in pennsylvania during the several days of this meeting i was mercifully preserved in an inward feeling after the mind of truth and my public labors tended to my humiliation with which i was content after the quarterly meeting for worship ended i felt drawings to go to the women's meeting for business which was very full here the humility of jesus christ as a pattern for us to walk by was livingly opened before me and in treating on it my heart was enlarged and it was a baptizing time i was afterwards at meetings at concord middletown providence and haddonfield whence i returned home and found my family well a sense of the lord's merciful preservation in this my journey excites reverent thankfulness to him second of ninth month seventeen sixty seven with the unity of friends i set off on a visit to friends in the upper part of berks and philadelphia counties was at eleven meetings in about two weeks and have renewed cause to bow in reverence before the lord who by the powerful extendings of his humbling goodness 
opened my way among friends and i trust made the meetings profitable to us the following winter i joined some friends in a family visit to some part of our meeting in which exercise the pure influence of divine love made our visits reviving fifth of fifth month seventeen sixty eight i left home under the humbling hand of the lord with a certificate to visit some meetings in maryland and to proceed without a horse seemed clearest to me i was at the quarterly meetings at philadelphia and concord whence i proceeded to chester river and crossing the bay was at the yearly meeting at west river i then returned to chester river and taking a few meetings in my way proceeded home it was a journey of much inward waiting and as my eye was to the lord way was several times open to my humbling admiration when things appeared very difficult on my return i felt a very comfortable relief of mind having through divine help labored in much plainness both with friends selected and in the more public meetings so that i trust the pure witness in many minds was reached eleventh of sixth month seventeen sixty nine there have been sundry cases of late years within the limits of our monthly meeting respecting the exercising of pure righteousness towards the negroes in which i have lived under a labor of heart that equity might be steadily preserved on this account i have had some close exercises among friends in which i may thankfully say i find peace and as my meditations have been on universal love my own conduct in time past became of late very grievous to me as persons setting negroes free in our province are bound by law to maintain them in case they have need of relief some in the time of my youth who scrupled to keep slaves for term of life were wont to detain their young negroes in their service without wages till they were thirty years of age with this custom i so far agreed that being joined with another friend in executing the will of a deceased friend i once sold a negro lad till he might attain the age of thirty years and applied the money to the use of the estate with abasement of heart i may now say that sometimes as i have sat in a meeting with my heart exercised towards that awful being who respecteth not persons nor colors and have thought upon this lad i have felt that all was not clear in my mind respecting him and as i have attended to this exercise and fervently sought the lord it hath appeared to me that i should make some restitution but in what way i saw not till lately when being under some concern that i might be resigned to go on a visit to some part of the west indies and under close engagement of spirit seeking to the lord for counsel herein the aforesaid transaction came heavily upon me and my mind for a time was covered with darkness and sorrow under this sore affliction my heart was softened to receive instruction and i now first perceived that as i had been one of the two executors who had sold this lad for nine years longer than is common for our own children to serve so i should now offer part of my substance to redeem the last half of the nine years but as the time was not yet come i executed a bond binding myself and my executors to pay to the man to whom he was sold what to candid men might appear equitable 
for the last four and a half years of his time in case the said youth should be living and in a condition likely to provide comfortably for himself ninth of tenth month my heart hath often been deeply afflicted under a feeling that the standard of pure righteousness is not lifted up to the people by us as a society in that clearness which it might have been had we been as faithful as we ought to be to the teachings of christ and as my mind hath been inward to the lord the purity of christ's government hath been made clear to my understanding and i have believed in the opening of universal love that where a people who are convinced of the truth of the inward teachings of christ are active in putting laws in execution which are not consistent with pure wisdom it hath a necessary tendency to bring dimness over their minds my heart having been thus exercised for several years with a tender sympathy towards my fellow members i have within a few months past expressed my concern on this subject in several meetings for discipline end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wayne Cook. Twelfth of Third Month, 1769. Having for some years past dieted myself on account of illness and weakness of body, and not having ability to travel by land as heretofore, I was at times favoured to look with awfulness towards the Lord, before whom are all my ways, who alone hath power of life and death, and to feel thankfulness raised in me for this fatherly chastisement, believing that if I was truly humbled under it, all would work for good. While under this bodily weakness my mind was at times exercised for my fellow creatures in the West Indies, and I grew jealous over myself lest the disagreeableness of the prospect should hinder me from obediently attending thereto. For, though I knew not that the Lord required of me to go there, yet I believed that resignation was now called for in that respect. Feeling a danger of not being wholly devoted to Him, I was frequently engaged to watch into prayer that I might be preserved, and upwards of a year having passed, as I one day walked in a solitary wood, my mind being covered with awfulness, cries were raised in me to my merciful Father that He would graciously keep me in faithfulness, and it then settled on my mind as a duty to open my condition to friends at our monthly meeting, which I did soon after as follows. An exercise hath attended me for some times past, and of late hath been more weighty upon me, which is, that I believe it is required of me to be resigned to go on a visit to some parts of the West Indies. In the quarterly and general spring meetings, I found no clearness to express anything further than that I believed resignation herein was required of me. Having obtained certificates from all the said meetings, I felt like a sojourner at my outward habitation and kept free from worldly encumbrances, and I was often bowed in spirit before the Lord, with inward breathings to Him that I might be rightly directed. I may here note that the circumstance before related of my having, when young, joined with another executor in selling a negro lad till he might attain the age of thirty years, was now the cause of much sorrow to me and after having settled matters relating to this youth i provided a sea-store and bed and things for the voyage hearing of a vessel likely to sail from philadelphia for barbados i spake with one of the owners at burlington and soon after went to philadelphia on purpose to speak to him again he told me there was a friend in town who was part owner of the said vessel 
I felt no inclination to speak with the latter, but returned home. A while after, I took leave of my family, and, going to Philadelphia, had some weighty conversation with the first-mentioned owner, and showed him a writing as follows. On the 25th of 11th month, 1769, as an exercise with respect to a visit to Barbados hath been weighty on my mind, I may express some of the trials which have attended me, under which I have at times rejoiced that I have felt my own self-will subjected. Some years ago I retailed rum, sugar, and molasses, the fruits of the labor of slaves, but had not then much concern about them, save only that the rum might be used in moderation. Nor was this concern so weightily attended to as I now believe it ought to have been. Having of late years been further informed respecting the oppressions too generally exercised in these islands, and thinking often on the dangers that are in connection of interest, and fellowship with the works of darkness, Ephesians 5.2, I have felt an increasing concern to be wholly given up to the leadings of the Holy Spirit, and it hath seemed right that my small gain from this branch of trade should be applied in promoting righteousness on the earth. This was the first motion towards a visit to Barbados. I believed also that part of my outward substance should be applied in paying my passage if I went, and providing things in a lowly way for my subsistence. But when the time drew near, in which I believed it required of me to be in readiness, a difficulty arose which hath been a continual trial for some months past, under which I have, with abasement of mind from day to day, sought the Lord for instruction, having often had a feeling of the condition of one formerly, who bewailed himself because the Lord hid his face from him. During these exercises my heart hath often been contrite, and I have had a tender feeling of the temptations of my fellow creatures, laboring under expensive customs not agreeable to the simplicity that there is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 2, 3. And sometimes in the renewings of gospel love I have been helped to minister to others. That which hath so closely engaged my mind in seeking to the Lord for instruction, is whether, after the full information I have had of the oppression which the slaves lie under who raise the West India produce, which I have gained by reading a caution and warning to Great Britain and her colonies, written by Anthony Menezet, it is right for me to take passage in a vessel employed in the West India trade. To trade freely with oppressors without laboring to dissuade them from such unkind treatment and to seek for gain by such traffic tends, I believe, to make them more easy respecting their conduct than they would be if the cause of universal righteousness was humbly and firmly attended to by those in general with whom they have commerce. And that complaint of the Lord by his prophet, they have strengthened the hands of the wicked, hath very often revived in my mind. I may here add some circumstances which occurred to me before I had any prospect of a visit there. David longed for some water in a well beyond an army of Philistines who were at war with Israel, and some of his men, to please him, ventured their lives in passing through this army, and brought that water. It doth not appear that the Israelites were then scarce of water, but rather that David gave way to delicacy of taste and having reflected on the danger to which these men had been exposed, he considered this water as their blood, and his heart smote him that he could not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord. The oppression of the slaves, which I have seen in several journeys southward on this continent, and the report of their treatment in the West Indies, have deeply affected me, and a care to live in the spirit of peace and minister no just cause of offense to my fellow creatures, having from time to time livingly revived in my mind, I have for some years past declined to gratify my palate with those sugars. I do not censure my brethren in these things, but I believe the Father of mercies, to whom all mankind by creation are equally related, hath heard the groans of this oppressed people, 
and that he is preparing some to have a tender feeling of their condition. Trading in or the frequent use of any produce known to be raised by the labor of those who are under such lamentable oppression hath appeared to be a subject which may hereafter require the more serious consideration of the humble followers of Christ, the Prince of Peace. After long and mournful exercise, I am now free to mention how things have opened in my mind, with desires that, if it may please the Lord further, to open his will to any of his children in this matter, that they may faithfully follow him in such further manifestation. The number of those who decline the use of West India produce, on account of the hard usage of the slaves who raise it, appears small, even among people truly pious and the labors in Christian love on that subject of those who do are not very extensive. Were the trade from this continent to the West Indies to be stopped at once, I believe many there would suffer for want of bread. Did we on this continent and the inhabitants of the West Indies generally dwell in pure righteousness? I believe a small trade between us might be right. Under these considerations, when the thoughts of wholly declining the use of trading vessels, and of trying to hire a vessel to go under ballast have arisen in my mind, I have believed that the laborers in gospel love hitherto bestowed in the cause of universal righteousness have not reached that height. If the trade to the West Indies were no more than was consistent with pure wisdom, I believe the passage money would for good reasons be higher than it is now and therefore, under deep exercise of mind, I have believed that I should not take advantage of this great trade and small passage money, but, as a testimony in favor of less trading, should pay more than is common for others to pay if I go at this time. The first mentioned owner, having read the paper, went with me to the other owner, who also read over the paper, and we had some solid conversation under which I felt myself bowed in reverence before the Most High. At length one of them asked me if I would go and see the vessel. But not having clearness in my mind to go, I went to my lodging and retired in private under great exercise of mind. And my tears were poured out before the Lord with inward cries that He would graciously help me under these trials. I believe my mind was resigned but I did not feel clearness to proceed, and my own weakness and the necessity of divine instruction were impressed upon me. I was for a time as one who knew not what to do and was tossed as in a tempest, under which affliction the doctrine of Christ, take no thought for the morrow, rose livingly before me, and I was favored to get into a good degree of stillness. Having been near two days in town, I believed my obedience to my Heavenly Father consisted in returning homeward. I therefore went over among friends on the Jersey shore, and tarried till the morning on which the vessel was appointed to sail. As I lay in bed the latter part of that night, my mind was comforted, and I felt what I esteemed a fresh confirmation that it was the Lord's will that I should pass through some further exercises near home. So I went thither, and still felt like a sojourner with my family. In the fresh spring of pure love, I had some labors in a private way among friends on a subject relating to truth's testimony, under which I had frequently been exercised in heart for some years. I remember, as I walked on the road under this exercise, that passage in Ezekiel came fresh upon me, whithersoever their faces were turned thither they went, and I was graciously helped to discharge my duty in the fear and dread of the Almighty. In the course of a few weeks it pleased the Lord to visit me with a pleurisy, and after I had lain a few days and felt the disorder very grievous, I was thoughtful how it might end. I had of late, through various exercises, been much weaned from the pleasant things of this life and I now thought if it were the Lord's will to put an end to my labors and graciously to receive me into the arms of His mercy, death would be acceptable to me. But if it were His will further to refine me under affliction 
and to make me in any degree useful to his church, I desired not to die. I may with thankfulness say that in this case I felt resignedness wrought in me and had no inclination to send for a doctor, believing, if it were the Lord's will, through outward means to raise me up, some sympathizing friends would be sent to minister to me, which accordingly was the case. But though I was carefully attended, yet the disorder was at times so heavy that I had no expectation of recovery. One night in particular my bodily distress was great. My feet grew cold, and the cold increased up my legs towards my body. At that time I had no inclination to ask my nurse to apply anything warm to my feet, expecting my end was near. After I had lain near ten hours in this condition, I closed my eyes, thinking whether I might now be delivered out of the body. But in these awful moments my mind was livingly opened to behold the church, and strong engagements were begotten in me for the everlasting well-being of my fellow creatures. I felt in the spring of pure love that I might remain some time longer in the body to fill up, according to my measure, that which remains of the afflictions of Christ, and to labor for the good of the church, after which I requested my nurse to apply warmth to my feet, and I revived. The next night, feeling a weighty exercise of spirit, and having a solid friend sitting up with me, I requested him to write what I said, which he did as follows. Fourth day of the first month, 1770, about five in the morning. I have seen in the light of the Lord that the day is approaching when the man that is most wise in human policy shall be the greatest fool, and the arm that is mighty to support injustice shall be broken to pieces. The enemies of righteousness shall make a terrible rattle and shall mightily torment one another. For he that is omnipotent is rising up to judgment and will plead the cause of the oppressed. And he commanded me to open the vision. Near a week after this, feeling my mind livingly opened, I sent for a neighbor who, at my request, wrote as follows. The place of prayer is a precious habitation, for I now saw that the prayers of the saints were precious incense, and a trumpet was given to me that I might sound forth this language, that the children might hear it and be invited together to this precious habitation, where the prayers of the saints, as sweet incense, arise before the throne of God and the Lamb. I saw this habitation to be safe, to be inwardly quiet, when there were great stirrings and commotions in the world. Prayer at this day, in pure resignation, is a precious place. The trumpet is sounded, the call goes forth to the church that she gather to the place of pure inward prayer, and her habitation is safe. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wayne Cook. Having been some time under a religious concern to prepare for crossing the seas in order to visit friends in the northern parts of England, and more particularly in Yorkshire, after consideration, I thought it expedient to inform friends of it at our monthly meeting at Burlington, who, having unity with me therein, gave me a certificate. I afterwards communicated the same to our quarterly meeting, and they likewise certified their concurrence. Some time after, at the general spring meeting of ministers and elders, I thought it my duty to acquaint them with the religious exercise which attended my mind and they likewise signified their unity therewith by a certificate dated 24th of 3rd month, 1772, directed to friends in Great Britain. In the fourth month following, I thought the time was come for me to make some inquiry for a suitable conveyance, and as my concern was principally towards the northern parts of England, 
it seemed most proper to go in a vessel bound to Liverpool or Whitehaven. While I was at Philadelphia deliberating on this subject, I was informed that my beloved friend Samuel Emlyn, Jr., intended to go to London, and had taken a passage for himself in the cabin of the ship called the Mary and Elizabeth, of which James Sparks was master, and John Head, of the city of Philadelphia, one of the owners. And feeling a draft in my mind towards the steerage of the same ship, I went first and opened to Samuel the feeling I had concerning it. My beloved friend wept when I spake to him, and appeared glad that I had thoughts of going in the vessel with him, though my prospect was toward the steerage and he offering to go with me, we went on board, first into the cabin, a commodious room, and then into the steerage, where we sat down on a chest, the sailors being busy about us. The owner of the ship also came and sat down with us. My mind was turned towards Christ the heavenly counsellor, and feeling at this time my own will subjected, my heart was contrite before him. A motion was made by the owner to go and sit in the cabin, as a place more retired. But I felt easy to leave the ship, and, making no agreement as to a passage in her, told the owner if I took a passage in the ship, I believed it would be in the steerage, but did not say much as to my exercise in that case. After I went to my lodgings, and the case was a little known in town, a friend laid before me the great inconvenience attending a passage in the steerage, which for a time appeared very discouraging to me. I soon after went to bed, and my mind was under a deep exercise before the Lord, whose helping hand was manifested to me as I slept that night, and his love strengthened my heart. In the morning I went with two friends on board the vessel again, and after a short time spent therein, I went with Samuel Emlyn to the house of the owner, to whom, in the hearing of Samuel only, I opened my exercise in relation to a scruple I felt with regard to a passage in the cabin, the substance as follows, that on the outside of that part of the ship where the cabin was, I observed sundry sorts of carved work and imagery, that in the cabin I observed some superfluity of workmanship of several sorts, and that according to the ways of men's reckoning, the sum of money to be paid for a passage in that apartment has some relation to the expense of furnishing it to please the minds of such as give way to a conformity to this world, and that in this, as in other cases, the monies received from the passengers are calculated to defray the cost of these superfluities, as well as the other expenses of their passage. I therefore felt a scruple with regard to paying my money to be applied to such purposes. As my mind was now opened, I told the owner that I had, at several times in my travels, seen great oppressions on this continent, at which my heart had been much affected, and brought into a feeling of the state of the sufferers and having many times been engaged in the fear and love of God to labor with those under whom the oppressed have been borne down and afflicted, I have often perceived that with a view to get riches and to provide estates for children, that they may live comfortably to the customs and honors of this world, many are entangled in the spirit of oppression, and the exercise of my soul had been such that I could not find peace in joining in anything which I saw was against that wisdom which is pure. After this I agreed for a passage in the steerage, and hearing that Joseph White had desired to see me, I went to his house, and the next day home where I tarried two nights. Early the next morning I parted with my family, under a sense of the humbling hand of God upon me, and, going to Philadelphia, had an opportunity with several of my beloved friends, who appeared to be concerned for me on account of the unpleasant situation of that part of the vessel in which I was likely to lodge. In these opportunities my mind, through the mercies of the Lord, was kept low in an inward waiting for his help, and friends, having expressed their desire that I might have a more convenient place than the steerage, did not urge it 
but appeared disposed to leave me to the Lord. Having stayed two nights in Philadelphia, I went the next day to Derby Monthly Meeting, where through the strength of divine love, my heart was enlarged towards the youth there present, under which I was helped to labor in some tenderness of spirit. I lodged at William Horne's, and afterwards went to Chester, where I met with Samuel Emlyn, and we went on board first of fifth month, 1772. As I sat alone on the deck, I felt a satisfactory evidence that my proceedings were not in my own will, but under the power of the cross of Christ. Seventh of Fifth Month We have had rough weather mostly since I came on board, and the passengers, James Reynolds, John Till Adams, Sarah Logan and her hired maid, and John Bispin, all seasick at times, from which sickness, through the tender mercies of my Heavenly Father, I have been preserved, my afflictions now being of another kind. There appeared an openness in the minds of the master of the ship and in the cabin passengers towards me. We are often together on the deck and sometimes in the cabin. My mind, through the merciful help of the Lord, hath been preserved in a good degree watchful and quiet, for which I have great cause to be thankful." As my lodging in the steerage, now near a week, hath afforded me sundry opportunities of seeing, hearing, and feeling with respect to the life and spirit of many poor sailors, an exercise of soul hath attended me in regard to placing our children and youth where they may be likely to be exampled and instructed in the pure fear of the Lord. Being much among the seamen I have, from a motion of love, taken sundry opportunities with one of them at a time, and have in free conversation labored to turn their minds toward the fear of the Lord. This day we had a meeting in the cabin, where my heart was contrite under a feeling of divine love. I believe a communication with different parts of the world by sea is at times consistent with the will of our Heavenly Father, and to educate some youth in the practice of sailing I believe may be right. But how lamentable is the present corruption of the world! How impure are the channels through which trade is conducted! How great is the danger to which poor lads are exposed when placed on shipboard to learn the art of sailing! Five lads, training up for the seas, were on board this ship. Two of them were brought up in our society, and the other, by name James Naylor, is a member, to whose father, James Naylor, mentioned in Sewell's history, appears to have been uncle. I often feel a tenderness of heart toward these poor lads, and at times look at them as though they were my children according to the flesh. Oh, that all may take heed and beware of covetedness! Oh, that all may learn of Christ, who was meek and lowly of heart! Then, in faithfully following him, he will teach us to be content with food and raiment without respect to the customs or honors of this world. Men thus redeemed will feel a tender concern for their fellow creatures and a desire that those in the lowest stations may be assisted and encouraged and where owners of ships attain to the perfect law of liberty and are doers of the word, these will be blessed in their deeds. A ship at sea commonly sails all night, and the seamen take their watches four hours at a time. Rising to work in the night is not commonly pleasant in any case, but in dark rainy nights it is very disagreeable, even though each man was furnished with all conveniences. If, after having been on deck several hours in the night, they come down into the steerage soaking wet, and are so closely stowed that proper convenience for change of garments is not easily come at, but for want of proper room, their wet garments are thrown in heaps, and sometimes, through much crowding, are trodden underfoot in going to their lodgings and getting out of them, and it is difficult at times for each to find his own. Here are the trials for the poor sailors. Now, as I have been with them in my lodge, my heart hath often yearned for them, and tender desires have been raised in me that all owners and masters of vessels may dwell in the love of God, and therein act uprightly, and by seeking less for gain, 
and looking carefully to their ways that they may earnestly labor to remove all cause of provocation with the poor seamen so that they may neither fret nor use excess of strong drink for indeed the poor creatures in the wet and cold seem to apply at times to strong drink to supply the want of other convenience great reformation is wanting in the world and the necessity of it among those who do business on great waters hath at this time been abundantly opened before me eighth of fifth month this morning the clouds gathered the wind blew strong from the southeast and before noon so increased that sailing appeared dangerous the seamen then bound out some of their sails and took down others and the storm increasing, they put the dead light, so called, into the cabin windows and lighted a lamp as at night. The wind now blew vehemently, and the sea wrought to that degree that an awful seriousness prevailed in the cabin, in which I spent, I believe, about seventeen hours, for the cabin passengers had given me frequent invitations, and I thought the poor, wet, toiling seamen had need of all the room in the crowded steerage. They now ceased from sailing, and put the vessel in the posture called lying to my mind during this tempest through the gracious assistance of the lord was preserved in a good degree of resignation and at times i expressed a few words in his love to my shipmates in regard to the all-sufficiency of him who formed the great deep and whose care is so extensive that a sparrow falls not without his notice and thus in a tender frame of mind i spoke to them of the necessity of our yielding in true obedience to the instructions of our heavenly father who sometimes through adversities intendeth our refinement about eleven at night i went out on the deck the sea wrought exceedingly and the high foaming waves round about had in some sort the appearance of fire but did not give much if any light the sailor at the helm said he lately saw a corpusant at the head of the mast. I observed that the master of the ship ordered the carpenter to keep on the deck, and, though he said little, I apprehended his care was that the carpenter with his axe might be in readiness in case of any emergency. Soon after this the vehemency of the wind abated, and before morning they again put the ship under sail. Tenth of Fifth Month it being the first day of the week and fine weather, we had a meeting in the cabin, at which most of the seamen were present. This meeting was to me a strengthening time. Thirteenth. As I continue to lodge in the steerage, I feel an openness this morning to express something further of the state of my mind in respect to poor lads bound apprentice to learn the art of sailing. As I believe sailing is of use in the world, a labor of soul attends me that the pure counsel of truth may be humbly waited for in this case by all concerned in the business of the seas a pious father whose mind is exercised for the everlasting welfare of his child may not with a peaceable mind place him out to an employment among a people whose common course of life is manifestly corrupt and profane great is the present defect among the seafaring men in regard to virtue and piety and by reason of an abundant traffic and many ships being used for war, so many people are employed on the sea that the subject of placing lads to this employment appears very weighty. When I remember the saying of the Most High through his prophet, This people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise, and think of placing children among such to learn the practice of sailing, the consistency of it with a pious education seems to me like that mentioned by the prophet, there is no answer from God. Profane examples are very corrupting and very forcible, and as my mind day after day and night after night hath been affected with a sympathizing tenderness toward poor children who are put to the employment of sailors, I have sometimes had weighty conversation with the sailors in the steerage who were mostly respectful to me and became more so the longer I was with them. They mostly appeared to take kindly what I said to them, but their minds were so deeply impressed with the almost universal depravity among sailors that the poor creatures in their answers to me have revived in my remembrance 
that of the degenerate Jew a little before the captivity, as repeateth by Jeremiah the prophet, there is no hope. Now under this exercise, a sense of the desire of outward gain prevailing among us felt grievous, and a strong call to the professed followers of Christ was raised in me that all may take heed, lest, through loving this present world, they be found in a continued neglect of duty with respect to a faithful labor for reformation. To silence every motion proceeding from the love of money, and humbly to wait upon God to know His will concerning us, have appeared necessary. He alone is able to strengthen us to dig deep, to remove all which lies between us and the safe foundation, and so to direct us in our outward employments that pure universal love may shine forth in our proceedings. Desires arising from the spirit of truth are pure desires, and when a mind divinely open towards a young generation is made sensible of corrupting examples powerfully working and extensively spreading among them, how moving is the prospect. In a world of dangers and difficulties, like a desolate, thorny wilderness, how precious, how comfortable, how safe are the leadings of Christ, the Good Shepherd, who said, I know my sheep and have known of mine. Sixteenth of sixth, or perhaps fifth, month. Wind for several days past, often high, what the sailors call squally, with a rough sea and frequent rains. This last night has been a very trying one to the poor seamen, the water the most part of the night running over the main deck, and sometimes breaking waves came on the quarter-deck. The latter part of the night, as I lay in bed, my mind was humbled under the power of divine love, and resignedness to the great creator of the earth and the seas was renewedly brought in me, and his fatherly care over his children felt precious to my soul. I was now desirous to embrace every opportunity of being inwardly acquainted with the hardships and difficulties of my fellow creatures, and to labor in his love for the spreading of pure righteousness on the earth. Opportunities were frequent of hearing conversation among the sailors respecting voyages to Africa and the manner of bringing the deeply oppressed slaves into our islands. They are frequently brought on board the vessels and changed in fetters, with hearts loaded with grief under the apprehension of miserable slavery, so that my mind was frequently engaged to meditate on these things. Seventeenth of fifth month and first of the week. We had a meeting in the cabin to which the seamen generally came. My spirit was contrite before the Lord, whose love at this time affected my heart. In the afternoon I felt a tender sympathy of soul with my poor wife and family left behind, in which state my heart was enlarged in desires that they may walk in that humble obedience wherein the everlasting Father may be their guide and support through all their difficulties in this world. And a sense of that gracious assistance through which my mind hath been strengthened to take up the cross and leave them to travel in the love of truth hath begotten thankfulness in my heart to our great helper. 24th of fifth month. A clear, pleasant morning. As I sat on deck, I felt a reviving in my nature, which had been weakened through much rainy weather and high winds, and being shut up in a close, unhealthy air. Several nights of late I have felt my breathing difficult, and a little after the rising of the second watch, which is about midnight, I have got up and stood near an hour with my face near the hatchway to get the fresh air at the small vacancy under the hatch door, which is commonly shut down, partly to keep out rain and sometimes to keep the breaking waves from dashing into the steerage. I may with thankfulness to the Father of mercies acknowledge that in my present weak state my mind has been supported to bear this affliction with patience. And I have looked at the present dispensation as a kindness from the great Father of mankind, who, in this my floating pilgrimage, 
is in some degree bringing me to feel what many thousands of my fellow creatures often suffer in a greater degree. My appetite failing, the trial hath been the heavier, and I have felt tender breathings in my soul after God, the fountain of comfort, whose inward help hath supplied at times the want of outward convenience. And strong desires have attended me that his family, who are acquainted with the movings of his Holy Spirit, may be so redeemed from the love of money and from that spirit in which men seek honor one of another, that in all business, by sea or land, they may constantly keep in view the coming of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and by faithfully following this safe guide, may show forth examples tending to lead out of that under which the creation groans. This day we had a meeting in the cabin, in which I was favored in some degree to experience the fulfilling of that saying of the prophet, The Lord hath been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in their distress, for which my heart is bowed in thankfulness before him. 28th of 5th month wet weather of late and small winds inclining to calms. Our seamen cast a lead, I suppose about one hundred fathoms, but found no bottom. Foggy weather this morning. Through the kindness of the great preserver of men, my mind remains quiet, and a degree of exercise from day to day attends me, that the pure peaceful government of Christ may spread and prevail among mankind. The leading of a young generation in that pure way in which the wisdom of this world hath no place, where parents and tutors, humbly waiting for the heavenly counselor, may example them in the truth that is in Jesus, hath for several days been the exercise of my mind. Oh, how safe, how quiet, is that state where the soul stands in pure obedience to the voice of Christ, and a watchful care is maintained not to follow the voice of the stranger. Here Christ is felt to be our shepherd, and under his leading people are brought to a stability, and where he doth not lead forward, we are bound in the bonds of pure love to stand still and wait upon him. In the love of money and in the wisdom of this world, business is proposed. Then the urgency of affairs push forward, and the mind cannot in this state discern the good and perfect will of God concerning us, the love of God is manifested in graciously calling us to come out of that which stands in confusion. But if we bow not in the name of Jesus, if we give not up those prospects of gain which, in the wisdom of this world, are open before us, but say in our hearts, I must needs go on, and in going on I hope to keep as near the purity of truth as the business before me will admit of, the mind remains entangled, and the shining of the light of life into the soul is obstructed. Surely the Lord calls to mourning and deep humiliation, that in his fear we may be instructed and led safely through the great difficulties and perplexities of this present age. In an entire subjection of our wills, the Lord graciously opens a way for his people, where all their wants are bounded by his wisdom. And here we experience the substance of what Moses the prophet figured out in the water of separation as a purification from sin. Esau is mentioned as a child red all over like a hairy garment. In Esau is represented the natural will of man. In preparing the water of separation, a red heifer without blemish, on which there had been no yoke, was to be slain and her blood sprinkled by the priest seven times towards the tabernacle of the congregation. Then her skin, her flesh, and all pertaining to her was to be burnt without the camp, and of her ashes the water was prepared. Thus the crucifying of the old man, or natural will, is represented, and hence comes a separation from that carnal mind, which is death. He who toucheth the dead body of a man, and purifieth not himself with the water of separation, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. He is unclean. Numbers 19.13
If any, through the love of gain, engage in business wherein they dwell, as among the tombs, and touch the bodies of those who are dead, should, through the infinite love of God, feel the power of the cross of Christ to crucify them to the world, and therein to learn humbly to follow the divine leader, here is the judgment of this world, here the prince of this world is cast out. The water of separation is felt, and though we have been among the slain, and through the desire of gain have touched the dead body of a man, yet in the purifying love of Christ we are washed away in the water of separation. We are brought off from that business, from that gain, and from that fellowship which is not agreeable to his holy will. I have felt a renewed confirmation in the time of this voyage that the Lord, in his infinite love, is calling to his visited children, so to give up all outwardly possessions and means of getting treasures, that his Holy Spirit may have free course in their hearts and direct them in all their proceedings. To feel the substance pointed out in this figure, man must know death as to his own will. No man can see God and live. This was spoken by the Almighty to Moses the prophet, and opened by our blessed Redeemer. As death comes on our own wills, and a new life is formed in us, the heart is purified, prepared to understand clearly, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In purity of heart the mind is divinely opened to behold the nature of universal righteousness, or the righteousness of the kingdom of God. No man hath seen the Father, save he that is of God. He hath seen the Father. The natural mind is active about the things of this life, and in this natural activity business is proposed, and a will is formed in us to go forward in it. And so long as this natural will remains unsubjected, so long as there remains an obstruction to the clearness of divine light operating in us, but when we love God, with all our heart and with all our strength. In this love we love our neighbors ourselves, and a tenderness of heart is felt towards all people for whom Christ died, even those who, as to outward circumstances, may be to us as the Jews were to the Samaritans. Who is my neighbor? See this question answered by our Savior, Luke ten thirty. In this love we can say that Jesus is the Lord, and in this reformation in our souls, manifested in a full reformation of our lives, wherein all things are new, and all things are of God, Second Corinthians 5.18, the desire of gain is subjected. When employment is honestly followed in the light of truth, and people become diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, Romans 12.11, the meaning of the name is opened to us. This is the name by which he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Oh, how precious is this name. It is like ointment poured out. The chaste virgins are in love with the Redeemer, and for promoting his peaceable kingdom in the world, we are content to endure hardness like good soldiers and are so separated in spirit from the desire of riches that in their employments they become extensively careful to give no offense, either to Jew or heathen, or to the Church of Christ. 31st, 5th month, and 1st of the week. We had a meeting in the cabin with nearly all the ship's company, the whole being nearer thirty. In this meeting the Lord in mercy favored us with extending of his love. Second of six month. Last evening the seamen found a bottom at about seventy fathoms. This morning a fair wind and pleasant. I sat on deck. My heart was overcome with the love of Christ, and melted into contrition before him. In this state the prospect of that work to which I found my mind drawn in my native land being, in some degree, opened before me, I felt like a little child and my cries were put up to my heavenly Father for preservation, that in an humble dependence on him my soul might be strengthened in his love and kept inwardly waiting for his counsel.
This afternoon we saw that part of England called the Lizard. Some fowls yet remained of those passengers took for their sea store. I believe about fourteen perished in the storms at sea, by the waves breaking over the quarter-deck, and a considerable number with sickness at different times. I observed the cock's crew as we came down the Delaware, and while we were near the land, but afterwards I think I did not hear one of them crow till we came near the English coast, where they again crowed a few times. And observing their dull appearance at sea, and the pining sickness of some of them, I often remembered the fountain of goodness, who gave being to all creatures, and whose love extends to caring for the sparrows. I believe where the love of God is very perfected, and the true spirit of government watchfully attended to, a tenderness towards all creatures, made subject to us, will be experienced, and a care felt in us that we do not lessen that sweetness of life in the animal creation which the great Creator intends for them under our government. Fourth of Sixth Month Wet weather, high winds, and so dark that we could see but a little way. I perceived our seamen were apprehensive of the dangers of missing the channel, which I understood was narrow. In a while it grew lighter, and they saw the land and knew where we were. Thus the Father of Mercies was pleased to try us with the sight of dangers, and then graciously, from time to time, deliver us from them. Thus sparing our lives, that in humility and reverence we might walk before him and put our trust in him. About noon a pilot came off from Dover, where my beloved friend Samuel Emlyn went on shore and thence to London, about seventy-two miles by land, but I felt easy in staying in the ship. Seventh of sixth month and first of the week. A clear morning, we lay at anchor for the tide, and had a parting meeting with the ship's company, in which my heart was enlarged in a fervent concern for them, that they may come to experience salvation through Christ. Had a headwind up the Thames, lay sometimes at anchor, saw many ships passing and some at anchor near. I had large opportunity of feeling the spirit in which the poor bewildered sailors too generally live, that lamentable degeneracy which so much prevails in the people employed on the seas so affected my heart that I cannot easily convey the feeling I had to another. The present state of the seafaring life in general appears so opposite to that of a pious education, so full of corruption and extreme alienation from God, so full of the most dangerous examples to young people that in looking towards a young generation I feel a care for them, that they may have an education different from the present ones of lads at sea, and that all of us who are acquainted with the pure gospel spirit may lay this case to heart, may remember the lamentable corruptions which attend the conveyance of merchandise across the seas, and so abide in the love of Christ that, being delivered from the entangling expenses of a curious, delicate, and luxurious life, we may learn contentment with a little and promote the seafaring life no further than that spirit which leads into all truth attends us in our proceedings. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wayne Cook. On the 8th of 6th month, 1772, we landed at London, and I went straightway to the yearly meeting of ministers and elders, which had been gathered, I suppose, about half an hour. Footnote. There is a story told of his first appearance in England, which I have from my friend William J. Allenson, editor of the Friends Review, and which he assures me is well authenticated. The vessel reached London on the morning of the fifth day of the week, and John Woolman, knowing that the meeting was then in session, lost no time in reaching it. Coming in late and unannounced, his peculiar dress and manner excited attention and apprehension that he was an itinerant enthusiast. He presented his certificate from Friends in America, 
but the dissatisfaction still remained, and someone remarked that perhaps the stranger friend might feel that his dedication of himself to his apprehended service was accepted without further labor, and that he might now feel free to return to his home. John Woman sat silent for a space, seeking the unerring counsel of divine wisdom. He was profoundly affected by the unfavorable reception he met with, and his tears flowed freely. In the love of Christ and his fellow men he had, at a painful sacrifice, taken his life in his hands, and left behind the peace and endearments of home. That love still flowed out toward the people of England, must it henceforth be pent up in his own heart? He rose at last, and stated that he could not feel himself released from his prospect of labor in England, yet he could not travel in the ministry without the unity of friends, and while that was withheld, he could not feel easy to be of any cost to them. He could not go back, as had been suggested, but he was acquainted with the mechanical trade, and while the impediment to his services continued, he hoped friends would be kindly willing to employ him in such business as he was capable of, that he might not be chargeable to any. A deep silence prevailed over the assembly, many of whom were touched by the wise simplicity of the stranger's words and manner. After a season of waiting, John Woolman felt that words were given him to utter as a minister of Christ. The spirit of his master bore witness to them in the hearts of his hearers. When he closed, the friend who had advised against his further service rose up and humbly confessed his error and avowed his full unity with the stranger. All doubt was removed. There was a general expression of unity and sympathy, and John Woolman, owned by his brethren, passed on to his work. There is no portrait of John Woolman, and had photography been known in his day, it is not at all probable that the sun artist would have been permitted to delineate his features. That, while eschewing all superfluity and expensive luxury, he was scrupulously neat in his dress and person may be inferred from his general character, and from the fact that one of his serious objections to dyed clothing was that it served to conceal uncleanliness, and was, therefore, detrimental to real purity. It is, however, quite probable that his outer man, on the occasion referred to, was suggestive of a hasty toilette in the crowded steerage. Note from the edition published by Messrs. Houghton, Mifflin, and Company. End of footnote. In this meeting my mind was humbly contrite. In the afternoon the meeting for business was opened, which by adjournments held near a week. In these meetings I often felt a living concern for the establishment of friends in the pure life of truth. My heart was enlarged in the meetings of ministers, that for business and in several meetings for public worship, and I felt my mind united in true love to the faithful laborers now gathered at this yearly meeting. On the 15th I went to a quarterly meeting in Hartford. First of Seventh Month I have been at quarterly meetings at Sherrington, Northampton, Branbury, and Shipton, and have had sundry meetings between. My mind has been bowed under a sense of divine goodness manifested among us. My heart hath been often enlarged in true love, both among ministers and elders, and in public meetings, and through the Lord's goodness I believe it hath been a fresh visitation to many, in particular to the youth. Seventeenth. I was this day at Birmingham. I have been at meetings at Coventry, Warwick, in Oxfordshire, and sundry other places, and have felt the humbling hand of the Lord upon me. But through his tender mercies I find peace in the labors I have gone through. Twenty-sixth. I have continued traveling northward, visiting meetings. Was this day in Nottingham, the forenoon meeting was especially, through divine love, a heart-tendering season. Next day I had a meeting in a friend's family, which, through the strengthening arm of the Lord, was a time to be thankfully remembered. 
second of eighth month and first of the week. I was this day at Sheffield, a large inland town. I was at sundry meetings last week and felt inward thankfulness for that divine support which hath been graciously extended to me. On the ninth I was at Rushworth. I have lately passed through some painful labor, but have been comforted under a sense of that divine visitation which I feel extended towards many young people. Sixteenth of eighth month and the first of the week. I was at Settle. It hath of late been a time of inward poverty, under which my mind hath been preserved in a watchful tender state, feeling for the mind of the holy leader, and I find peace in the labors I have passed through. On inquiry in many places, I find the price of rye about five shillings, wheat eight shillings per bushel, oatmeal twelve shillings for a hundred and twenty pounds, muttons from threepence to fivepence per pound, bacon from sevenpence to ninepence, cheese from fourpence to sixpence, butter from eightpence to tenpence, house rent for a poor man from twenty-five shillings to forty shillings per year to be paid weekly, wood for fire very scarce and dear, coal in some places two shillings and sixpence per hundredweight, but near the pits not a quarter so much. Oh, may the wealthy consider the poor. The wages of laboring men in several counties toward London at tenpence per day in common business, the employer finds small beer, and the laborer finds his own food. But in harvest and hay time, wages are about one shilling per day, and the laborer hath all his diet. In some parts of the north of England, poor laboring men have their food where they work, and appear in common to do rather better than nearer London. Industrious women who spin in the factories get some fourpence, some fivepence, and so on to six, seven, eight, nine, or tenpence per day, and find their own house, room, and diet. Great numbers of poor people live chiefly on bread and water in the southern parts of England, as well as in the northern parts and there are many poor children not even taught to read. May those who have abundance lay these things to heart. Stagecoaches frequently go upwards of 100 miles in 24 hours, and I have heard friends say in several places that it is common for horses to be killed with hard driving, and that many others are driven till they grow blind. Postboys pursue their business, each one to his stage, all night through the winter. Some boys who ride long stages suffer greatly in the winter nights, and at several places I have heard of their being frozen to death. So great is the hurry in the spirit of this world that in aiming to do business quickly and to gain wealth, the creation at this day doth loudly groan. As my journey hath been without a horse, I have had several offers of being assisted on my way in these stagecoaches, but have not been in them, nor have I had freedom to send letters by these posts at the present way of writing, the stages being so fixed, and one boy dependent on another as to time, and going at great speed, that in long cold winter nights the poor boys suffer much. I heard in America of the way of these posts and cautioned friends in the gentle meeting of ministers and elders at Philadelphia, and in the yearly meeting of ministers and elders in London, not to send letters to me on any common occasion by post. And, though on this account I may be likely not to hear so often from my family left behind, yet for righteousness' sake I am, through divine favor, made content. I have felt great distress of mind since I came on this island, on account of the members of our society being mixed with the world in various sorts of traffic, carried on in impure channels. Great is the trade to Africa for slaves, and for the loading of these ships a great number of people are employed in their factories, among whom are many of our society. 
friends in early times refused on a religious principle to make or trade in superfluities of which we have many testimonies on record but for want of faithfulness some whose examples were of note in our society gave way from which others took more liberty members of our society worked in superfluities and bought and sold them and thus dimness of sight came over many at length friends got into the use of some superfluities in dress and in the furniture of their houses which hath spread from less to more till superfluity of some kinds is common among us in this declining state many look at the example of others and to much neglect the pure feelings of truth of late years a deep exercise hath attended my mind that friends may dig deep may carefully cast forth the loose matter and get down to the rock the sure foundation and there hearken to that divine voice which gives a clear and certain sound and i have felt in that which doth not receive that if friends who have known the truth keep in that tenderness of heart where all views of outward gain are given up and their trust is only in the lord he will graciously lead some to be patterns of deep self-denial in things relating to trade and handicraft labor and others who have plenty of the treasures of this world will be examples of a plain frugal life and to pay wages to such as they may hire more liberally than is now customary in some places twenty-third of eighth month i was this day at preston patrick and had a comfortable meeting i have several times been entertained at the houses of friends who had sundry things about them that had the appearance of outward greatness and as i have kept inward way hath opened for conversation with such in private in which divine goodness hath favoured us together with heart tendering times twenty sixth of eighth month being now at george crossfields in the county of westmoreland i feel a concern to commit to writing the following uncommon circumstance in a time of sickness a little more than two years and a half ago i was brought so near the gates of death that i forgot my name being then desirous to know who i was i saw a mass of matter of a dull gloomy color between the south and the east and was informed that this mass was human beings in as great misery as they could be and live and that i was mixed with them and that henceforth i might not consider myself as a distinct or separate being in this state i remained several hours i then heard a soft melodious voice more pure and harmonious than any i had heard with my ears before i believed it was the voice of an angel who spake to the other angels the words were john woolman is dead i soon remembered that i was once john woolman and being assured that i was alive in the body i greatly wondered what that heavenly voice could mean i believed beyond doubting that it was the voice of an holy angel but as yet it was a mystery to me i was then carried in spirit to the mines where poor oppressed people were digging rich treasures for those called christians and heard them blaspheme the name of christ at which i was grieved for his name to me was precious i was then informed that these heathens were told that those who oppressed them were the followers of christ and they said among themselves if christ directed them to use us in this sort then christ is a cruel tyrant all this time the song of the angel remained a mystery and in the morning my dear wife and some others coming to my bedside i asked them if they knew who i was and they telling me i was john woman thought i was light-headed for i told them not what the angel said nor was i disposed to talk much to any one 
but was very desirous to get so deep that I might understand this mystery. My tongue was often so dry that I could not speak till I had moved it about and gathered some moisture, and as I lay still for a time, I at length felt a divine power prepare my mouth that I could speak, and I then said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Then the mystery was opened, and I perceived there was joy in heaven over a sinner who had repented, and that the language, John Woolman is dead, meant no more than the death of my own will. My natural understanding now returned as before, and I saw that people setting off their tables with silver vessels as entertainments was often stained with worldly glory and that in the present state of things I should take heed how I fed myself out of such vessels. Going to our monthly meeting soon after my recovery, I dined at a friend's house where drink was brought in silver vessels, and not in any other. Wanting something to drink, I told him my case with weeping, and he ordered some drink for me in another vessel. I afterwards went through the same exercise in several friends' houses in America, as well as in England, and I have cause to acknowledge with humble reverence the loving kindness of my Heavenly Father, who hath preserved me in such a tender frame of mind, that none, I believe, have ever been offended at what I have said on that subject. After this sickness I spank not in public meetings for worship for nearly one year, but my mind was very often in company with the oppressed slaves as I sat in meetings, and though under his dispensation I was shut up from speaking, yet the spring of the gospel ministry was many times livingly opened in me, and the divine gift operated by abundance of weeping and feeling the oppression of this people. It being so long since I passed through this dispensation, and the matter remaining fresh and lively in my mind, I believe it is safest for me to commit it to writing. Thirteenth of Eighth Month This morning I wrote a letter in substance as follows. Beloved friends, My mind is often affected as I pass along under a sense of the state of many poor people who sit under that sort of ministry which requires much outward labor to support it, and the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father in opening a pure gospel ministry in this nation hath often raised thankfulness in my heart to Him. I often remember the conflicts of the faithful under persecution, and now look at the free exercise of the pure gift uninterrupted by outward laws as a trust committed to us, which requires our deepest gratitude and most careful attention. I feel a tender concern that the work of reformation so prosperously carried on in this land within a few ages past may go forward and spread among the nations, and may not go backward through dust gathering on our garments who have been called to a work so great and so precious. Last evening, during thy absence, I had a little opportunity with some of thy family, in which I rejoiced, and feeling a sweetness on my mind towards thee, I now endeavor to open a little of the feeling I had there. I have heard that you, in these parts, have at certain seasons meetings of conference in relation to friends living up to our principles, in which several meetings unite in one. With this I feel unity, having in some measure felt truth lead that way among friends in America, and I have found, my dear friend, that in these labors all superfluities in our own living are against us. I feel that pure love towards thee in which there is freedom. I look at that precious gift bestowed on thee with awfulness before him who gave it, 
and feel the desire that we may be so separated to the gospel of Christ that those things which proceed from the spirit of this world may have no place among us. Thy friend, John Woolman. I rested a few days in body and mind with our friend, Jane Crossfield, who was once in America. On the sixth day of the week, I was at Kendall in Westmoreland, and at Greg meeting on the thirtieth day of the month and first of the week. I have known poverty of late, and have been graciously supported to keep in the patience, and am thankful under a sense of goodness of the Lord towards those who are of a contrite spirit. Sixth of ninth month and first of the week. I was this day at Counterside, a large meeting house, and very full. Through the opening of pure love, it was a strengthening time to me, and I believe to many more. Thirteenth of ninth month. This day I was at Leyburn, a small meeting, but the townspeople coming in and the house was crowded. It was a time of heavy labor, and I believe was a profitable meeting. At this place I heard that my kinsman, William Hunt, from North Carolina, who was on a religious visit to friends in England, departed this life on the ninth of this month of the smallpox at Newcastle. He appeared in the ministry when a youth, and his labors therein were of good savor. He traveled much in that work in America. I once heard him say in a public testimony that his concern in that visit was to be devoted to the service of Christ so fully that he might not spend one minute in pleasing himself, which words, joined with his example, was a means of stirring up the pure mind in me. Having of late traveled in wet weather through narrow streets and towns and villages, where dirtiness underfoot and the scent arising from that filth which more or less infects the air of all thickly settled towns, were disagreeable, and being but weakly, I have felt distress both in body and mind with that which is impure. In these journeys I have been where much cloth hath been dyed, and have at sundry times walked over ground where much of their dye-stuffs has drained away. This hath produced a longing in my mind that people might come into cleanliness of spirit, cleanliness of person, and cleanliness about their houses and garments. Some of the great carry delicacy to a great height themselves, and yet real cleanliness is not generally promoted. Dyes, being invented partly to please the eye and partly to hide dirt, I have felt in this weak state, when traveling in dirtiness and affected with unwholesome sense, a strong desire that the nature of dyeing cloth to hide dirt may be more fully considered. Washing our garments to keep them sweet is cleanly, but it is the opposite to real cleanliness to hide dirt in them. Through giving way to hiding dirt in our garments, a spirit which would conceal that which is disagreeable is strengthened. Real cleanliness becometh a holy people, but hiding that which is not clean by coloring our garments seems contrary to the sweetness of sincerity. Through some sorts of dyes, cloth is rendered less useful and if the value of dye-stuffs and expense of dyeing and the damage done to cloth were all added together, and that cost applied to keeping all sweet and clean, how much more would real cleanliness prevail? On this visit to England I have felt some instruction sealed on my mind, which I am concerned to leave in writing for the use of such as are called to the station of a minister of Christ. Christ being the Prince of Peace, and we being no more than ministers, it is necessary for us not only to feel a concern in our first going forth, but to experience the renewing thereof in the appointment of meetings. I felt it a concern in America to prepare for this voyage, and being through the mercy of God brought safe hither, my heart was like a vessel that wanted vent. 
for several weeks after my arrival when my mouth was opened in meetings it was like the raising of a gate of watercourse when a weight of water lay upon it in these labors there was a fresh visitation to many especially to the youth but sometimes i felt poor and empty and yet there appeared a necessity to appoint meetings in this i was exercised to abide in the pure life of truth and in all my labors to watch diligently against the motions of self in my own mind i have frequently found a necessity to stand up when the spring of the ministry was low and to speak from the necessity in that which subjecteth the will of the creature and herein i was united with the suffering seed and found inward sweetness in these mortifying labors as i have been preserved in a watchful attention to the divine leader under these dispensations enlargement at times hath followed and the power of truth hath risen higher in some meetings than i ever knew it before through me thus i have been more and more instructed as to the necessity of depending not upon a concern which i felt in america to come on a visit to england but upon the daily instructions of christ the prince of peace of late i have sometimes felt a stop in the appointment of meetings not wholly but in part and i do not feel liberty to appoint them so quickly one after another as i have done heretofore the work of the ministry being a work of divine love i feel that the openings thereof are to be waited for in all our appointments oh how deep is divine wisdom christ puts forth his ministers and goeth before them and oh how great is the danger of departing from the pure feeling of that which leadeth safely christ knoweth the state of the people and in the pure feeling of the gospel ministry their states are opened to his servants christ knoweth when the fruit-bearing branches themselves have need of purging oh that these lessons may be remembered by me and that all who appoint meetings may proceed in the pure feeling of duty i have sometimes felt a necessity to stand up but that spirit which is of the world hath so much prevailed in many and the pure life of truth has been so pressed down that i have gone forward not as one travelling in a road cast up and well prepared but as a man walking through a miry place in which there are stones here and there safe to step on but so situated that one step being taken time is necessary to see where to step next now i find that in a state of pure obedience the mind learns contentment in appearing weak and foolish to that wisdom which is of the world and in these lowly labors they who stand in a low place and are rightly exercised under the cross will find nourishment the gift is pure and while the eye is single in attending thereto the understanding is preserved clear self is kept out we rejoice in filling up that which remains of the afflictions of christ for his body's sake which is the church the natural man loveth eloquence and many love to hear eloquent orations and if there be not a careful attention to the gift men who have once labored in the pure gospel ministry growing weary of suffering and ashamed of appearing weak may kindle a fire compass themselves about with sparks and walk in the light not of christ who is under suffering but of that fire which they in departing from the gift have kindled in order that those hearers who have left the meek suffering state for worldly wisdom may be warmed with this fire and speak highly of their labors that which is of god gathers to god and that which is of the world is owned by the world end of chapter 12
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jack Lore. The Death of John Woolman. John Woolman died at York, England, October 7, 1772. His last days are memorialized in the following extract from The Testimony of Friends in Yorkshire at their quarterly meeting held at York the 24th and 25th of the third month, 1773, concerning John Woolman of Mount Holly in the province of New Jersey, North America, who departed this life at the house of our friend Thomas Priestman in the suburbs of this city, the 7th of the 10th month, 1772, and was interred in the burial ground of friends, the ninth of the same, aged about 52 years. This, our valuable friend, having been under a religious engagement for some time to visit friends in this nation, and more especially us in the northern parts, undertook the same in full concurrence and near sympathy with his friends and brethren at home, as appeared by certificates from the monthly and quarterly meetings to which he belonged, and from the spring meeting of ministers and elders held at Philadelphia for Pennsylvania and New Jersey. He arrived in the city of London, the beginning of the last yearly meeting, and after attending that meeting, traveled northward, visiting the quarterly meetings of Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Northamptonshire, Oxfordshire, and Worcestershire, and diverse particular meetings in his way. He visited many meetings on the west side of this country, also some in Lancashire and Westmoreland, from whence he came to our quarterly meeting in the last ninth month, and though much out of health, yet was enabled to attend all the sittings of that meeting, except the last. His disorder, which proved the smallpox, increased speedily upon him, and was very afflicting, under which he was supported in much meekness, patience, and Christian fortitude. To those who attended him in his illness, his mind appeared to be centered in divine love, under the precious influence whereof we believe he finished his course, and entered into the mansions of everlasting rest. In the early part of his illness, he requested a friend to write, and he broke forth thus. O Lord my God, the amazing horrors of darkness were gathered around me, and covered me all over, and I saw no way to go forth. I felt the misery of my fellow creatures separated from the divine harmony, and it was heavier than I could bear, and I was crushed down under it. I lifted up my hand and stretched out my arm, but there was none to help me. I looked round about and was amazed. In the depth of misery, O Lord, I remembered that Thou art omnipotent, that I had called Thee Father, and I felt that I loved Thee, and I was made quiet in Thy will, and I waited for deliverance from Thee. Thou hadst pity upon me when no man could help me. I saw that meekness under suffering was showed to us in the most affecting example of thy Son, and thou taught me to follow him. And I said, Thy will, O Father, be done. Many more of his weighty expressions might have been inserted here, but it was deemed unnecessary, they being already published in print. End of Conclusion End of the Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman